preface of The Life of Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. With a full reprint of the famous revolutionary article Jacta Alia Est, which was written by Jane Francesca Elgie, who afterwards became the mother of Oscar Wilde, and an additional chapter contributed by one of the prison warders who held this unhappy man in jail. To T. M., who, in the extreme of adversity, proved himself the true friend of an unhappy man. This book is dedicated. Quote, the heroes of literary as well as civil history have been very often no less remarkable for what they have suffered than for what they have achieved, and volumes have been written only to enumerate the miseries of the learned and relate their unhappy lives and untimely deaths. To these mournful narratives I am about to add the life of blank, a man whose writings entitle him to an eminent rank in the classes of learning, and whose misfortunes claim a degree of compassion not always due to the unhappy, as they were often the consequences of the crimes of others rather than his own. Dr. Samuel Johnson Preface The extract from the introductory passage of Dr. Johnson's Life of Richard Savage, which appears on one of the fly-leaves of this book, sets forth in a manner singularly appropriate the impression which is produced on every thinking head and feeling heart by a contemplation of the career of Oscar Wilde. Who, that follows his ascension to that eternity of fame, of which he speaks in De Profundis, and watches his sudden and headlong fall, will not echo those further words of that great good Dr. Johnson, of whom it may be said that had his like been living at the time of Wilde's catastrophe, the whole after-story of Wilde's life would assuredly have been a less pitiful one. Quote, that affluence and power, advantages extrinsic and adventitious, and therefore easily separable from those by whom they are possessed, should very often flatter the mind with expectations of felicity which they cannot give, raises no astonishment. But it seems rational to hope that intellectual greatness should produce better effects, that minds qualified for great attainments should first endeavour their own benefit, and that they who are most able to teach others the way to happiness should, with most certainty, follow it themselves." Unquote. At the same time, this must not be taken to convey that any close comparison can be instituted between Richard Savage and Oscar Wilde, either in point of capacity and performance, or of character, or indeed, except in respect of their vicissitudes, of career. It may, however, be of literary interest to observe one or two points of similitude in the characters of these two men. One reads of Richard Savage as to his choice of friends. Quote, his time was spent in prison for the most part in study or in receiving visits, but sometimes he diverted himself with the conversation of criminals, for it was not pleasing to him to be much without company, and though he was very capable of a judicious choice, he was often contented with the first that offered. Unquote. It will be seen in the course of this book that even in prison Oscar Wilde took pleasure in the society and conversation of criminals. The smaller natures and the meaner minds still appealed to him, and he underwent punishment rather than forego their whispered exchange of words. And it will further be seen in the narrative of his prison life how truly it might be written of him what Dr. Johnson wrote of Savage. Quote, but here, as in every other scene of his life, he made use of such opportunities as occurred to him of benefiting those who were more miserable than himself, and was always ready to perform any office of humanity to his fellow prisoners. Unquote. And generally, of both, it is equally true that, quote, Whatever was his predominant inclination, neither hope nor fear hindered him from complying with it, nor had opposition any other effect than to heighten his ardour and irritate his vehemence. Unquote. With equal appositeness can the moral which Dr. Johnson draws from his narrative be applied to this story also. Quote, 
this relation will not be wholly without its use, if those who languish under any part of his sufferings shall be enabled to fortify their patience by reflecting that they feel only those afflictions from which his abilities did not exempt him. Or those who, in confidence of superior capacities or attainments, disregarded the common maxims of life, shall be reminded that nothing will supply the want of prudence, and that negligence and irregularity long continued will make knowledge useless, wit ridiculous, and genius contemptible. Unquote. It is not, indeed, to point afresh this moral that the present book has been written. The age desiderates no such lessons, resents them, rather. Life is today ordered by a reconcilement of inclination and interest with the requirements of the written and unwritten laws. He sets out on a futile task who seeks to teach conduct from example, however striking, for our present individualism will brook no such guidance. The purpose of this book is another and a threefold one. It is to give an authoritative record of the career of a remarkable man, of remarkable gifts and achievements. It is to give an account of the author's books and other works to that large section of the world which ignores his writings, which, like 99 out of every 100 Frenchmen, for instance, has heard of his attainder, but knows nothing of his distinction. It is further to remove the false impressions, the misstatements of fact, the lying rumours, which, although the grave in Banyer churchyard closed upon him only one bare lustre since, have gathered round his name and story in a cloud of misrepresentation of astonishing magnitude. It is indeed this last purpose which may be allowed to plead the opportunity of the present publication. It is now not too late to establish fact, to refute falsehood, and to present a story freed from the supercharges of error or of malice. These floating rumours have not yet had the time to come together, to coagulate and to crystallise. Rumour can yet be unmasked as rumour, legend has not yet hardened into history, Posthumous Pasquinard has not yet dried on the tombstone. It was one of the dead wit's sayings that, of all the disciples of a man, it is always Judas who writes his biography. In the present instance, this paradox has less truth than ever. The writer was in no sense the disciple of Oscar Wilde. He was indeed as strongly antagonistic to most of his principles, ethical, artistic and philosophical, as he was warmly disposed to him for his many endearing qualities and captivating graces. His qualifications arise from the facts that for the period of 16 years preceding Oscar Wilde's death he was intimately acquainted with him, that his friendship with him, of which elsewhere a true record exists, was continuous and uninterrupted, save by that act of God which puts a period to all human companionships that he was with him at times when all others had withdrawn, and that for the very reason that he was not in sympathy with any of the affectations which towards others Oscar Wilde used to assume, the man as he truly was, the man as God and nature had made him, was perhaps better known to him than to most of his other associates. The method of treatment which was adopted in that earlier record, to which reference has been made above, being no longer imperative here, has been abandoned, with all the more alacrity on the part of the author that he has ever been in complete concordance with the general preference of objective to subjective treatment in the matter of biography. Today, what three years ago was utterly impossible, he may yield to his own inclinations, because today it has become admissible that a biography of Oscar Wilde can be written and made public. The writer has no longer to seek how to arouse interest in his subject through the graduated emotions of curiosity, pity, amazement and sympathy. It is open to him to record facts, without having to palliate the offence of so recording them by an exposition of their incidents upon others. The upward climb, the attainment... The joys of conquest, the catastrophe, the precipitation, and the horrors of the abyss may now be depicted upon his canvas in plain fashion. The reader shall see them as they were. 
he shall no longer be coaxed by a cunning elicitation of his sympathy for the teller of the story to listen to a tale against which prejudice, the voice of public opinion, and his own conception of what it is seemly and expedient for him to hear are ever prompting him to close his ears. Robert Harborough Sherrard, January 14th, 1906. End of preface. Chapter 1 of The Life of Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherrard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When nature has bountifully endowed a man with every gracious gift which should ensure for him success and felicity in life, when she has made him the fit subject for the boundless admiration or the unrestrained envy of his contemporaries, and when this favoured and fortunate man suddenly discloses leanings, propensities, instincts, which, rapidly developing into passions, he appears utterly powerless to bridle, precipitate him amidst the exuberant exultation of his enemies and the stone-eyed dismay of his friends into an abyss of disgrace and misery, it becomes more particularly the duty of an equitable biographer to inquire if either heredity or parental example or early training and environment can in any degree help the world to understand the formidable physiological problem how in one and the same man can be allied supreme intelligence with reckless imprudence, a remarkable respect for society with an utter defiance of social observances, and the most refined hedonism with a taste for the coarsest frequentations. In the case of Oscar Wilde, the problem, when his descent and kinship have been studied, becomes even more intricate and perplexing, for while in his immediate parentage will be discovered people whose incontestable genius was united, as is so often the case, with pronounced moral degeneracy, his ascending lines, traced back to remote generations, display such solid qualities of sane normality and civic excellence that this unhappy man's aberration must appear one of those malignant, morbid developments which alarm and confound the psychologist when they unexpectedly produce themselves in a man's mentality, no less than as by the sudden development in the body of malignant and morbid growths the practitioner is confounded and alarmed. It therefore becomes necessary, before proceeding to the account of the strange vicissitudes of his life, to investigate with more than usual care his descent and affinities. In this way alone can it be hoped that some light may be thrown upon the disquieting problem which his career discloses. It is an investigation which, when the laws of atavism shall, with the progress of science, be better understood, may enable an enlightened posterity to judge a most remarkable man, in many ways an ornament to humanity, with the justice which was refused to him in his lifetime, and will continue to be refused to his memory as long as the medieval obscurantism, from which we are only just beginning to emerge, still enswathes the minds of men. So important is the object to be attained by this investigation, for what purpose can transcend the attainment of justice, that if in its course personal considerations are ousted, and the pious reverence due to the dead may appear to be disregarded, these sacrifices cannot but be considered as imperatively imposed. Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Wills Wilde was born at No. 1 Merrion Square in the city of Dublin on the 16th of October 1854. So great a part of the task of telling the story of his life consists in correcting the mistakes of those who have written about him, in refuting unfair aspersions on his character and in nailing venomous lies to the counter of public opinion, that particular attention may be called to the date of his birth. In such biographical notices of him as exist, the year in which this unhappy man was ushered into a world where he was to suffer so greatly is given as 1856. He was not born in 1856, but two years earlier. As this narrative proceeds, negations of far greater importance will have to be put upon record. His life indeed, like that of many men who have been made the victims of the unreasoning hatred of his countrymen, 
might be almost told in a series of denials of current lies concerning his character and his deeds as to the particular inaccuracy however to which attention is drawn above it probably arose from his own misstatement he professed an adoration for youth his works contain many almost rhapsodical eulogies of physical and mental immaturity and no doubt that as he himself drew nearer to what he satirised in his plays as the usual age he gave us the year of his birth a date which made him appear two years younger than he really was a friend of his on one occasion endeavoured to point out to him that a man might derive far greater satisfaction in giving out his age as more advanced than it really was in posturing as old in years when younger in fact in hugging to his heart the secret reserve of days but he refused to admit it in his cross-examination by mr carson during the trial of lord queensbury he was forced to admit the truth as to the date of his birth the following remarks were then exchanged between the prosecutor and the marquess's counsel mr carson you stated your age as thirty-nine i think you are over forty the witness i am thirty-nine or forty you have my birth certificate and that settles the matter mr carson you were born in eighteen fifty four that makes you over forty the witness ah this ah sounded like a sarcastic note of admiration for the barrister's skill in arithmetic how it was calculated to wound the defending counsel will be indicated later for months before oscar wilde was born his mother had earnestly desired that the child should be a girl footnote this fact like every other fact recorded in this book is given on unimpeachable authority End footnote. she often expressed her conviction that a daughter was going to be born to her she used to tell friends of the things she was going to do after my little girl is born and used to discuss the education she proposed to give to her daughter when oscar was born her disappointment was great she refused to admit that her new child was a boy she used to treat him to speak of him as a girl and as long as it was possible to do so she dressed him like one to pathologists these facts will appear of importance oscar wilde was the second son and child issue of the marriage between william robert wills wilde oculist and otologist eighteen fifteen to eighteen seventy six and of Jane Francesca Elgie, poetess and pamphleteer, 1826 to 1896, which was celebrated in Dublin in 1851. For his parents, he ever felt the deepest affection and respect. For his mother in particular, this affection reached the degree of veneration. In filial piety and love, he gave a noble example to humanity. The feelings which he entertained towards his mother and father are expressed in language of lofty eloquence in the book De Profundis, which he wrote while a prisoner in Reading Jail, during the last six months of his confinement there. He has referred to his mother's death, and he adds, quote, No one knew how deeply I loved and honoured her. Her death was terrible to me, but I, once a lord of language, have no words in which to express my anguish and my shame she and my father had bequeathed me a name they had made noble and honoured not merely in literature art archaeology and science but in the public history of my own country in its evolution as a nation i had disgraced that name eternally i had made it a low byword among low people i had dragged it through the very mire i had given it to brutes that they might make it brutal and to foes that they might turn it into a synonym for folly what i suffered then and still suffer is not for pen to write or paper to record my wife always kind and gentle to me rather than that i should hear the news from indifferent lips travelled ill as she was all the way from genoa to england to break to me herself the tidings of so irreparable so irredeemable a loss Unquote. mr william wilde afterwards sir william wilde the surgeon was a product of that intermixture of races in ireland of which speaking at a meeting of the british association held in belfast he said i think that there cannot be a better fusion of races than that of the saxon with the celt 
his grandfather ralph wilde was the son of a durham businessman and towards the middle of the eighteenth century was sent over to ireland to seek his fortunes the region which was selected for him for the exercise of his ability was that connaught which cromwell's soldiers described as the alternative to hell footnote to hell or connaught was the alternative proposed by the english invaders to the irish peasants whom they hunted off their lands like wild beasts End of footnote. here after a while he became land agent to the sandford family he settled in castlery in the county of roscommon where he married a miss o'flynn the daughter of a very ancient irish family which gave its name to a district in roscommon still known as o'flynn's county ralph wilde had several children one of them ralph wilde who was a distinguished scholar and who like his grandnephew oscar wilde won the distinction of the barclay gold medal at trinity college dublin became a clergyman another thomas wilde was a country physician this thomas wilde married a miss finn who was related by descent to the eminent families of surridge and ousley of dunmore in the county of galway the ousleys were most distinguished people sir ralph ousley bart who was a very famous oriental scholar was british ambassador to persia his brother sir william ousley was secretary to lord wellesley in india general sir ralph ousley won great distinction in the peninsular war his brother was a famous preacher and writer of theological works of which the most famous is the book entitled old christianity of this kinsman oscar wilde used to relate many anecdotes he appeared to be much impressed by the sonority and suggestiveness of his name, Gideon Oosley. On one occasion, speaking of titles of novels, he recommended to a friend to write a book of which the hero should bear the name of Gideon Oosley, and to use the hero's name as the title of the story. He declared that a book with such a title could not fail to appeal to the public. Gideon Oosley, Methodist, was the John Wesley of Ireland, his sermons in the irish language addressed to people at the fairs and markets are still preserved in the memory of people living in the western province from hearsay from their parents william robert wills wilde was the son of dr thomas wilde by his marriage with miss finn he was born in castlery in eighteen fifteen and received his education at the royal school banagher it is however reported of him that fishing occupied more of his attention than school studies for which he had an admirable teacher in the person of paddy walsh afterwards immortalised by the pupil in his irish popular superstitions in the dublin university magazine the following account is given of youthful tastes which led to studies of which in later life he was to make such excellent use Quote, the delight of the fisher lad was to spend his time on the banks of the lakes and rivers within his reach talk irish with the people and listen to the recital of the fairy legends and tales his knowledge of which he so well turned to account in the irish popular superstitions his taste for antiquarian research was early exhibited and much fostered by his repeated examinations of the cahirs forts and caves of the early irish which exist in the vicinity of castlery as well as by visits to the plain of ruth craggan the site of the great palace and cemetery of the chieftains of the west in the district around were castles whose legends he learned patterns where he witnessed the strange mixture of pilgrimage devotion fun and frolic cock-fights for which roscommon was then famous and the various superstitions and ceremonies connected with the succession of the festivals of the season all these made a deep impression on the romantic nature of young wilde and many of them have been handed down to posterity by his facile pen unquote. his professional studies commenced in eighteen thirty two as a medical student he acted as clinical clerk to dr every kennedy in the lying in hospital and obtained the annual prize there against several english and irish competitors in studying for this examination he so overworked himself that his health broke down and a fever setting in his life was for some time despaired of he was actually suffering from the fever which went so nigh to kill him on the very day of the examination the case indeed was despaired of until dr robert greaves having been sent for an hourly glass of strong ale was prescribed as the only remedy from which any results might be expected it was held at the time that it was indeed the administration of this stimulant which saved his life 
The idea was no doubt an erroneous one, according to modern medical science, and the delusion may very possibly have been the cause of much subsequent mischief in the young man's family. In a household the head of which attributes the saving of his life to the use of alcohol in copious doses, the practice of temperance will naturally enough be looked for in vain, and it is no doubt at home that those habits of drinking were fostered which were to make such havoc in the lives of William Wilde's two sons. And to which it should be added here that, although Oscar Wilde was in no sense a hard drinker, and never by his most intimate friends was once seen in a state of intoxication, it is on record that every single foolish and mad act which he did in his life, acts which had for him the most disastrous consequences, was done under the influence of liquor. It is one of the most damnable qualities of alcohol that where in a man any morbid tendency, either physical or moral, exists, which, sober, he can keep under complete control, the use of strong drink will bring it to the surface. The French doctors say of alcohol that it gives the coup de fouet, the lash of the whip, to any disease either of the body or of the brain which may be present in a subacute state in a man who indulges in strong drink. No doubt that, because in his home in Merrion Square, Oscar Wilde had always heard the virtues of alcohol celebrated as a drug which, on a famous occasion, had saved his father's life, he did not attach importance to the teachings of later and more advanced science, which would have taught him that in his case, the poison might produce results the most disastrous. William Wilde is still remembered as a surgeon of particular resource and courage. Even as a medical apprentice, he displayed these qualities. It is related of him on reaching the parish church in Kong, in the county Mayo, one Sunday morning, he found the place in a state of huge commotion. It appeared that a small boy of about five years of age, having swallowed a piece of hard-boiled potato which had stuck in his throat, was in the act of choking. The young medical student, with the readiness which afterwards distinguished him amongst his contemporaries, saw at a glance that an immediate operation must be effected if the child's life was to be saved. He happened to have a pair of scissors in his pocket. He was fortunately not restrained by the modern terror of using any instrument which had not been rendered antiseptic, and he boldly cut into the boy's throat. The operation was entirely successful, and the child recovered. He may be living still, for when he was last heard of, in Philadelphia in 1875, he was a middle-aged man, who took a particular pride and pleasure in showing people a scar on his neck where, as he used to say, the famous Sir William Wilde of Dublin cut my throat. It was with similar readiness that Sir William once saved the sight of a Dublin fisherman, who was brought to him with a darning needle embedded up to the head in his right eye. The flapping of a sail in which the needle was sticking had driven it in with terrible force. An ordinary operation was out of the question. There was not enough of the head protruding to allow of any hold being got on it with the forceps, by which it might have drawn from its place. The man was suffering terrible agony. Sir William saw at once what was the only means of extracting the needle. He sent for a powerful electromagnet, by the help of which, in the shortest time, the steel bar was extracted. There are on record many similar instances of his energy, courage and fertility of resource. Already as a young man, he distinguished himself in the field of letters. While still a medical student, he sailed in charge of a sick gentleman on board the yacht Crusader, visiting many places in the Mediterranean and in the East, during a cruise which lasted many months. The account of this cruise he published on his return to Ireland. He found in the Messrs. Curry ready and liberal publishers. For the copyright of this young man's book, they paid him a sum of £250. The speculation was a profitable one for them. The first edition consisted of 1,250 copies of the book, which was issued in two volumes at 28 shillings. This edition was sold out immediately, a second edition was as rapidly disposed of, and other editions followed. The book has long since been out of print. The young man continued his medical studies in London, Berlin and Vienna, and finally started in medical practice in July 1841, selecting as special branches those of oculist and otologist. 
he took as the motto of his professional career the words, Whatever thou hast to do, do it with all thy might. His reputation was already so good that in the first year of his practice he earned in professional fees the sum of £400, which, it appears, is an amount very rarely reached by the fees of a surgeon in his first year. This money he devoted in its entirety to the charitable purpose of founding a hospital where the poor could be treated for eye and ear diseases. At that time, no such institution existed in the Irish capital. He did more than this. He applied the first thousand pounds of his professional earnings to his noble purpose. To him, in this manner, the city of Dublin and the whole country of Ireland owe the foundation of St. Mark's Ophthalmic Hospital. Footnote. Since its amalgamation with the National Eye and Ear Infirmary, Molesworth Street, Dublin, this institution has become known as the Royal Victoria Eye and Ear Hospital. End footnote which for 64 years has rendered such inestimable services to the suffering Irish poor, and which increases in usefulness every year of its existence. The last annual report gives a record of benevolent activity which few hospitals, which started with resources so meagre, can show. It is a noble institution, the foundation stone of which was the noble sacrifice of a noble man. The following extract from the first annual report issued in 1844, gives an interesting account of its first establishment. Quote, Although most of the large hospitals in this city, and the several infirmaries, poorhouses and other institutions in Ireland which afford indoor medical relief, admit patients labouring under affections of the organs of sight and hearing, there has not up to the present period existed in this country any special hospital for treating the diseases of the eye and ear. The want of such an establishment, upon a scale so extensive as to afford general relief, has long been felt by the poor, and is generally acknowledged by the upper classes of society. In the year 1841, a dispensary for treating the diseases of these organs was established in South Frederick Lane, and supported by its founder, Sir William Wilde, for twelve months, at the end of which time, Finding the number of applicants and the consequent expenditure far exceeding what was originally contemplated, or what could be supported by individual exertion, and not wishing to apply for public aid for the sum required to defray its expenses, he determined to try the experiment of making it support itself, by a monthly subscription from each of the patients. This plan succeeded fully, and since September 1842, the patients have each paid a small monthly sum during the period of their attendance, which has defrayed the expenses of the medicine. In this way, 1,056 persons were treated during the year ending September 1843, and the total number of patients relieved with medicine, medical advice or by operation from the commencement of that institution to the 1st of March 1844, was 2,075. Paupers have, however, at all times, received advice and medicine gratuitously. The sum paid by each patient is but sixpence per month, and this system of partial payments has been found to work exceedingly well. It has produced care, regularity and attention, and induced a spirit of independence among the lower orders of society worthy of countenance and support while the annual sum of £50 received in this way is in itself a sufficient guarantee that its benefits are appreciated by the poor, numbers of whom seek its advantages from distant parts of the country. Unquote. Through a Mr Grimshaw, a dentist, William Wilde obtained the use of a stable in Frederick Lane, which was to form the nucleus of the hospital, which afterwards developed into such a splendid institution. Having provided a few fixtures, the young surgeon commenced his gratuitous labours, which he continued throughout the whole of his career. An inscription in the front of the hospital records the name of its founder, and in the hall stands a bust of Sir William Wilde, which was purchased by direction of the head surgeon at the sale of the effects of William Wilde, his eldest son, after his death in Cheltenham Terrace, Chelsea. In 1848, he published what has been described as one of the most chivalrous literary efforts, his account of the closing years of Dean Swift's life. Two years after his marriage with Miss Jane Francesca Elgie, that is to say in 1853, 
he was appointed Surgeon Oculist in Ordinary to the Queen, which was the first appointment of the kind made in Ireland. In 1857 he visited Stockholm, and was created a Chevalier of the Kingdom of Sweden, and was, further, decorated with the Order of the Polar Star. Seven years later, at the conclusion of a chapter of the Knights of St. Patrick, held for the installation of new members of this order, and after the knights had left the hall, the genial Lord Carlyle, Viceroy, from his place on the throne, addressed the great surgeon, beckoning him to approach, and said, Mr. Wilde, I propose to confer on you the honour of knighthood, not so much in recognition of your high professional reputation, which is European, and has been recognised by many countries in Europe, but to mark my sense of the services you have rendered to statistical science, especially in connection with the Irish census. There was nothing of the cynic in Lord Carlyle, and his remarks to William Wilde were sincere as a compliment. One can imagine the mental reservations that, say, Lord Beaconsfield or Lord Lytton would have made had they been in Lord Carlyle's place, and had they been called upon to announce the impending honour to the man who had distinguished himself by his labours on behalf of the Irish census. For no document more than an Irish census report contains so scathing an indictment of castle rule. Nothing that Speranza ever wrote constituted a more violent appeal to Irish nationalists. No Fenian denunciation of the Sassanac has ever exceeded in bitterness of reproach the simple total of numerals which William Wilde's labours compelled the British government to lay before the people of Europe. For the rest, the honour of knighthood appears to be distributed with greater largesse in Ireland than even in England or Scotland, and it really seems that it is in Dublin a distinction for a professional man not to have received the tap of the Viceroy's sword. Wilde's acceptance of the honour was resented in some places, for it was thought that the husband of Speranza ought not to have taken favours from the castle, just as some years later Speranza's acceptance of a pension from the British government, which she had so fiercely attacked in her youth, was also resented. In a biographical notice of Sir William Wilde, which was published in 1875, one year before his death, where reference is made to another honour which was won by him, the following passage occurs which, read today, has a peculiarly pathetic interest. Quote, in connection with the award of the Cunningham Medal of the Royal Irish Academy in 1873 to Sir William Wilde, it is a remarkable fact, worthy of record, that within a few months of its presentation, his two sons, William and Oscar, were each awarded a medal of Trinity College, the former, who has just been called to the Irish Bar, by the College Philosophical Society for Ethics and Logic, and the latter, who is now, 1875, a distinguished scholar at Oxford, for the best answering on the Greek drama. Unquote. Sir William Wilde was too hospitable and too charitable a man to amass any large fortune, such as would have been acquired by most men of his professional ability and European reputation but at the time of his death he was in the comfortable position of a substantial landowner. Some years ago, says a notice of him, Sir William Wilde became a proprietor in the county of Mayo, where he has most successfully carried out schemes of improvement, and has shown that he can reclaim land and profitably carry on farming operations, which is what few of even resident proprietors can boast. Finding a portion of the ancestral estate of the O'Flins, from which he is maternally descended, for sale in the Land Estate Court, he became the purchaser. The portion in cultivation was covered by a wretched pauper tenantry, numbers of whom it became necessary to remove, to enable those remaining to have a means of comfortable existence. Understanding somewhat of the language of the people, and being, as they said, one of the old stock, he was able, with advice from the Catholic clergy, to carry out his plans without exciting discontent, or involving the sacrifice of large sums of money, and he gave an ample tenant right to those that remained on the property over twelve years ago. The reclamation that followed, with the addition of erecting a residence for himself in a most picturesque situation, has converted a locality characterised only a few years ago by the usual evidences of neglect, into one of the most attractive and charming spots in the country. In fact, Mayhira House, near Kong, with the surrounding grounds and estate, 
may be fairly claimed as one of the numerous triumphs of the enterprising proprietor. Unquote. He wrote many works on Irish history and archaeology, and was engaged on a biographical work at the time of his death. He founded the Dublin Quarterly Journal of Science. His life is one long record of beneficent activity. He carried out to the end the motto which he had taken for his guide at the outset of his career. He is recognised as one of the greatest surgeons of the last century, and the recognition is universal. And it should be remembered that the reputation of a great surgeon cannot be disturbed by the discoveries of posterity, as is the case with men, who, as doctors, have obtained in one age the fame of great luminaries of science, and who, as knowledge progresses, reveal themselves to a mocking world to have been the veriest Merry Andrews. Wilde's Arbeidsfeld vor die Klinik, Wilde's Field was the operating room, says of him a great German writer on surgery. Elsewhere in German medical books of the highest authority, the Irish surgeon is referred to in the most eulogistic terms. Now praise from German scientific men, who for the most part seem to hold that light can come from nowhere in the world but a German university town, and who have too often distinguished themselves by a manifestation of envy and a spirit of almost feminine denigrement, is the sincerest praise that a British subject may ever hope to reap. One writer describes Wilde as ein Meister in geniale Schlussfolgerungen, a master in deductions inspired by genius. Another German authority says of him, auch in seinem lebhaften und praktischen Interesse für Taubstumme erinnert uns wilder Anitard. In his strong and practical interest in deaf mutes also, Wilde reminds us of Itard. Schwarzer describes him as the father of modern otology. Indeed, it appears that as an otologist, he was even greater than as an oculist. At a recent conference of medical men in Zurich, when the great pioneers of modern surgery were being discussed in a lecture, only three British surgeons were named, and these were Graves, Stokes and Wilde. In Dublin medical circles, he is still spoken of with the highest respect, most contemporary doctors of his day would now be mentioned with the pitying smile with which modern physicians refer to all their predecessors whose studies were completed before the year 1889, swept away the clouds which had obscured the vision of the men who professed to heal. Mr. J. B. Storey, FRCSI, who was senior surgeon of the St. Mark's Ophthalmic Hospital, and who since its transformation into the Royal Victoria Eye and Ear Hospital is continuing the work of Sir William Wilde at that splendid institution, is more eloquent in the praise of his predecessor's skill and science. He also holds that Sir William was greater as an oral surgeon than as an eye doctor, but in both fields he considers him to have been one of the most distinguished surgeons that Great Britain has yet produced. The same unanimity of praise is accorded to his literary work, Perhaps the most interesting reference to his qualities as a writer on the special subjects which he chose is contained in a passage which occurs in the preface which his wife, Lady Wilde, wrote to the life of Berenger, which her husband had left uncompleted at the time of his death, and which Lady Wilde finished. She begins by saying what diffidence she feels to take up the pen which her husband had let fall. So strongly does she feel her inferiority to him, and goes on to say... Quote, there was probably no man of his generation more versed in our national literature, in all that concerned the land and the people, the arts, architecture, topography, statistics, and even the legends of the country, but above all, in his favourite department, the descriptive illustration of Ireland past and present, in historic and prehistoric times, he has justly gained a wide reputation, as one of the most learned and accurate, and at the same time one of the most popular writers of the age on Irish subjects. In the misty cloudland of Irish antiquities, he may especially be looked upon as a safe and steadfast guide. Unquote. His charitableness and compassion for human suffering were such that, although he was a pleasure-loving man, he was ever ready, at a moment's notice, to leave the gayest and happiest social reunion to attend to the wants of some patient who might be in need of his gratuitous assistance. An anecdote in Fitzpatrick's Life of Lever, communicated to the biographer by John Lever, the novelist's nephew, 
illustrates this benevolent trait in the great surgeon's character. Quote, On one occasion he, Lever, wanted Wilde to come and meet at dinner some friends he had assembled, and calling at Merrion Square was told that the doctor could not possibly appear. Being denied several times, my uncle at last put his handkerchief in bandage form over his merry twinkling eyes. His expedient brought the oculist to the door in a moment, the rencontre ending in a hearty laugh at the success of the trick, which continued to afford much amusement at Temple Rogue. Unquote. Sir William Wilde died after a long illness on Wednesday, 19th of April, 1876, and was buried at Mount Jerome Cemetery. His hearse was followed to the grave by a large and representative procession. The principal mourners were Mr. W. Wilde, Mr. Oscar Wilde, and the Reverend Mr. Noble. All the Dublin papers published long obituary notices of the man, and the whole country deplored his loss. How pleasant it would be if this man's memory could be left undisturbed as that of one who was great and good, if nothing needed to be said which may tarnish in some degree a reputation so nobly won. Alas, the exigencies of this biography exact, in justice to its immediate subject, a closer investigation into the moral composition of one who, together with many sterling qualities, may have transmitted to his son certain leanings, instincts, passions, which shall help us to understand the dismaying problem of that son's conduct of his life. It may be briefly then stated that together with a high reputation as a man of science and as a kind-hearted, genial and charitable man, Sir William Wilde had also the evil repute of being a man of strong, unbridled passions, in the gratification of which no sense of social or professional responsibility could restrain him. A characteristic anecdote of a stinging retort made to him by a veterinary surgeon whom he once met while out riding in Phoenix Park is still told, and public opinion ever held that the veterinary surgeon's critique was just and right. One of these patients, a Miss Travers, indeed brought an action against the surgeon oculist in ordinary, but the woman's sanity appeared doubtful, and the case was dismissed. His son Oscar used to relate of his mother as an instance of her noble serenity towards life, how, when she was nursing his father on his dying bed, each morning there used to come into the sick room the veiled and silent figure of a woman in deep mourning, who sat and watched but never spoke, and at nightfall went away to return on the following morning. It may be noted as a significant fact that the son seemed to see no aspersion on his father's reputation in this story. It appeared to him to be an apt illustration of his mother's nobility of character. Sir William Wilde left besides his legitimate children a number of natural offspring. One natural son of his was established by him as a surgeon oculist in a practice in Lower Baggett Street, about 200 yards from his wife's home. The man died some years ago, but is still remembered as the son of Sir William Wilde. Another trait in his character which it may be worth while to note, because this characteristic was undoubtedly transmitted to one of his sons, namely to Oscar's brother, was his great neglect of himself. He was very shabby and careless about his appearance. He used to be spoken of as one of the untidiest men in Ireland, an anecdote is told of Father Healy, which illustrates the reputation that Sir William had in this respect. At a dinner party at which the father was present, and which was held shortly after Sir William Wilde had been knighted, an Englishman who had just crossed from Holyhead was complaining of the sea passage he had been through. It was, I think, he said, the dirtiest night I have ever seen. Oh, said Father Healy, then it must have been wild. The portraits of Sir William which exist, showing him at different ages, reveal, as few physiognomies can do, an extraordinary mixture of intellectuality and animalism, of benevolence and humanity with bestial instinct. Mr Harry Furness has included him in his gallery of ugly men and women. The qualification is hardly a just one. As to the upper part of his face, Sir William was remarkably handsome. No one with such a forehead and such eyes could be called ugly, but the lower part of his face, and especially the almost simian mouth, are very bad. 
in his son oscar the same extraordinary contrast between the upper and lower parts of his face was to be observed he had the forehead and eyes of a genius or an angel his mouth was ugly almost abnormal and such as to justify the accuracy if not the charitableness of his strong enemy the marquess of queensbury in an inhuman jest about his personal appearance which he made just after the poor man's conviction end of chapter one chapter two of the life of oscar wilde by robert sherard this librivox recording is in the public domain there can be no doubt that from his mother for whom he felt so great a love and so deep a reverence oscar wilde inherited many of those admirable gifts and graces which so distinguished him amongst his contemporaries even as lady wilde oscar had an astonishing facility for learning languages my favourite study she once related was languages i succeeded in mastering two european languages before my eighteenth year it is on record that oscar wilde was able to learn the difficult german language in an incredibly short time we are informed in the story of the unhappy friendship that during the railway journeys which he took in england in connection with his lecturing tour in the winter of eighteen eighty three eighteen eighty four carrying a small pocket dictionary and a volume of heine with him one book in each pocket of his fur-lined overcoat he taught himself german so thoroughly that afterwards the whole of german literature was open to him lady wilde was a wonderful classical scholar she had the sheer delight in latin and greek literature that true scholars manifest and made of the roman orators or the greek tragedians her favourite reading a lady once called at number one merrion square and found sir william's house in the possession of the bailiffs there were two strange men this lady relates sitting in the hall and i heard from the weeping servant that they were men in possession i felt so sorry for poor lady wilde and hurried upstairs to the drawing-room where i knew i should find her speranza was there indeed but seemed not in the least troubled by the state of affairs in the house i found her lying on the sofa reading that prometheus winctus of aeschylus from which she began to declaim passages to me with exalted enthusiasm she would not let me slip in a word of condolence but seemed very anxious that i should share her entire admiration for the beauties of the greek tragedian which she was reciting of oscar wilde's scholarship nothing need be said here his reputation in that respect is well established on what this reputation was based will appear hereafter lady wilde was a brilliant talker was there ever in the world a more brilliant conversationalist than oscar wilde lady wilde's serenity and tolerance reached a level to which none but the great philosophers have attained this tolerance and resignation she taught to her son as some mothers teach their sons those imbecilities which in the aggregate are known as worldly wisdom my mother writes oscar wilde who knew life as a whole used often to quote to me goethe's lines written by carlyle in a book he had given her years ago and translated by him i fancy also who never ate his bread in sorrow who never spent the midnight hours weeping and waiting for the morrow he knows you not ye heavenly powers they were the lines which that noble queen of prussia whom napoleon treated with such coarse brutality used to quote in her humiliation and exile they were the lines my mother often quoted in the troubles of her later life i absolutely declined to accept or admit the enormous truth hidden in them i could not understand it i remember quite well how i used to tell her that i did not want to eat my bread in sorrow or to pass any night weeping and watching for the dawn yet the second verse which seems to have been overlooked by lady wilde as well as by queen louisa was one from which had it been taught him also 
the prisoner might have derived consolation goethe here formulates the law of predestination with the implacability of a calvin or a mohammed ihr führt ins leben ihn hinein und lässt den armen schuldig werden dann übergießt er ihn dem pein denn jeder schuld reicht sich auf erden it is always a dangerous thing to mutilate a thought a german word which well describes one trait of speranza's character and which is not easily translated into english is schweimerisch this adjective describes a state of gushing exaltation a somewhat too ready enthusiasm a capacity for discovering romance in what is trite and commonplace the word conveys mild and tolerant censure and generally suggests that the person to whom it is applied is too much taken up in daydreams to give much attention to orderliness and the other domestic virtues one feels that but for speranza's schwärmerei there would have been no bailiffs ever to be found in the hall of that fine house in merrion square and that the surgeon oculist in ordinary would not have been allowed to go out into the streets of dublin in the neglected condition which inspired father healy's mordant gibe there was nothing of the schweimer in oscar wilde's composition he had no penchant for enthusiasm exaltation he never displayed and though as a writer he enrolled himself under that drapeau romantique des jeunes guerriers of which Théophile Gautier speaks, as a man of the world he avoided romance. He was, for precision, for the absolute, for rule and proof. He was at one and the same a perfect grammarian and an excellent logician. And that, in spite of the restraint of his reason, he gave way to promptings so illogical as those that led to his catastrophe, shows that at times and under certain conditions his reason failed him while he inherited from his mother many distinguished qualities it may be deduced from his life that the preponderating maternal influence in his composition was responsible also for that abnormality of conduct which was the direct cause of his downfall it is a matter of common observation among physiologists that where a child is born to a couple in which the woman has the much stronger nature and a great mental superiority over the father the chances are that the child will develop at certain critical periods in his career an extraordinary attraction towards persons of its own sex this fact is one of nature's mysteries those who believe in a divine creation of the world should reverently bow their heads before what they cannot understand and ought to take to be a divine dispensation at any rate the wisdom of nature may be presumed greater than that of the ecclesiastical courts it is held in ireland amongst people who knew the lg family that lady wilde's assertion that her ancestors were of italian origin that the name elgi is a corruption of the patronymic alighieri which would have implied a descent from or at least a kinship to the immortal dante was but the outcome of a vivid and self-deceiving imagination her conversation afforded many instances of this habit of self-delusion things that she wished to be facts soon became invested in her mind with the solidity of such her daydreams embodied themselves for this her characteristic of schwärmerei accounts also her sons never repeated the legend of any florentine descent though willie at least was not averse to boast of his relationships oscar on the other hand apart from his occasional references to the cousin who had so sonorous a name gideon Oosley, and to that other cousin wills who combined with dramatic genius a mass of genial eccentricity never spoke of his relations he had an instinctive horror of anything approaching to self-aggrandizement which he described as the worst form of vulgarity according to lady wilde the alighieri who first settled in ireland and whose name was corrupted into elgi was her great-grandfather 
This man's son was the famous Archdeacon Elgee of Wexford. Here another negation is necessary. Lady Wilde was not the daughter of an Episcopalian clergyman. She was not the daughter of Archdeacon Elgee. Yet these misstatements are reproduced in the authoritative biographical notices which have been published about her. In a letter which she wrote on 10th August 1893 to Mr. D.J. O'Donoghue of Dublin, the author of an admirable Life of Mangan, she writes, referring to one of these biographical errors, In the sketch given of myself, I regret that I was not named as granddaughter of Archdeacon L.G. of Wexford. The Archdeacon is one of the saints of the Wexford calendar, and the people are always pleased to connect me with him. My father was eldest son of Archdeacon Elgie, and he was not a clergyman. Jane Francesca Elgie was born in Wexford in 1826 of a Protestant and conservative family. Her paternal grandfather, the Archdeacon referred to above, was a most distinguished man. He was a rector of Wexford, and Lady Wilde used to tell an anecdote about him to illustrate his kindly character and the impulsive feelings of the Irish people. During the revolution of 1798, a band of rebels had entered Wexford Church, where the archdeacon was celebrating the sacrament with a number of his parishioners. The clergyman was dragged from the altar, and was about to be put to death by the pikes of the infuriated Irish, when one of them, striking up the weapons which had already been turned upon his devoted breast, implored his comrades to spare a man who once had done an act of great kindness to his family. He related this act of charity, one of hundreds for which the rector was famous, and spoke with such eloquence that not only did the rebels, who had been committing many acts of great cruelty in the district, spare his life, but they also resolved that none of his belongings should be touched, and a guard was placed at the rectory to protect the lives and the property of all its dwellers. Her mother was a Miss Kingsbury, who was the granddaughter of Dr Kingsbury, who in his day was president of the Irish College of Physicians, and the intimate friend of Dean Swift. His son, Dr Thomas Kingsbury, the father of Sarah Kingsbury, who was Lady Wilde's mother, was a commissioner in bankruptcy and the owner of the well-known mansion Leal House in Dublin. Lady Wilde had many distinguished relations. One of her uncles was Sir Charles Ormsby, Bart, who was a member of the last Irish Parliament. She was first cousin to the Sir Robert McClure, who was famous as an explorer and who is best known as the Seeker of the North West Passage. Her only brother, Judge Elgie, was a distinguished member of the American Bar. She was also a grandniece of the famous writer, the Reverend Charles Maturin. Of this kinship, Oscar Wilde was in his heart very proud. When he left prison, it was from the hero of this Charles Maturin's most famous novel, Melmoth the Wanderer, that he borrowed the name under which he was to drag out the remaining agony of his years. Possibly what most endeared to him the memory of this great-granduncle was that the mighty Balzac, for whom his admiration was unlimited, had expressed his high approval of the famous novel. In his Le Elixir de Longue Vie, Balzac gazettes Oscar Wilde's great-uncle with Moliere, with Goethe and with Byron, as one of the greatest geniuses of Europe. He refers as follows to Melmoth and to its author, Maturin. Il fut en effet le type de Don Juan de Molière, du Faust de Goethe, du Manfred de Byron et du Melmoth de Maturin, grande image tracée par les plus grandes jeunes de l'Europe. One needs to know the estimation which Oscar Wilde held of Balzac as an artist and a thinker, to understand with what gratification these lines of highest tribute to his kinsman must have filled him. But besides Balzac, there was another great intellect which had confessed to the power which Maturin and his hero had exercised over him. In W. M. Thackeray's Goethe in His Old Age, we find the following reference to them. Quote, 
I felt quite afraid before them, and recollect comparing them to the eyes of the hero of a certain romance called Melmoth the Wanderer, which used to alarm us boys thirty years ago, eyes of an individual who had made a bargain with a certain person, and at an extreme old age, retained those eyes in all their awful splendour. Unquote. Charles Baudelaire, the poet for whom Oscar Wilde's admiration was so intense, wrote thus of Melmoth. Quote, Célèbre voyageur Melmoth, la grande création satanique du révérend Maturin, quoi de plus puissant relativement à la pauvre humanité que ce pal et ennuyé Melmoth. In the house in Merrion Square was a fine bust of Charles Maturin. It is either a cast of one executed at the request of Sir Walter Scott and formerly preserved at Abbotsford, or from a mask impression taken after his death. Though, of course, the portrait of an older man, than when Melmoth was written, years seem to have told very little on his face if we compare it with the strikingly youthful countenance that appears in the new monthly magazine. In this Charles Maturin we find that mixture of genius and insanity which manifested it also in the lad who was brought up in reverent contemplation of his bust, and in whole-hearted admiration of his life and work. Kinsman by affinity no less than kinsman by consanguinuity can transmit their qualities and defects to their posterity, and there can be no doubt whatever that Oscar Wilde's nature was greatly moulded by the strong influence that Maturin exercised over his mother. This being an indisputable fact, it becomes necessary to seek some further information on the subject of this strange and brilliant man, who so many years after his death was to stand sponsor to the most unhappy of his kinsmen. The best account of Charles Maturin as a man is to be found in the pages of that excellent biography of Clarence Mangan the Irish Poet by R. J. O'Donoghue, to which reference has been made above. Mr. O'Donoghue prefaces Mangan's description of Maturin with some comments of his own, and the whole passage may be quoted here. Particular attention may be requested to the account of Maturin's eccentricities of dress. They may explain much in Oscar's peculiarities in the same respect. Oscar Wilde was accused, because of them, of a vulgar desire for réclame, for self-advertisement. To Charles Maturin, a more lenient age accorded his foibles, just as to Balzac was granted his monkish cowl, to Van Dyck his court array, and to Barbet de Auravilly his cloak of red samite. The following is Mangan's description with O'Donoghue's prefatory remarks. Quote, Towards the close of his life, Mangan put on record his impressions of this remarkable writer, Maturin, in whom Scott and Byron so thoroughly believed that the first offered to edit his works after his death, and the latter used all his influence successfully to get a hearing for his plays. Numerous stories are related of him. His genius was of the untamed, uncultivated kind. His works are those of a madman, glowing with burning eloquence and deep feeling, but full of absurdities and inconsistencies. His Irish tales, such as The Wild Irish Boys and And the Milesian Chief, are made almost unreadable by a vicious and ranting style. Whenever Maturin was engaged in literary work, he used to place a wafer on his forehead to let those who entered his study know that he was not to be disturbed. Mangan had more than the prevailing admiration for the grotesqueness of Maturin's romances, their terrible and awe-inspiring nature impressed him profoundly. He felt a great fascination for this lonely man of genius, who at one period he might have called in his own words, the only, the lonely, the earth's companionless one. He opens his sketch, which is very characteristic of his style, with the humorous rhyme, Maturin, Maturin, what a strange hat you're in. Quote, I saw Maturin but on three occasions, and on all these within two months of his death. I was then a mere boy, and when I assure the reader that I was strongly imbued with a belief in those doctrines of my church which seem, and only seem, to savour of what is theologically called exclusiveness, he will appreciate the force of the impulse which urged me one morning 
to follow the author of Melmoth into the porch of St. Peter's Church in Angier Street, and hear him read the burial service. Maturin, however, did not read, he simply repeated, but with a grandeur of emphasis and an impressive power of manner that chained me to the spot. His eyes, while he spoke, continually wandered from side to side, and at length rested on me, who reddened up to the roots of my hair at being even noticed by a man that ranked far higher in my estimation than Napoleon Bonaparte. I observed that, after having concluded the service, he whispered something to the clerk at his side, and then again looked steadfastly at me. If I had been the master of scepters, of worlds, I would have given them all that moment to have been put in possession of his remark. The second time I saw Maturin, he had been just officiating, as on the former occasion, at a funeral. He stalked along York Street with an abstracted, or rather, distracted air, the white scarf and hat-band which he had received remaining still wreathed round his beautifully shaped person, and exhibiting to the gaze of the amused and amazed pedestrians whom he almost literally encountered in his path, a boot upon one foot and a shoe on the other. His long, pale, melancholy, Don Quixote out-of-the-world face would have inclined you to believe that Dante, Bazaget, and the Cid had risen together from their sepulchres and clubbed their features for the production of an effect. But Maturin's mind was only fractionally portrayed, so to speak, in his countenance. The great Irishman, like Hamlet, had that within him which passed show and escaped far and away beyond the possibility of expression by the clay lineament. He bore the hunder scars about him, but they were graven, not on his brow, but on his heart. The third and last time that I beheld this marvellous man I remember well. It was some time before his death, on a balmy autumn evening in 1824. He slowly descended the steps of his own house, which, perhaps, some future transatlantic biographer may thank me for informing him, was at number 42 York Street. Footnote. 41 is generally given as the number. End footnote. And took his way in the direction of Whitefriar Street, into Castle Street, and past the Royal Exchange into Dame Street, every second person staring at him and the extraordinary double-belted and treble-caped rug of an old garment, neither coat nor cloak, which enveloped his person. But here it was that I, who had tracked the footsteps of the man as his shadow, discovered that the feeling to which some individuals, rather over-sharp and shrewd, had been pleased to ascribe this affectation of singularity, had no existence in Maturin, for instead of passing along Dame Street, where he would have been the observed of all observers, he wended his way along the dark and forlorn locality of Dame Lane, and, having reached the end of this not very classical thoroughfare, crossed over to Anglesey Street, where I lost sight of him. Perhaps he went into one of those bibliopolitan establishments wherewith that paternoster row of Dublin then abounded. I never saw him afterwards. An inhabitant of one of the stars dropped upon our planet could hardly feel more bewildered than Maturin habitually felt in his consociation with the beings around him. He had no friend, companion, brother. He and the lonely man of Shiraz might have shaken hands and then parted. He, in his own dark way, understood many people, but nobody understood him in any way. Unquote, unquote. Till the age of 18, Francesca Elgi devoted herself entirely to study and reading. Till my 18th year, I never wrote anything, she relates. Then, one day, a volume of Ireland's Library, issued from the Nation office by Mr Duffy, happened to come my way. I read it eagerly, and my patriotism was kindled. This volume was Danton Williams' book, the spirit of the nation. Till then, says Lady Wilde, I was quite indifferent to the national movement, and if I thought about it at all, probably had a bad opinion of its leaders. 
for my family was Protestant and conservative, and there was no social intercourse between them and the Catholics and nationalists. But once I had caught the national spirit, and all the literature of Irish songs and sufferings had an enthralling interest for me, then it was that I discovered that I could write poetry. In sending my verses to the editor of The Nation, I dared not have my name published, so I signed them Speranza, and my letters John Fenshaw Ellis, instead of Jane Francesca Elgie. Lady Wilde did not commence contributing to The Nation in 1844, as her biographers state. Her first contributions appeared in that journal in 1847. She was at that time living with her parents at 34 Leeson Street, which is in a quarter which is the Bayswater of Dublin. Her most famous poem was entitled A Million a Decade. These contributions were for the most part published in a small type column which preceded the leading articles, and which appears to have been reserved for the efforts of amateur contributors, answers to correspondence, etc., Later on, however, that is to say in 1848, the honours of large type and prominent position were accorded to Speranza's poems and John Fenshaw Ellis's prose. The girl's poetry had no particular merit either of expression or of thought, and indeed, compared unfavourably with similar verse contributed by three other young women whose nationalism was of a more sincere type. These were known to the readers of the nation as Eva, Mary and Thomasine. In his book, My Life in Two Hemispheres, Sir Charles Gavin Duffy speaks of Speranza as the most gifted of the four, and indeed describes her as a woman of genius. At the time that the book was written, the former nationalist editor, the revolutionary of 1848, was living in opulence and luxury at the Villa Marguerite in Nice, decked with a British title and enriched with British gold. His sympathies would naturally tend rather to the one of the four women who, like himself, had abandoned the cause of nationalism as une erreur de jeunesse, when that cause had become a desperate one and a more profitable field for enthusiasm and activity offered itself. Among the martyrs of 1848, not among those who had the fortune to die then, but amongst the poor, broken old men who are dragging out penurious existences in Dublin at this very day, men who never abandoned the cause and who will die as ardent nationalists as they were when Duffy and Speranza fired them into acts which sent them into confinement in British jails, neither Speranza nor Duffy are remembered as nationalists with great esteem. The Fenian editor, O'Leary, states that Speranza was of the four poetesses on the nation, the one who was considered the least talented, that Eva was held to be the most sincere and the most gifted. Eva was Miss Eva Mary Kelly. Mary was Miss Ellen Downing. As to Thomasine, her anonymity has not been pierced. The great effect produced by Francesca Elgie, it is to be noted as characteristic that she objected to the beautiful but unromantic name of Jane and never used it, was when she denounced herself in open court as the authoress of the famous article Yacta Est Alia, for the publishing of which the future Sir Charles Duffy of the Villa Marguerite Nice was being prosecuted. This article appeared in number 304, printed 304, of The Nation, which was published in Dublin under date of Saturday 29th July 1848. The Nation, a weekly magazine journal of 16 pages, of the size of the Petit Journal, which was published at sixpence, was then in its sixth volume. On the number preserved in the National Library of Ireland in Dublin, there is written upon the front page in ink the following words. This is the suppressed number. I believe it is the only copy which escaped, and that was not seized and carried to the castle. This statement appears to be erroneous, for other copies are in existence, including one at the British Museum.
Lady Wilde's article was the second leader on the editorial page. The leading article, presumably written by Sir Charles Gavin Duffy of the Villa Marguerite Nice, was entitled The Toxin of Ireland, and is of that kind of political inflammatory writing which, once one has read it, is immediately forgotten. On this article, Francesca Wilde's article follows. It is published anonymously, and fills rather more than two columns of the paper. As it is a document of a central interest in the archives of the family of the man with whom this volume deals, it is reproduced in extenso in the following chapter, just as it was printed in The Nation, with the misprints italicised. The 304th number of the revolutionary paper, edited by the future Sir Charles Gavin Duffy of the Villa Marguerite Nice, contained much other matter which was calculated to incense the castle. Amongst the topical articles which were published, we find one on easy lessons in military matters, by a veteran, which deals with such subjects as organisation, arms. Elsewhere in this journal, the young nationalist, who has been inflamed by the editorials of Sir Charles Gavin Duffy, was instructed how to break down a bridge or blow one up how to buy and try a rifle, and valuable topical information was also given on casting bullets. It may be added that Francesca Elgi had no dealings with the other people, apart from Duffy, who were active in agitation. In a letter to Mr O'Donoghue, dated 13th November 1888, she writes, I can give no information as to the workers of 48. Sir Charles Duffy would be the best authority, his address is the Villa Marguerite, Nice, France. End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of The Life of Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. Yacta Alia Est. Quote, the Irish nation has at length decided. England has done us one good service at least. Her recent acts have taken away the last miserable pretext for passive submission. She has justified us before the world, and ennobled the timid, humble supplication of a degraded, insulted people, into the proud demand for independence by a resolved, prepared, and fearless nation." Now, indeed, were the men of Ireland cowards if this moment for retribution, combat and victory were to pass by unemployed. It finds them slaves, but it would leave them infamous. Oh, for a hundred thousand muskets glittering brightly in the light of heaven, and the monumental barricades stretching across each of our noble streets, made desolate by England, circling round that doomed castle made infamous by England, where the foreign tyrant has held his council of treason and iniquity against our people and our country for seven hundred years. Courage rises with danger, and heroism with resolve. Does not our breath come freer, each heart beat quicker in these rare and grand moments of human life, when all doubt and wavering and weakness are cast to the winds, and the soul rises majestic over each petty obstacle, each low selfish consideration, and, flinging off the fetters of prejudice, bigotry and egotism, bounds forward into the higher, diviner life of heroism and patriotism, defiant as a conqueror, devoted as a martyr, omnipotent as a deity." We appeal to the whole Irish nation. Is there any man amongst us who wishes to take one further step on the base path of sufferance and slavery? Is there one man who thinks that Ireland has not been sufficiently insulted? That Ireland has not been sufficiently degraded in her honour and her rights to justify her now in fiercely turning upon her oppressor? No. A man so infamous cannot tread the earth, or, if he does, the voice of the coward is stifled in the clear, wild, ringing shout that leaps from hill to hill, that echoes from sea to sea, 
that peals from the lips of an uprisen nation we must be free in the name then of your trampled insulted degraded country in the name of all heroic virtues of all that makes life illustrious or death divine in the name of your starved your exiled your dead by your martyrs in prison cells and felon chains in the name of god and man by the listening earth and the watching heaven i call on you to make this aspiration of your souls a deed even as you read these weak words of a heart that yet palpitates with an enthusiasm as heroic as your own and your breast heaves and your eyes grow dim with tears as the memory of ireland's wrongs rushes upon your soul even now lift up your right hand to heaven and swear swear by your undying soul by your hopes of immortality never to lay down your arms never to cease hostilities till you regenerate and save this fallen land gather round the standard of your chiefs who dares to say he will not follow when o'brien leads or who amongst you is so abject that he will grovel in the squalid misery of his hut or be content to be flung from the ditch side into the living tomb of the poorhouse rather than charge proudly like brave men and free men with that glorious young meagre at their head upon the hired mercenaries of their enemies one bold one decisive move one instant to take breath and then a rising a rush a charge from north south east and west upon the english garrison and the land is ours do your eyes flash do your hearts throb at the prospect of having a country for you have no country you have never felt the pride the dignity the majesty of independence you could never lift up your head to heaven and glory in the name of irishmen for all europe read the brand of slave upon your brow oh that my words could burn like molten metal through your veins and light up this ancient heroic daring which would make each man of you a leonidas each battlefield a marathon each pass a thermopylae courage need i preach to irishmen of courage is it so hard a thing then to die alas do we not all die daily of broken hearts and shattered hopes and tortures of mind and body that make life a weariness and of weariness worse even than the tortures for life is one long slow agony of death no it cannot be death you fear for you have braved the plague in the exile ship of the atlantic and plague in the exile's home beyond it and famine and ruin and a slave's life and a dog's death and hundreds thousands a million of you have perished thus courage you will not now belie those old traditions of humanity that tell of this divine god gift within us i have read of a roman wife who stabbed herself before her husband's eyes to teach him how to die these million deaths teach us as grand a lesson to die for ireland yes have we not sworn it in a thousand passionate words by our poets and orators in the grave resolves of councils leagues and confederations now is the moment to test whether you value most freedom or life now is the moment to strike and by striking save and the day after the victory it will be time enough to count your dead but we do not provoke this war history will write of us that ireland endured wrongs unexampled by any despotism sufferings unequalled by any people her lifeblood drained by a vampire host of foreign masters and officials her honour insulted by a paid army of spies her cries of despair stifled by the armed hand of legalised ruffianism that her peasants starved while they reaped the corn for their foreign lords because no man gave them bread that her pallid artisans pined and wasted because no man gave them work that her men of genius the noblest and purest of her sons were dragged to a felon's cell lest the people might hear the voice of truth 
and that in this horrible atrophy of all mental and physical powers, this stagnation of all existences, whoever dared to rise and demand wherefore it was that Ireland, made so beautiful by God, was made the plague spot of the universe by man, he was branded as a felon, imprisoned, robbed, tortured, chained, exiled, murdered. Thus history will write of us, and she will also write that Ireland did not start from this horrid trance of suffering and despair until 30,000 swords were at her heart, and even then she did not rise for vengeance, only prepared to resist. No, we are not the aggressors, we do not provoke this terrible war. Even with six million hearts to aid us, and with all the chance of success in our favour, we still offer terms to England. If she capitulates even now at the eleventh hour, and grants the moderate, the just demands of Ireland, our arms shall not be raised to sever the golden link that unites the two nations. And the chances of success are all with us. There is a godlike strength in a just cause, a desperate energy in men who are fighting in their own land for the possession of that land a growing enthusiasm that scorns all danger when from success they can look onward to a future of unutterable glory and happiness for their country. Opposed to us are only a hired soldiery and a paid police, who, mere trained machines even as they are, yet must shudder, for they are men, at the horrible task of butchery under the blasphemed name of duty to which England summons them. Brothers, many of them are of this people they are called upon to murder, sons of the same soil, fellow countrymen of those who are heroically struggling to elevate their common country. Surely whatever humanity is left in them will shrink from being made the sad instruments of despotism and tyranny. They will blush to receive the purchase money of England which hires them for the accursed and fratricidal work. Would a Sicilian have been found in the ranks of Naples? Would a Milanese have been detected in the fierce hordes of Austria? No, for the Sicilians prize honour, and the stately Milanese would strike the arm to the earth that would dare to offer them Austrian gold in payment for the blood of their own countrymen. And heaven forbid that in Ireland could be found a band of armed fratricides to fight against their own land for the flag of a foreign tyrant. But if, indeed, interest or coercion should tempt them into so horrible and unnatural a position, pity, a thousand times pity, for those brave officers who vaunt themselves on their honour, pity for that brave soldiery whose Irish valour has made England illustrious, that they must stain honour and fame and profession and their brave swords by lending them to so infamous a cause. Ah, we need not tremble for a nation filled with a pure and holy enthusiasm and fighting for all that human nature holds dear. But the masters of those hired mercenaries may well tremble for their cause, for the consciousness of eternal infamy will unnerve every arm that is raised to uphold it. If the government, then, do not come forward with honest, honourable and liberal concessions, let the war active and passive commence. They confide in the discipline of their troops, we in the righteousness of our cause. But not even a burning enthusiasm, which they have not, added to their discipline, could make a garrison of 30,000 men hold their ground against six millions. And one thing is certain, that if the people do not choose to fight the garrison, they may starve them. Adopt the Milan method. Let no man sell to them. This passive warfare may be carried on in every village in Ireland, while more active hostilities are proceeding through all the large towns and cities. But to gain possession of the capital should be the grand object of all efforts. Let every line converge to this point. The castle is the keystone of English power. Take it, 
destroy it, burn it, at any hazard become masters of it, and on the same ground from whence proceeded all those acts of insult and infamy which aroused the just retribution of a people's vengeance, establish a government in whom the people of all classes can place confidence. On this pedestal of fallen tyranny and corruption raise a structure of nobleness that will at once give security and prestige of time-honoured and trusted names to our revolution. For a people who rise to overthrow a despotism will establish no modification of it in its place. If they fight, it is for absolute independence, and as the first step in a revolution should be to prevent the possibility of anarchy, the men elected to form this government ought at once to take the entire progress and organisation of the revolution under their protection and authority. It will be their duty to watch that no crime be suffered to stain the pure flag of Irish liberty. We must show to the world that we are fitted to govern ourselves, that we are indeed worthy to be a free nation, that the words union, liberty, country have as sacred a meaning in our hearts and actions as they are wholly on our lips, that patriotism means not merely the wild irresistible force that crushed tyranny, but reconstruction, regeneration, heroism, sacrifice, sublimity, that we have not alone to break the fetters of Ireland, but to raise her to a glorious elevation, defend her, liberate her, ennoble her, sanctify her. Nothing is wanting now to complete our regeneration, to ensure our success, but to cast out those vices which have disgraced our name among the nations. There are terrible traditions shadowing the word liberty in Ireland. Let it be our task, men of this generation, descendants of martyrs and sufferers and heroes, to make it a glad evangel of happiness, a reign of truth over fictions and symbols, of intellect over prejudice and conventionalism, of humanity over tyranny and oppression. Irishman, this resurrection into a new life depends on you, for we have all lain dead. Hate, distrust, oppression, disunion, selfishness, bigotry, these things are death, we must crush all vices, annihilate all evil passions, trample on them as a triumphant Christ with his foot upon the serpent, and then the proud hallelujah of freedom will rise to heaven from the lips of a pure, a virtuous, a regenerated, a God-blessed people. And this fair land of ours, which now affrights the world with its misery, will be one grand temple in which we shall all kneel as brothers, one holy, peaceful, loving fraternity, sons of one common country, children of one God, heirs together of those blessings purchased by our blood, a heritage of freedom, justice, independence, prosperity and glory. Unquote. End of chapter 3《ハッピーバースデーゲイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイスカイス It would be difficult otherwise to understand these extreme measures, for the article is exactly of that class of revolutionary literature which is usually read with gratification by those in power. There is no mischief to be feared from rhapsodical generalities. On the other hand, the papers giving practical advice to the malcontents on subjects so subversive as the destruction of bridges and the manipulation of firearms certainly warranted action. However that may be, it has generally been conceded to Lady Wilde that with her pen she made the castle tremble. She stepped at once to the front as an ardent nationalist and patriot, and of none of her writings were her sons perhaps more proud 
than of the article which is given in the preceding chapter. Her nationalism was, of course, not sincere. It could not be. She had been trained as a Protestant and a Conservative. Her relations, those of whom she was most proud, were beneficed dignitaries under the British crown, just as later her husband was to become by appointment, warrant and vice-regal favour a dependent of British royal favour, and she herself during the last six years of her life was to draw from the civil list a small alimony of imperial silver. No patriotism, no national spirit can be fired in man or woman by the perusal of a single book, and of Dalton Williams' work it may be said that it inspires nothing but ennui. It is not in this way that the Jones of Ark are driven forth to battle. It is, of course, probable that it was the perusal of this book which suggested to the young woman that evils existed, that here was a field for her literary activity, and that her spasmodic nationalism was the result. It showed the young woman's practical sense that this nationalism was only spasmodic, for as we look back on the period of more than half a century which has elapsed since she first manifested its spirit, we observe that it has not been the worldly wise amongst Irish men and women who have espoused the national cause. For the true nationalist, there have been the galleys, the rifle, the scaffold, and, as a set-off from the derision of the worldly wise, the mute gratitude of the voiceless people and a martyr's crown. Lady Wilde's crasser Minerva did not allow her to cling to a cause of which she was so soon to discover that it was a hopeless one. Her nationalism, if whim it were, she readily abandoned, and she did not go through life explaining that the perusal of a single book had entirely changed the current of her thoughts, her purposes and aims. This was one of the mistakes that was made by her son, Oscar. It pleased him to say that some single book, which had come into his hands when he was a young man, had thus revolutionised his entire mentality, and he attributed to the influence of this book all the things that seemed to have been prompted in him by what was not common sense. In a passage in The Picture of Dorian Gray, he describes how the hero of that novel fell under the influence of a single book. Quote, it was the strangest book that he had ever read. It seemed to him that, in exquisite raiment and to the delicate sound of flutes, the sins of the world were passing in dumb show before him. It was a poisonous book, the heavy odour of incense seemed to cling about its pages and to trouble the brain. The mere cadence of the sentences, the subtle monotony of their music, so full as it was of complex refrains and movements elaborately repeated, produced in the mind of the lad, as he passed from chapter to chapter, a form of reverie, a malady of dreaming, that made him unconscious of the falling day and the creeping shadows, for years Dorian Gray could not free himself from the influence of this book. Unquote. This is, of course, silliness. Yet Oscar Wilde used to make the same silly, self-deceiving statement about himself, and attributed to some poisonous book, which he had once read, many of the abnormalities of his conduct. In this, no doubt, he was prompted by the story which he had heard at home as a boy, how the mother whom he so admired and so loved had been prompted to action and to an entire renunciation of early principles and creeds by the reading of a single book. The fact that the influence of this book had been of the briefest was entirely overlooked. The story of the first meeting between the editor of The Nation and John Fenshaw Ellis is well known. It may, however, be repeated here, with the addition of Lady Wilde's own account of how it was that, having long refused to let Mr Duffy call upon her, she finally gave him permission to do so. After a while, she relates, Mr Duffy wished me to call at the office, and again Mr Ellis had to excuse himself from doing it. One day my nurse came into my room and found the nation on my table. Then she accused me of contributing to it, 
declaring the while that such a seditious paper was fit only for the fire. The secret being out in my own family, there was no longer much motive for concealment, and I gave my editor permission to call upon me. Even then, as Sir Charles Duffy has since told me, he scarcely knew who Speranza might be, and great was his surprise, therefore, when I stepped out from an inner room. Sir Charles Duffy relates in his Young Island that, quote, Mr Ellis, whom he had frequently requested to call upon him at the nation office, pleaded that there were difficulties which rendered this course impracticable. Finally, Mr Ellis asked the editor to call at 34 Leeson Street. Going to the house, Duffy states that he was met by Sir George Smith, publisher to Dublin University, who presented him to Miss Jane Francesca Elgie, whom he describes as a tall girl whose stately carriage and figure, flashing brown eyes, and features cast in an heroic mould, seemed fit for the genius of poetry or the spirit of the revolution. Unquote. After the suppression of the nation, most of the leaders of the revolutionary movement were transported for treason felony, while Mr afterwards Sir Charles Duffy, was put on trial for sedition. The Attorney General quoted from the article Yacta Alia Est in support of the charge, and declared that the article was sufficient to convict the prisoner at the bar. "'I am the culprit, if culprit there be,' cried a voice from the gallery of the court, and a young woman rose to her feet. It was Jane Francesca Elgie who by this fine gesture endeared herself forever to the Irish nation. The result was to trouble the minds of the jury. They disagreed, and the editor of the nation was discharged to pursue his career more profitably to himself in another hemisphere. Speranza's admiration for this man appears to have been very great. The following is one of the many letters she wrote to him after her identity had been disclosed. Quote, 34 Leeson Street, Monday. My dear sir, I return with many thanks the volume of Cromwell which has been travelling about with me for the last four months, and shall feel obliged for the two others when you are quite at leisure, though not even Carlyle can make this soulless iconoclast interesting, it is the only work of Carlyle's I have met with in which my heart does not go along with his words. I cannot forbear telling you, now the pen is in my hand, how deeply impressed I felt by your opening lecture to your club. It was the sublimest teaching, and the style so simple from its very sublimity. It seemed as if truth passed directly from your heart to ours without the aid of any medium. At least, I felt that everywhere the thoughts struck you, nowhere the words. And this, in my opinion, is the perfection of composition. It is soul speaking to soul. I never felt the dignity of your cause so much as then. To promote it, anyway, seemed an object that would ennoble a life. Truly, we cannot despair when God sends us such teachers." But you will wish me away for another four happy months if I write you such long notes, so I shall conclude with kind compliments to Mrs. Duffy and remain yours very sincerely, Francesca Elgie. I only read your lecture. Some time or other, I would like to hear you. Unquote. A year or two before she died in the dismal house in Oakley Street, Chelsea, which her son William and his family shared with her, and of which her son Oscar paid the rent, Lady Wilde said to a young Irish poet, I must go and live up Primrose Hill. I was an eagle in my youth. By various writers, various pictures have been given of this extraordinary woman at various periods of her life. There are many people still living in Dublin who remember number one Merrion Square when it was the Salon of the Capital. On reception nights, the crush of people in the drawing rooms upstairs used to be so great that it was a familiar spectacle, that of Lady Wilde elbowing her way through the crush and crying out, However am I to get through all these people? As her beauty departed from her with the advance of years, Lady Wilde used to darken the rooms in which visitors saw her. Stories got about that the purpose of this was to conceal some disfiguring mark on her face, 
but the fact was merely that she did not wish people to notice the difference that time had wrought on the features and complexion of the beautiful Speranza of 1848. A Miss Corcoran gives the following account of a call she paid to Lady Wilde at No. 1 Merrion Square, an account which is not characterised by much sympathy or kindness. Quote, I called at Merrion Square late in the afternoon, for Lady Wilde never received anyone until 5pm, as she hated strong lights. The shutters were closed and the lamps had pink shades, though it was full daylight. A very tall woman, she looked over six feet high, she wore that day a long crimson silk gown which swept the floor. The skirt was voluminous, Underneath there must have been two crinolines, for when she walked there was a peculiar swaying, swelling movement, like that of a vessel at sea, with the sails filled with wind. Over the crimson silk were flounces of limerick lace, and round what had been a waist, an oriental scarf embroidered with gold was twisted. The long, massive, handsome face was plastered with powder, over her blue-black glossy hair was a gilt crown of laurels. Her throat was bare, so were her arms, but they were covered with quaint jewellery. On her broad chest was fastened a series of large miniature brooches, evidently family portraits. This gave her the appearance of a walking family mausoleum. She wore white kid gloves, held a scent bottle, a lace handkerchief and a fan, Lady Wilde reminded me of a tragedy queen at a suburban theatre. Unquote. Lady Wilde was very popular in Dublin with the people. It is related that, quote, they used to cheer her when she was on her way to the drawing rooms at the castle, unquote, just because some years previously she had urged a hundred thousand musketeers to march upon that very castle and to wipe it off the face of Ireland. In the story of An Unhappy Friendship, we find the following reference to Lady Wilde at home in her son William's house in Park Street, Grosvenor Square, in 1883. Quote, During the first days of my stay there, Oscar Wilde took me to a reception at his mother's house. I was presented as having a volume of poems in the press, and was graciously received. Later on, as I was standing talking to Anna Kingsford, Lady Wilde, holding some primroses in her hand, crossed the drawing-room, repeating, Flowers for the poet! Flowers for the poet! It was for me that they were intended, for she came up to me and decorated my coat with the posy. Unquote. Lady Wilde was at that time about fifty-seven years of age. She had by then entirely renounced her natural feminine and pathetic endeavours to conceal the march of time. Her receptions were in broad daylight. The deceptive flambeaux with their pink shades had been put away till nightfall. She was a strikingly handsome woman, Seta Kelkun. Her voice had a peculiar power and a peculiar charm. She seemed happy. Poverty and disaster had not yet come upon her. Her sons were both full of promise and achievement. There were to be noticed few of the peculiarities of dress to which Miss Corcoran calls attention. Yet her black silk bodice was as covered with large old-fashioned medallions as is with orders on garter nights the brochette of the diplomat whose back has been supple all through life. Her clinging to youth, her efforts to mask the advance of age, her horror for the stigmata of physical decay were all characteristics which she transmitted to her son Oscar. His books are full of rhapsodical eulogies of youth. He never tires of satirising and condemning maturity and old age. In the same way, her fondness for large, showy and curious articles of jewellery, which, especially amongst the Jews, is a trait which often characterises men and women of genius, was directly transmitted to this son. The gradual descent of this woman in the social scale is one of the pathetic stories of literary history. This ex-revolutionary had for the society of the wealthy, the titled, the distinguished, the same pronounced liking which was noticed in Oscar Wilde also, 
as long as it was possible for her to do so, indeed, until at last broken down by disappointment and illness, she finally took to the bed where she breathed her last after an agony of many months, she held her drawing-rooms. But the imperial days of Merrion Square, even the semi-aristocratic reunions of Park Street, were of the past. In the dingy house in Oakley Street, fit scene for the unspeakable tragedies that time held in its lap, the gatherings were the shabby genteel burlesque of a literary salon. Miss Hamilton has given a picture of such a reception in this house, which shows us Lady Wilde just before she resigned herself to desolation and solitude. Quote, I had an invitation, writes Miss Hamilton, quote, to her Saturday at Holmes, and on a dull, muggy December day I reached the house. The hour on the card said from five to seven, and it was past five when I knocked at the door. The bell was broken. The narrow hall was heaped with cloaks, waterproofs and umbrellas, and from the door, for the reception rooms were on the ground floor, came a confusing buzz of voices. Anglo-Irish and American, Irish literary people, to say nothing of a sprinkling of brutal Saxons, were crowded together as thickly as sardines in a box. Red shaded lamps were on the mantelpiece, red curtains veiled doors and windows, and through this darkness visible I looked vainly for the hostess. Where was she? Where was Lady Wilde? Then I saw her, a tall woman, slightly bent with rheumatism, fantastically dressed in a trained black and white checkered silk gown. From her head floated long white tulle streamers, mixed with ends of scarlet ribbon. What glorious dark eyes she had! Even then, and she was over sixty, she was a strikingly handsome woman. Though I was a perfect stranger to her, she at once made me welcome, and introduced me to someone she thought I would like to know. She had the art de faire un salon. If any one was discovered sitting in a corner unnoticed, Lady Wilde was sure to bring up someone to be introduced, and she never failed to speak a few happy words, which made the stranger feel at home. She generally prefaced her introductions with some remarks such as, Mr. A, who has written a delightful poem, or Miss B, who is on the staff of the Snapdragon, or Mrs. C, whose new novel everyone is talking about. As to her own talk, it was remarkably original, sometimes daring, and always interesting. Her talent for talk was infectious. Everyone talked their best. There was tea in the back room, but no one seemed to care about eating and drinking. Some forms of journalism had no attraction for her. I can't write, I heard her say, about such things as Mrs. Green looked very well in black and Mrs. Black looked very well in green. Miss Hamilton also relates the following characteristic anecdote about Lady Wilde. Quote, when I was at Oakley Street one day, I asked what time it was, as I wanted to catch a train. Does anyone here, asked Lady Wilde, with one of her lofty glances, know what time it is? We never know in this house about time. Unquote. This, adds Miss Hamilton, it seems to me was a key to the way in which Lady Wilde looked at things. Trifles, everyday trifles, she considered quite beneath her and yet trifles make up the sum of human life. She had a horror of the miasma of the commonplace. Her eyes were fixed on ideals, on heroes, ancient and modern, and thus she missed much that was lying near her, close to her feet, in her fervent admiration of the dim, the distant and the unapproachable. The great caricaturist Dickens, whose notice few of his distinguished contemporaries escaped, seems to have studied some of Lady Wilde's peculiarities from afar, and the results of his observations may be found here and there in his books. After her marriage, Speranza, abandoning poetry and the young Ireland movement of which she had sung, We stand in the light of a dawning day with its glory creation flushing, and the life currents up from the pristening clay through the world's great heart are rushing, 
while from peak to peak of the spirit land a voice unto voice is calling the night is over the day is at hand and the fetters of earth are falling turned to prose in a letter dated from oakley street in eighty eight she writes to mr d j o'donoghue the following account of her literary and journalistic labours dear sir in answer to the inquiries contained in your note i have to state that i have contributed to many periodicals in london amongst others to the university magazine tinsley's magazine the burlington magazine the woman's world the queen the ladies pictorial the pall mall gazette and others whose names i cannot now recall the more important writings of recent years are driftwood from scandinavia bentley one volume eighteen sixty seven ancient irish legends ward and downey two volumes eighteen eighty seven the american irish a political pamphlet dublin but i have recently devoted myself more to literature than to politics nationality was certainly the first awakener of any mental power of genius within me and the strongest sentiments of my intellectual life but the present state of irish affairs requires the strong guiding hand of men there is no place any more for the more passionate aspirations of a woman's nature unquote. in another letter to mr o'donoghue she states also i did not write in eighteen forty four for the nation nor did i write the chosen leader the following is a list of the best known among the books of lady wilde poems by speranza eighteen seventy one driftwood from scandinavia eighteen eighty four ancient legends mystic charms and superstitions of ireland two volumes eighteen eighty seven ancient cures charms and usages of ireland eighteen ninety social studies eighteen ninety three she further wrote the times biographer of her after her death quote, translated several french and german works and was the author of ugo bassi a tale of the italian revolution in verse published in eighteen fifty seven the first temptation eighteen sixty three the glacier land adapted from dumas the wanderer and his home adapted from lamartine and pictures from the first french revolution eighteen sixty five to eighteen seventy five in eighteen eighty she issued the concluding portion of her husband's memoir of beranger Unquote. she was never photographed and the only portraits which survive are engravings from pictures many of her writings were never published her poems are still read and that there is still a demand for her two books ancient cures and ancient legends is shown by the fact that these two books were included in the recently issued catalogue of a large new book lending enterprise but these books however according to lady wilde's own statement were largely taken from materials collected by or for her husband he would employ very many people she related once quote, schoolmasters in the villages chiefly who could speak both irish and english to investigate and collect all the local traditions superstitions etc of the peasantry when he died a great amount of material had been collected much of which i have published in the last year or so in the volumes entitled ancient cures charms and usages of ireland and ancient legends of ireland sir william had a passion for such research and in recognition of his services the royal irish academy gave him its gold medal Unquote. this detailed investigation into the immediate parentage and remoter affinities and relationships of oscar wilde has afforded us many data which will go towards enabling the student of his life to understand some points in his complex character as well as a few of his peculiarities of these some came to him by direct inheritance in his blood so to say others were the result of that instinctive imitation of their parents and such of their kinsfolk as are held up as examples for their reverence and admiration which all children practice psychological influences have also been indicated 
it may be well in conclusion to sum up under their different headings certain characteristics of his which we are now able to trace back to their source under direct inheritance or transmission by blood may perhaps be classed his literary capacity his gifts of poetry languages of ready mastery of difficult studies his love of the beautiful the sound common sense of his normal periods his family and personal pride and his moral courage in the face of danger but also an indifference to the dangers of alcoholism an aversion from failure physical social and mental an exaggerated esteem on the other hand for wealth titles and social success a tolerance for moral laxness the instinctive imitation of childhood may explain his love for eccentricity in dress his professions of an adoration for youth and a hatred for old age his claim that the perusal of a single book entirely revolutionized his mentality this rough classification is only advanced tentatively as a suggestion and with all due awe for the complex mysteries of the human soul the psychology of an oscar wilde is not to be resolved into elemental factors by human intelligence but the few data arrived at may render the problem of that psychology less bewildering and at the same time because of the very dimness of the light which they cast impress us with the magnitude and the obscurity of the problem now it is not right or lawful for man to judge or condemn that which he cannot understand when god withholds his light either on the acts or on the motives of a fellow man it means nothing more than this that he reserves the judging of that man's acts and thoughts for his own supreme tribunal end of chapter four Chapter Five of The Life of Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Such was the parentage of the child who was born on sixteenth October, eighteen fifty four, at number one Merrion Square, in the mournful city of Dublin, whose advent, because he was a boy, was a disappointment to his mother and who for a long time after his birth was treated as a girl, talked to as a girl, dressed as a girl. His father did not share his wife's caprice, and for his second son selected names of singular virility. These names were so chosen as to proclaim to the world the lad's close association by blood with the history of Ireland. Oscar is good Celtic. It is a name closely connected with Irish legend and record, and here another negation is necessary oscar wilde was not the godson of the duke of ostergirtland although speranza allowed it to be understood that it had been after this princely friend of the family that the boy was called people living in dublin who remember the christening and all the circumstances connected with that ceremony have stated that at the time of oscar's birth the wilds were not acquainted with the gentleman who is now the king of sweden the myth was one of those schwarmerine on the part of lady wilde to which reference has already been made it is certain that before oscar's birth the personality of the poet prince must have greatly occupied speranza's thoughts for the personal resemblance between oscar wilde and the king of sweden was one which struck everyone who knew the two men more particularly was this resemblance a striking one between the prince as a student at Uppsala and Oscar Wilde as a student at Oxford. On page 39 of Dr. Joseph Link's biography of King Oscar, Konung Oscar, Adolf Bonnier, Stockholm, there appeared a portrait of the young duke, which vividly reminds one of Oscar Wilde at the same age. However, it appears to be the fact that the child's name was chosen by his father, who wanted him to have a good ancient Irish name. For the same reason, he also caused his son to be christened Fingal and O'Flaherty, the latter from those wild O'Flaherty's from whom Cromwell's soldiers, in an addendum to the litany, prayed God to deliver them. At the same time, the additional name of Wills was bestowed upon the boy, 
The motive of this selection was the same. It was to affirm his Irish nationality. The Wills family were wealthy county people who had been settled for over 300 years in Ireland. It was a General Wills of this family who, with General Carpenter, crushed the legitimate hopes of the loyal party at the Battle of the Boyne. With this family the Wildes were closely connected, and in a near degree Oscar Wilde was cousin to that gifted man, W. G. Wills, the dramatist, painter and poet. On the two cousins the wonderful of dramaturgy had descended together with an allied strain of eccentricity, which, however, differed in its developments in the two favoured yet unhappy kinsmen. The second son of William Wilde by his marriage to Jane Francesca Elgie was accordingly christened Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Wills Wilde. In his youth and early manhood he was proud of these sounding patronymics. Later on he discarded the use of them. They irritated him. To refer to them was to provoke his great anger. They classified him, they labelled him. They wrote him down as de son village. And this was intolerable to him, to his cosmopolitan sense, to his disdain for partisanships, politics and protestations. He had a strong aversion from what was local in interest, from what was outré and self-assertive. And in all these ways his Irish Christian names offended his taste. For the rest, Oscar Wilde never willingly placed himself on the losing side in any division of men. Irishmen and Irish matters have always been as unpopular in the London society to which he aspired as they are in lower spheres of the Anglo-Saxon mob. And although Oscar Wilde never denied his nationality, he took particular care not to let it transpire. In some circles in Dublin, it is held that he was an ardent Irish patriot, that the mantle that Speranza wore in 48 had descended upon his broad shoulders, that it was this very pride as an Irishman which prevented him from fleeing from a British court of justice when the opportunity offered itself to him so to do. If this was so, he was able to dissimulate here also with astonishing skill. It was amongst luxurious surroundings that the child was reared, his father's house is one of the best houses in the best part of Dublin. And good houses in the Irish capital are very good indeed. They are mute witnesses, as are also the fine broad streets today, of former opulence and splendour. There are few houses in London or other big English cities which can compare in comfort, amplitude, elegance and decoration with a very large number of the Dublin bourgeois palaces. Number 1, Merrion Square, which is a corner house, is situated in one of the pleasantest and most convenient parts of the town. From the front, the windows overlook the Merrion Square gardens. There is a large garden at the back, and on the right is Lincoln Place. The house, which is now occupied by a dentist, is painted red on the Lincoln Place front, and the windows which look out on this side are of an oriental style of architecture. It is a big, solid, substantial bourgeois house which makes some pretensions to originality and artisticness. It looks the ideal residence for a successful professional man who stands well at court, but it hardly strikes one as the fit dwelling place for a revolutionary poetess, or as the birthplace of a man of genius who, over shifting, lifting deeps and by circuitous routes, was to come to a deathbed so forlorn and sombre. No tablet yet records the fact that in this house was born the author of The Soul of Man or of De Profundis. But on the tablets of the people's memory, that record is engraved. Just opposite the house, at the corner of the gardens, is a cab stand, and amongst the drivers is an elderly man who, when he sees any stranger looking up at number one Merrion Square, touches his hat and says that his honour is no doubt looking at the house where Sir Oscar Wilde was born. The stranger may answer that he did not know that the poet had been knighted also, and then the Jarvey says that, sure and he was, that he was a great poet besides, and that as a lad he had often driven the gentleman. 
he speaks of it with pride as a thing to be remembered and he has nothing but good things to say of the young man who was kind and genial and who paid handsomely for each set down oscar wilde was always a good friend to cab drivers at the time of his trial he was known as one of the best riders in chelsea amongst the cabmen he must in his opulent days have spent many hundred pounds a year in cabs at one period he used to take a cab by the day and the first address that he used to give to the driver was the burlington arcade where there was a florist's shop where every day he fetched for himself a buttonhole flower costing half a guinea and another costing half a crown for his cabman for the day the dublin cabman does not recollect that his young patron had any partiality for buttonhole flowers but he remembers that even in those days oscar wilde would not drive in a cab which was drawn by a white horse as he considered this most unlucky for the rest he speaks of the young man as of all the wild family with respect and regret it was a sad day he says when they went across the water as children the brothers william and oscar were great friends and oscar wilde in after life frequently spoke of their mutual attachment i had a toy bear he once related of which i was very fond indeed so fond that i used to take it to bed with me and i thought that nothing could make me more unhappy than to lose my bear well one day willie asked me for it and i was so fond of willie that i gave it to him i remember without a pang afterwards however the enormity of the sacrifice i had made impressed itself upon me i considered that such an act merited the greatest gratitude and love in return and whenever willie crossed me in any way i used to say willie you don't deserve my bear give me back my bear and for years afterwards after we had grown up whenever we had a slight quarrel i used to say the same willie you don't deserve my bear you must give me back my bear he used to laugh at this recollection a third child was born to lady wilde the daughter she had longed for she was like a golden ray of sunshine dancing about our home oscar wilde used to say of this sister she did not live to reach womanhood her loss was the greatest grief that lady wilde knew until one of oscar wilde's most beautiful poems a requiescat which appears in his first volume of poems is dedicated to the girl's memory he writes of her she hardly knew she was a woman so softly she grew there is one verse which renders a thought which must have come to all who mourn the dead coffin board heavy stone lie on her breast i vex my heart alone she is at rest already as a very small boy oscar gave proof of great cleverness a great novelist of irish birth relates how as a boy he accompanied his mother to call on lady wilde who was just then staying at a country house on the borders of mayo and galway where sir william wilde had an estate the caller asked lady wilde about the boys and she answered willie is all right but oscar is wonderful wonderful he can do anything he was then nine years of age in an article which ernest la jeunesse wrote about him after his death in paris the french critic referring to wilde's wonderful knowledge and capacity said il savait tout indeed few men have so impressed their contemporaries with the feeling of omniscience in a biographical notice of oscar wilde which appeared in eighteen ninety one is the following passage referring to his early education Quote, the son of two remarkable people mr wilde had a remarkable upbringing from his earliest childhood his principal companions were his father and mother and their friends now wandering about ireland with the former in quest of archaeological treasures now listening in lady wilde's salon to the wit and thought of ireland the boy before his eighth year had learned the ways to the shores of old romance had seen all the apples plucked from the tree of knowledge and had gazed with wondering eyes into the younger day this upbringing suited his idiosyncrasy 
Indeed, with his temperament, it is impossible to conceive what else could have been done with him. He had, of course, tutors, and the run of a library containing the best literature, and went to a royal school. But it was at his father's dinner table, and in his mother's drawing room, that the best of his early education was obtained. Another experience, unusual to boyhood, had a powerful formative influence. He travelled much in France and Germany, becoming acquainted with the works of Heine and Goethe, but more especially with French literature and the French temperament. It was in France, at an age when other boys are grinding at grammar or cricket, that Oscar Wilde began to realise in some measure what he was. There he found himself for the first time in a wholly congenial environment. The English temperament, there are those who deny that such a thing exists, like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh, responds indifferently to the aesthetic. In France, Mr Wilde found everywhere exquisite susceptibility to beauty, and found also that he himself, an Irish Celt, possessed this susceptibility in all its intensity. French and Greek literature were the two earliest passions of his artistic life. Unquote. That he was familiar with German literature as a boy is not the case, and it is also doubtful if the French environment revealed to the lad anything within himself of which he was not aware. There is no special susceptibility to beauty in France. Indeed, in few countries is more profound indifference displayed by the great mass of the people to the wonderful natural and artistic beauty with which the country is endowed. In Oscar Wilde's youth, the very beauties which he was afterwards to celebrate in periods so eloquent were the derision of the majority. As a young man, Oscar Wilde used to echo the foolish contempt of Lamartine, which was the fashionable attitude of the cognoscenti in France in his boyhood. Lamartine, expounded by him, appeared a French Martin Tupper. And this is but an instance. His visits to France seem to have laid the foundations of that great knowledge of the French language which he displayed in the writing of Salome. As to the writing and language of this play, the best French critics are unanimous in expressing their wonder that any foreigner could have acquired such a mastery of the French language, its beauties and intricacies. But, as Ernest La Jeunesse has said, il savait tout. French was so familiar to him that, as he used to say, he often thought in French. As a preparation for a literary career in England, this was not a good thing. The most successful writer knows only the tongue in which he writes. Linguistic attainment spoils the mother language for the unilingual reader. The average Englishman cannot follow the writer who at times thinks in a tongue which is not his own. He revolts against similes, deductions, points of view which are not English. The man whose books translate well into foreign languages is not likely to be very highly appreciated in his own country. That is why, perhaps, it has been said that posterity begins at the frontier. There are exceptions, of course. Gérard de Nerval's translation of Goethe's Faust was such a beautiful work that Goethe himself wrote to the French poet to compliment him on the authorship of the French Faust. But Faust is in itself an exception. It is what the Germans call a Weltstück, a term, by the way, which they have also applied to Salome. Shakespeare reads badly in foreign translations, even where the son of Hugo, under Victor Hugo's guidance, writes the version. Dickens never appealed to foreign nations in any degree equivalently to his wonderful influence on his countrymen. It was an artificial atmosphere in which the lad, Oscar, was reared. It is wonderful that he escaped that taint of precocity for which the English dictionary has another and a less euphonious term. It is more wonderful still that until his inherent madness broke out, he escaped the taint of moral laxness which infected the air of his father's house. Here, high thinking did not go hand in hand with plain living. The house was a hospitable one. It was a house of opulence and carouse, of late suppers and deep drinking, of careless talk and example. 
His father's gallantries were the talk of Dublin. Even his mother, although a woman of spotless life and honour, had a loose way of talking which might have been full of danger to her sons. A saying of hers is still remembered in Dublin, which gives an echo of the way in which her attitude of revolt against the accepted and the commonplace prompted her to mischievous talk. There has never been a woman yet in this world who wouldn't have given the top off the milk jug to some man if she could met the right one. The mother's salon, the father's supper table, were frequented by boozy and boisterous bohemians, than whom no city more than Dublin furnishes stranger specimens. How free was the conversation which went on there in the presence of the two lads may be gathered from a remark which Oscar Wilde once made to a fellow undergraduate at Trinity College. Come home with me, he said. I want to introduce you to my mother. We have founded a society for the suppression of virtue. This statement, of course, partook of the nature of those remarks as to which a prefect of police in Paris once asked Charles Baudelaire, the poet, why a man of his genius often spoke in so foolish a way. Pour étonner les sots, answered Baudelaire. It was to astonish fools, without any doubt, that Oscar Wilde so spoke on that occasion, for there was no cleaner-lived young man than he, but his words show the prevailing moral atmosphere at home and the dangers to which he was exposed. And no doubt also that having been exposed all through his youth to the contagion of immorality, his powers of resistance against moral disease had been so weakened that when the attack came he had not the strength to overcome it. There is a great analogy between physical and mental diseases. This record should teach a lesson to parents which they would do well to lay to heart. By his father as a lad he was taught to admire the beauties of nature, but it did not appear in after life that he shared Sir William's enthusiasm. Though he wrote much and well about flowers and birds and the beauties of the land under the moving seasons, he used to describe the country as rather tedious, and to the end remained a dweller in cities. Atmospheric effects, the planets and the stars, the lights on land and sea, though he recognised their utility for poetical description, certainly never aroused emotions within him. Of Sir William, on the other hand, it is related that one night after everybody had retired to rest in the house which he owned at Howth, at the seaside near Dublin, a terrific storm having broken out overhead, he dragged a reluctant guest from his bed and up to the top of the house, there to admire with him the wonderful effects of the lightning flashes over the sea. He kept me there for nearly an hour, related this guest afterwards, and showed the greatest enthusiasm for the spectacle. I was far from sharing his excitement. It was drenching wet, and we were both lightly clad, yet he kept appealing to me to join him in saying that it was the most wonderful night that I had ever spent. Oscar held that the monotony of life spent amidst rustic surroundings was fatal to artistic production. One can only write in cities, he wrote in a letter to one of his friends. The country hanging on one walls in the grey mists of Corot, or the opal mornings that Daubigny has given us. In the same letter he speaks of the splendid whirl and swirl of life in London, his dislike for nature and the natural life as contrasted to artificiality, and that mode of existence which claims to be the outcome of the highest civilization, developed as he grew older. The utterances of Vivian, through whose mouth Oscar Wilde speaks, where he decries nature in the decay of lying, are not so much brilliant paradox. They are the sincere expressions of Oscar Wilde's feeling on the subject, the passage from the first essay in Intentions may be quoted here. Quote, Vivian. Enjoy nature? I am glad to say that I have entirely lost that faculty. People tell us that art makes us love nature more than we loved her before, that it reveals her secrets to us, and that after a careful study of Corot and Constable, we see things in her that had escaped our observation. My own experience is that the more we study art, the less we care for nature. 
What art really reveals to us is nature's lack of design, her curious crudities, her extraordinary monotony, her absolutely unfinished condition. Nature has good intentions, of course, but as Aristotle once said, she cannot carry them out. When I look at a landscape, I cannot help seeing all its defects. It is fortunate for us, however, that nature is so imperfect, as otherwise we should have had no art at all. Art is our spirited protest, our gallant attempt to teach nature her proper place. As for the infinite variety of nature, that is a pure myth. Unquote. A little lower down, Vivian continues. Quote, but nature is so uncomfortable. Grass is hard and lumpy and damp, and full of dreadful black insects. Why, even Morris's poorest workman could make you a more comfortable seat than the whole of nature can. If nature had been comfortable, mankind would never have invented architecture, and I prefer houses to the open air. In a house we all feel of the proper proportions, Everything is subordinated to us, fashioned for our use and our pleasure. Egotism itself, which is indoor life. Unquote. People have been wont to point to intentions as masterpieces of paradox. The truth is that these essays contain in paradoxical form Wilde's most orthodox creeds. The vigour with which he enunciates his opinions proceeds, no doubt, from the knowledge that there is much pretense, not to say hypocrisy, in the general definitions of what is good and beautiful. This hypocrisy stirred his indignation and gave impetus to his pen. What ordinary man or woman of the world really cares for nature in preference to urban haunts? What sincerity is there in the gushing rhapsodies about the beauties of the country to which it is fashionable to give utterance? How many times does the London dame or squire look up to the stars? End of chapter 5。Chapter 6 of The Life of Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The school which was selected for Oscar Wilde by his parents was a school founded by an English prince, the father of that pretender whom one of the boy's ancestors had helped to overthrow. Possibly it was Speranza's great detestation of the soulless iconoclast, Cromwell, that prompted her to send her sons to be alumni in a house of which King Charles was the founder, patron and benefactor, Portora Royal School, Enniskillen. Motives of economy may also have dictated this choice, for, compared with the fees of an English public school, the charges at Portora are very small. There are three terms in the year, and the fees for each boarder, quotes, a considerable reduction being made in the case of brothers, are only £17.10 shillings per term. According to the present synopsis of the course of instruction, the work of the higher forms is mainly directed towards preparation for the universities, and especially for Trinity College Dublin. The school is under the government of the Fermanagh Protestant Board of Education, of which the Right Reverend the Lord Bishop of Cloha, D.D., is the chairman, and amongst the members of which are the Rector of Enniskillen and another Church of England clergyman. It is a sectarian school, for we notice amongst the provisions of the course of instruction there that, quote, religious training is regarded as of supreme importance. The boarders are regularly instructed in divinity, and on Sundays attend the respective Protestant churches in charge of responsible masters, unquote. From what proceeds, it is easy to imagine the bias with which English and Irish history must have been taught in this school, what Whiggish principles must have been instilled hour by hour into the pupils' minds, and what the prevailing opinion among Oscar's pastors and masters on Irish nationalism and the doings of the Young Ireland Party may have been. For instance, one may fancy the views of the Lord Bishop of Cloher, D.D., on the glorious young Meagher. 
at first bewilderment must have come to the lad who had been trained to admire his mother for the part she had taken in a movement which to the right reverend the lord bishop and the rest of the fermanna protestant board of education must have appeared in much the same light as did to the lord archbishop of munster the proceedings of john of leyden and the other anabaptists in fifteen thirty six bewilderment would give place to an insight into the insincerity of most political professions and from this to cynicism and general disbelief would be but one step Quote, if the gods of our faith be liars in whom shall we trust Unquote. oscar went to this school when he was eleven years old lady wilde's description of him as a wonderful boy who could do anything seems to have been justified by his early achievements at portora in eighteen sixty eight he was already very high up in the school he had indeed already reached the third class in his first year it is recorded of him that he got quicker into a book than any boy that ever lived at the same time he was a great dunce in mathematical class he has been described by a schoolfellow of his who is now a most distinguished man as absolutely incapable of mathematics in arithmetic he was hopelessly bad and as by the regulations of the school a certain proficiency in arithmetic was an indispensable qualification for the winning of certain prizes for scholarship it was a usual thing to see young oscar wilde on the eve of entering some examination being coached in the elements of mathematical science by one of the junior masters this early incapacity for figures explains much of the recklessness of his after life the careful and parsimonious of this world are by instinct mathematicians at least as far as the four great rules are concerned it is recorded of most spendthrifts on the other hand that the faculty of calculation is an element lacking in their mental composition has the world's history any record of an extravagant mathematician oscar wilde was a big boy very tall for his age and distinctly heavy of build one of his schoolfellows said that he used to flop about ponderously he was not popular with the other boys for one thing he never played any games in later life he used to say that he objected to cricket because the attitudes assumed were so indecent he never rode on the lake and he had for the musketry instructor and the drill sergeant contempt mingled with pity his manner was very reserved and he used to keep aloof from the other boys another characteristic which made for his unpopularity amongst his schoolfellows just as in later life it raised up against him so many implacable enemies was the extraordinary gift he had of saying trenchant things about others he was a very clever boy at giving nicknames he was the ironical sponsor to the whole school from the reverend william Steele, d d the headmaster down to the smallest boy in class one b as a man few wits have ever said cleverer and at the same time more biting things about their contemporaries this capacity of his and his ruthless exercise thereof account for much of the hatred that is still alive against him years after his lonely death of one very famous contemporary irish writer he remarked he has no enemies but he is intensely disliked by his friends of the son of a famous pianist he once said when the fact of this parentage was stated to him well i am glad that he has managed to survive it of an extraordinary russian jew who at various times essayed to fill in modern london the role of a mycenas a heliogabalus and other less worthy parts and who hated oscar wilde with an intensity of hatred that almost made him interesting declared he came to london in the hopes of founding a salon he has succeeded only in opening a restaurant he used to use this man's name as a symbol of ugliness as ugly as blank was an expression constantly in his mouth he described him as a fetus in a bottle 
In intentions, one finds many compliments, a rebours, addressed to various of the prominent writers of the time. We are told that Hall Cain writes at the top of his voice, that Rudyard Kipling reveals life by splendid flashes of vulgarity, that, as one turns over the pages of one of James Payne's novels, the suspense of the author becomes quite unbearable, that Henry James writes fiction as if it were a painful duty, and that Marion Crawford has immolated himself on the altar of local colour. These remarks are all very clever, but they are not gratifying to the people about whom they were made, and would not tend to increase the satirist's number of friends. But Oscar Wilde seemed to go out of his way to offend people, not individuals alone, but whole sections of society. What solicitor, for instance, being present at the performance of his comedy The Importance of Being Earnest, and hearing his sneer at the social standing of the profession, as it was put into Lady Bracknell's mouth, but would feel a personal grievance against the author for a gratuitous slight. These are the words referred to. Lady Bracknell. Markby, Markby and Markby? A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told that one of the Mr Markbys is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. Elsewhere, every stockbroker gets an unnecessary wound to his self-esteem. Indeed, few of the professions escape the lash of satire which seems prompted merely by the contempt of a man professing to voice aristocratic and elegant society, and its alleged disdain for men and women who have to work for a living. He carried his imprudence to the extent of insulting journalists with tedious insistence, thus fouling the very trumpets of modern reputation. There are many points in Oscar Wilde's career which allow of a comparison between him and the great Napoleon, and this deliberate delight in provoking enmities, this sheer reckless and uncharitable combativeness, is not the least striking characteristic common to both. In both men it arose from a delusion as to the extent of their powers, from a spirit of prepotence, from an almost imprudent contempt of the aggregate force of the individual adversaries whom they so joyfully and so willfully raised up against themselves. This policy of mischief did not succeed in the hands of Napoleon. It was therefore not likely to be more successful in the hands of Oscar Wilde. The latter was fond of reading the Maximes of the Duc de la Rochefoucauld, and might have remembered to his advantage that the epigrammatist said that the man who thinks that he can do without society makes a mistake, but that the man who thinks that society cannot do without him makes a still greater mistake. Although he is remembered at Portora as having been very clever in giving nicknames to others, none of his schoolfellows can recall what was his own particular sobriquet. He seems to have been generally known as Oscar. As to his brother, Willie, he was known as Blue Blood. He was not a tidy boy. He had inherited some of the paternal carelessness about his appearance, and having one day been remonstrated with for the umber of his neck and hands, declared very proudly that his skin was dark, not because it was dirty, but because of the blue blood in the veins of the wilds. This anecdote might have been left unrecorded, but for the fact that it shows that the wild boys held a high opinion of their social standing, and may explain Oscar's subsequent determined efforts to establish himself in London society, as also his contempt, referred to above, for people whose blood was not blue, and who had to work for their maintenance. And here it may once more be repeated that the exigencies of this biography make it impossible to discard any fact on which friendship or reverence might plead for silence, when that fact can serve to throw light upon the complex problem of the character which we are engaged in studying. Already in those days, young Oscar Wilde showed that fondness for distinguished attire which ever marked him in life. 
he is remembered at Portora as the only boy there who used to wear a top hat. It was always a very fashionable hat of the latest style. All the boys at Portora were provided by school regulations as to the outfit with one black silk hat, but this was for Sunday wear only. Oscar never discarded his. He was always very well dressed and wore his hair long. He had a good wisp of hair, is said of him still in Enniskillen. He did not appear to be very friendly with his brother Willie. Quotes, he was very superior in his manner towards Willie. The latter was much more popular with the boys. The little boys at Portora especially had the greatest affection for Willie Wilde. Even in those early days he had all the charming talent de société, which afterwards won him much success. He used to tell stories to the children, and he used to play the piano for them. Oscar was considered exceedingly clever in literature, that is to say, in his knowledge of books. At the same time, the future author of Intentions never showed any superiority in composition. He never stood out in essays, remarks one of his masters, who adds, Oscar Wilde was never looked upon as a formidable competitor by the boys who went in for examinations in Portora School. His conduct was uniformly good. There was not a breath of a complaint about him in any way, except some short time before he left the school, when, as one of his school fellows relates, he got into an awful row with the headmaster. He had cheeked old Steel something awful. That there was nothing of the decadent about Oscar Wilde in his school days is the unanimous declaration of many men who were boys at school with him. He was a great reader and assimilated what he read in a remarkable manner. He used to get through a book with a speed that astonished everybody, and what he had read thus rapidly he used to remember. He read nothing but English books, and these were generally classical novels. He displayed no particular efficiency in French in those days. He had a great fondness for handsome books and choice editions. When he came so prominently before the world as an aesthete, relates a don at TCD, we all tried to remember any indication that he had given as a lad of a taste for beautiful things, and the only thing that we could recall in this connection was that he always had most expensive copies of class books. He had, for instance, a beautiful large paper edition of Aeschylus. During his last year at Portora, when he was a lad of sixteen, his eager thirst for knowledge and his great receptivity were matters of observation and comment. Often when Mr. Purser was instructing the class in history or in geography, Oscar Wilde would contrive by means of some cleverly put question to lead the master into a disquisition on some topic on which he desired to gain information. The subject in hand would be forgotten. The master, ever prompted by his pupil, would unbosom himself of his store of learning. Sometimes the whole of the hour would be thus absorbed. At other times the master would bring the discussion back to the subject of the lesson, and then it was a sight to see the lad all alert, thinking and planning how, next day, he would turn the master once more onto the question in which he needed instruction. Questions often as abstruse as the relative definitions of nominalism and realism. In arithmetic he made no progress at all while at school, and many boys remember the efforts which Mr Purser used to make to cram him with the elementary rules. It was, perhaps, in the competition for the gold medal, which is the great distinction at Portora, that Oscar Wilde displayed his peculiar capacity for mastering the contents of a classical book. In the We Were Woke, says one of his competitors, which was on the Agamemnon of Aeschylus, he simply walked away from us all. He gained 25% higher marks in this examination than the nearest to him. In October 1871, Oscar Wilde matriculated at Trinity College, Dublin. In the matriculation examination where he obtained the second place, his marks in the various subjects were as follows. Parentheses, 
the maximum number of marks obtainable in each subject was ten. Greek, two papers, eight, eight. Latin, two papers, eight, seven. Latin composition, four. English composition, five. History, eight. Arithmetic, two. His total was thus fifty. The total obtained by another Portora boy, the gentleman who is now the junior bursar of Trinity College, and who ranks as one of the most distinguished classical scholars in the country, was 65. On the second day of the examination, where the subjects were the higher classics, Oscar Wilde obtained 46 marks, whilst the boy who had so outstripped him on the previous day in the rudiments only obtained 36 marks. Oscar Wilde's neglect of the rudiments was always a feature of his character. He is registered on the matriculation book of Trinity College in the following terms and under the headings given. Matriculation entry. Johannes Mallet, Praelector Primarius. Dies Mensis, October 10. Admissorum Nomina, Oscar Wilde. Qualitates, P. Fidei Professiones, I. C. Patres, William. Patrum Qualitates, Physician. Nativitatum Loca, Dublin. Itatis Anni, 16. He was at that time just within six days of his 17th birthday. At this time of his life, therefore, Oscar Wilde displayed side by side with a brilliant capacity for reading and understanding the classics a not-quite first-rate knowledge of the elements of classical knowledge. He was undistinguished in Latin composition, which exacts this mastery of the rudiments, mediocre in English composition and unsatisfactory in arithmetic. It is related of Emile Zola, it may be remembered, that he was rejected at his examination for the baccalaureate degree for inefficiency in composition. During his year's attendance at Trinity College, Dublin, his conduct was irreproachable. He left this college, says one of the dons who was a fellow student of his, with the very highest character. Beyond the foolish remark of his, that invitation of a fellow undergraduate to come to his father's house, which has been quoted above, not a single thing is remembered against him. It was for this reason, no doubt, that no official cognizance was taken by Trinity College Dublin of his public disgrace. His name was not deleted on any of the honourable records on which his capacity, excellence and industry had inscribed it. At Portora Royal College, on the other hand, a resolution was taken by the Fermanagh Protestant Board of Education in virtue of which the inscription of honour of his name on the stone tablets of the schoolhouse would have been erased, when, mirabili dictu, it transpired that outraged nature herself had forestalled the Fermanagh Protestant Board of Education in the execution of this salutary sacrifice. The slab on which Oscar Wilde's name was inscribed in letters of gold had cracked right across the ill-reputed words. Nature had effaced the name. In a less enlightened place, amongst the ignorant and superstitious Irish who are not Protestants, the circumstance might have been hailed as a miracle. He was considered a highly gifted, amiable young man, likely to win a high place as a scholar. In the various college examinations, he continually distinguished himself, he was first out of 14 in the first rank in the Michaelmas Prize Examination, 1872. In Hillary term, he was third of the first rank. The gentleman, now a privy councillor, who was Solicitor General under the last Tory administration, was an undergraduate of the same standing as Oscar Wilde, and with the other junior freshmen competed in the same examinations. He did not, however, emerge from the second rank. In later life, these two men were to be once more in fierce competition, the fiercest competition, perhaps, that has ever been waged in the Old Bailey Court between a witness for the prosecution and a counsel for the defence. And here, too, Oscar Wilde was to hold the superior rank.
it has been stated that the barrister has admitted that until towards the very end of his cross-examination of the prosecutor he felt that he had had the worst of it all along he was just about to sit down when an answer of fatal insolence and folly brought the whole of wilde's splendid defence of himself crumbling to the ground gave an opening to his more patient adversary and exposed himself to devastation and ruin this cross-examination of oscar wilde in the queensbury trial is still eagerly studied by advocates as a lesson how a barrister should act when brought face to face with a hostile witness of such consummate readiness power and nerve the barrister's triumph in this case was a complete one but the reason for that was rather because the witness had become intoxicated with his own triumph throughout lost his head in consequence of this and in an imprudent moment destroyed the whole effect of his previous answers the report teaches what patience can do and a knowledge of the rudiments and in that sense is a triumph for the counsel he might well have lost his head he did not he waited and watched and in the words of a barrister who was sitting in court at his side pounced like a hawk upon the witness when the long waited for opportunity arose amongst certain men prominent at trinity college oscar wilde was held an average sort of man and surprise was expressed when he came to the front such surprise can only have proceeded from that innocency and ignorance of the things of this world which are the most beautiful traits in the character of the deeply learned success in the world the acclaim of the populace do not go to the modest and retiring scholar it is an age of advertisement and even the greatest talents must conform to the commercial exigencies of the hour one may see any day in any of the big public libraries the shabby hungered half blinded man of great learning and knowledge elbowed by the secretary of some popular novelist who is collecting facts for his master the secretary is well dressed well fed and shines with the reflected light of his employer who very probably earns in one hour more than the great scholar can gain in a week of laborious days and nights in a letter written by lady wilde to mr o'donoghue she begs him not to omit to mention in writing a biographical notice of her that both her sons were gold medalists a distinction she said of which they are both very proud oscar's gold medal was the berkeley medal this prize was founded by the famous bishop berkeley who denied the existence of matter and of whom lord byron wrote that when he said that there was no matter it really was no matter what he said it was possibly from a desire to be consistent with his principles that the bishop left so small a sum for the purpose of this prize that the berkeley gold medal is not materially one of much value as a distinction however it is highly prized the subject in which candidates were examined in 1874 was The Fragments of the Greek Comic Poets as Edited by Meinecke, and the prize was won by Oscar Wilde. It will illustrate to what financial straits the poor man was put even at a time when his name was in everybody's mouth that in 1883, after his successful visit to Paris, and while he was lecturing all over England, he was obliged to go to the magistrate at marlborough police court to make a statutory declaration concerning the loss of a pawn ticket which was the voucher for bishop berkeley's gold medal in the books of trinity college there is no record of the marks earned by the various competitors who entered for the berkeley prize in eighteen seventy four the mere fact that this was won by oscar wilde is registered in the records of the college with regard, however, to the scholarship which Oscar Wilde had won in the previous year, full particulars of his various markings are to be found. They are of some interest as illustrating the state of his mental capacity in the different subjects in which the candidates were examined. 
Oscar Wilde's marks in the various subjects were the following. In each case, ten was the maximum number of marks obtainable. We were woke Thucydides, eight. We were woke Tacitus, seven and a half. Greek prose composition, five. The examiner in this subject was Mr. Stack, quotes a notoriously hard marker. The best marks given were six and a half, which were obtained by Joseph King, who, however, only got the last place but one among the selected candidates. He was ninth, while Oscar Wilde was sixth. Greek translation, seven. This was the best mark given. Greek tragedians, questions on, seven. Latin comedians, questions on, seven. Latin prose translation on paper, six. Latin prose composition, three and a half. Demosthenes, five. Ancient history, seven. Greek verse, passages on paper, five. Greek verse composition, one. Here Mr. William Roberts was the examiner. He was a, quote, character as a varsity don, a very hard examiner. In this subject, most of the candidates scored no better than Oscar Wilde. Some got no marks at all. A plump duck's egg figures against their names in the Trinity record. One or two got two marks. Messrs Montgomery and L. C. Purser, who were first and second in the final classification, each got five marks. Greek we were woke, Mr. Tyrrell examiner, six. Latin we were woke, Mr. Tyrrell examiner, five and a half. Translation from Latin poets, four. English composition, six. This was the highest number of marks scored in this subject by any of the candidates. Latin and Greek grammar, four. In the final result, Oscar Wilde got the sixth place out of ten selected candidates. Joseph King, who was considered the cleverest man in the college, was placed ninth. The following is the complete list of selected candidates in their order of merit. Malcolm Montgomery, Louis-Claude Purser, Richard Hennessy, Thomas Corr, Goddard Henry Orpen, Oscar Wilde, William Ridgway, George Thomas Vanston, Joseph King, Arthur McHugh. An examination of the marks obtained by Oscar Wilde sets forth that, while still weak in the rudiments, he had made great progress in English composition. He was to make still greater progress in the event. The Trinity College scholarships, like the gold medal, lack in that materialism which the bishop denied. They carry with them no great emolument. A TCD scholar obtains rooms in the college at half the usual fees charged to students. He has no fees to pay for tuition, and he gets his dinners for nothing. But there is no income attached to the position. Quote, Oscar Wilde never held his scholarship at Trinity College, one learns, as he preferred to go to Oxford, where better things are to be won. In the following year, accordingly, he went to Oxford, won a demyship at Magdalen College of the annual value of £95, tenable for five years, and matriculated at Magdalen on 17th of October. He writes in De Profundis of his entrance into the English university as the great turning point of his life. I want to get to the point, he writes, when I shall be able to say quite simply and without affectation that the two great turning points in my life were when my father sent me to Oxford and when society sent me to prison. It is possible that when he wrote those lines, he was thinking that if he had never been sent to Oxford, the extraordinary latent madness which had brought him to the terrible place where he sat might never have been roused into fatal activity. For there is no denying it. Oxford, which is the finest school in the world for the highest culture, is also the worst training ground for the lowest forms of debauchery. It all depends on the character of the student, his early home training, his natural propensities, his physical state, 
his religious belief. Oxford produces side by side the saint, the sage, and the depraved libertine. She sends men to Parnassus, or to the public house, to Latium or the Lenicinium. The dons ignore the horrors which are going on under their very eyes. They are wrapped up in the petty concerns of the university hierarchy. They are of men the most unpractical and least worldly. While possibly their deep classical studies have so familiarised them with certain pathological manifestations that they really fail to understand the horror of much that is the common jest of the undergraduates. Oxford has rendered incalculable services to the empire, but she has also fostered and sent forth great numbers of men who have contributed to poison English society. It is very possible that if Sir William Wilde had not sent his second son to Oxford, but had left him in Ireland where certain forms of perversion are totally unknown, and where vice generally is regarded with a universal horror which contrasts most strongly with the mischievous tolerances that English society manifests towards it, Oscar Wilde would now be living in Dublin, one of the lights of Trinity College, one of the glories of Ireland, a scholar and a gentleman of universal reputation. Let any Oxford man who remembers his undergraduate days, who remembers the things that used to be jested about there, and the common talk at the wines about this man or that, ask himself when he has condemned Oscar Wilde whether Alma Mater might not have been to blame, in part if not in toto for the tremendous and terrible metamorphosis that was worked in Oscar Wilde's character. Admitting that the young man who left Trinity College with a spotless reputation really did develop in so short a time into the dangerous maniac such as he afterwards came to be considered. The man who approaches the study of this extraordinary degeneration of character admitting the common aspect of the Oscar Wilde of later years to be justified, in a scientific spirit and without bias, cannot fail to feel the gravest suspicion that Oscar Wilde was to a very large extent a victim of the Oxford educational system, of the Oxford environment. To the same dangers as those to which he succumbed, any impressionable lad is exposed, who, starting with no strong moral sense, his native virtue weakened by evil example at home, is immersed in a year-long course of study, in which, in the finest language that the world has ever voiced, men and women are glorified who in the present day would be considered monsters fit only for the stake, and wherein almost divine poetry are celebrated passions and acts, which society and the church now point to as the very abomination of desolation. In a pathetic letter which Oscar Wilde wrote to a friend of his, after his release from prison, he said, I have still difficulty in understanding why the frequentation of Sporus should be considered so much more criminal than the frequentation of Messalina. It is, moreover, a well-established pathological fact that the men in whom certain aberrations develop with the most hideous fecundity are men of great scholarship, whose moral sense has been warped by studies in which they have come to identify their environment with that of the men and women of antiquity. In scholarship, Oscar Wilde progressed with surprising rapidity. His career as a student was a most successful one. He took a first class in moderations in the honours school, Trinity Term 1876, and two year later, in Trinity Term 1878, he took a first class in the Honour Finals. Yet he was never a reading man, and was rarely to be seen at his books. End of chapter 6
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 During some part of Oscar Wilde's first term at Oxford, that is to say, during one month in Michaelmas term 1874, John Ruskin, Slade Professor of Fine Arts, was lecturing twice a week in the Oxford Museum on the Aesthetic and Mathematic Schools of Art in Florence. This was the second course of lectures delivered by Ruskin during that term, and this course was divided into eight lectures, classified under three separate titles. The first three lectures, Series A, dealt with 1. Arnolfo, 2. Cimabue, 3. Giotto. This series described the aesthetic schools of 1300. The next series of three lectures, Series B, treated of the mathematic schools of 1400, and the various lectures expounded for Brunelleschi, the architect of the Pitti Palace in Florence, five, Quercia, and six, Ghiberti. The final efforts of aesthetic art in Florence formed the subject of the two concluding lectures, Series C, and these treated of seven, Angelico, and eight, Botticelli. Oscar Wilde was a constant attendant at these lectures, and there can be no doubt that they produced a very strong impression on his mind, as indeed Ruskin's discourses did on every man who heard them. They must have opened up a new field of interest to the young Irishman, have afforded him new subjects on which to talk, and have suggested to him, by the spectacle of the great enthusiasm which Mr Ruskin aroused, the opportunism of a minor apostolate in a creed so obviously popular and successful. But there does not appear to be any grounds for saying, as has so often been said, that Oscar Wilde was greatly influenced by Mr Ruskin. It was not probable that this would be so, seeing that the whole period of Ruskin's public appearances that term did not exceed 24 days, and that in that period it is not possible for one man to influence another to the extent of tinging his whole psychology. Oscar Wilde was a man of extraordinary receptivity, but even to him it would have been impossible to absorb Ruskin's teaching and example so that these should have any permanent effect on his character in so short a period. At that time he was fresh at Oxford, a hundred things presented themselves every day to divert his attention. His mentality was in no way prepared to receive the master's teachings. And altogether it seems as absurd to state that Ruskin influenced the whole of his character and his life by means of the eight lectures which Oscar Wilde attended as a freshman during his first term at Oxford, as it was incredible that the perusal of a single book could pervert the mental composition of a man. These matters have been looked at from a scientific point of view. The plain facts have to be considered and the evidence that can be adduced. There is no trace of any Ruskin influence in Oscar Wilde's afterlife, and it would be a psychological miracle if there had been. It is true that the young man was brought into personal contact with the master, and that he was one of the ardent young men who gathered round Mr Ruskin in his practical demonstrations of the gospel of labour. In one of the notices of Oscar Wilde's early life, we find the following reference to this. Quote, the influence of Ruskin was so great that Mr. Wilde, though holding games in abomination and detesting violent exercise, might have been seen on grey November mornings breaking stones on the roadsides. Not unbribed, however, he had the honour of filling Mr. Ruskin's especial wheelbarrow, and it was the great author of Modern Painters himself who taught him how to trundle it. Unquote. Mr. E. T. Cook, in his very able monograph, Some Aspects of Mr. Ruskin's Work, which is one part of his Studies in Ruskin, gives the following account of the road digging experiment referred to above. Quote, no professor, I suppose, has had more power of personal influence over his pupils, 
or has used it more for good than mr ruskin one of the methods which he adopted for gathering a circle of ardent young men around him and impregnating them with his spirit was the subject of much sarcastic comment this was the famous road digging experiment no one was more alive to the amusing side of the affair than mr ruskin himself the road which his pupils made is he has been heard to admit about the worst in the three kingdoms and for any level places in it he gives credit to his gardener whom he incontinently summoned from brantwood nevertheless the experiment even from the point of view of road-making was by no means barren an inch of practice is worth a yard of preaching and mr ruskin's road-digging at hinksey gave a powerful stimulus to the gospel of labour of the same kind as the later and independent stimulus of count tolstoy of whom mr ruskin has spoken gratefully in recent years as his successor but the fact is that most of the oxford road diggers were attracted to the work not for its own sake but for the reward of it the reward of the subsequent breakfast party and informal talks in mr ruskin's rooms at corpus it was in mr ruskin's oxford lectures and these supplementary enforcements of their teaching that the seeds were sown or watered of that practical interest in social questions which is the oxford movement of today it would be an insult to the lofty intellect of oscar wilde immature as he then was receptive as he always was to suppose that the socialism of mr ruskin that tolstoyism d'avant de lettre which enangers and disgusts every true reformer had any influence upon him whatever and that the author of that magnificent plaidoyer the soul of man under socialism did not fully realise the grotesqueness of these bourgeois buffooneries one has the highest respect for mr ruskin but what opinion is likely to be held by any one who knows the real condition of the poor in the three kingdoms of england scotland and ireland who is invited to admire the slade professor of fine art haranguing in the following terms an audience of young bourgeois and aristocrats greasy and replete with unctuous breakfast clad in warm clothing opulent and perky Quote, i tell you that neither sound art policy nor religion can exist in england until neglecting if it must be your own pleasure gardens and pleasure chambers you resolve that the streets which are the habitation of the poor and the fields which are the playgrounds of their children shall be again restored to the rule of the spirits whosoever they are in earth and heaven that ordain and reward with constant and conscious felicity all that is decent and orderly beautiful and pure End quote. this is the kind of talk that gets social reformers into whig cabinets and raises statues to them by subscription of the middle classes it does not deceive the people for a single moment and it does not for a single moment deceive those who instinctively or by long observation understand the wants of the people and know what wrongs of theirs ought to be redressed it would not deceive oscar wilde who intuitively rather than by observation for he recoiled from any sights that might distress his aesthetic taste so fully understood the problem of the poor it is among some of his friends an abiding regret that he was not spared a few years longer so that in the depth of his despair he might have seen the wonderful triumph that germany has prepared for him might have watched the crowds flocking to the theatre to see salome played might have listened to the frantic enthusiasm which this play never fails to evoke might a little later on have realised that it had been given to him by this play to stimulate to the highest expression of his wonderful art the composer richard strauss whom the cognoscenti hail as the greatest maestro who ever lived 
among other of his friends the regret will be greater that it never came to his knowledge that all over europe amongst the poor oppressed and outcast his name is reverenced as that of an apostle of the liberties of man no writing on the social question perhaps has produced a profounder impression than his on the continent where the soul of man has been translated into every tongue amongst the very poorest and most forlorn and most desperate of the helots of europe the jews of russia and poland oscar wilde known to them only as the author of this essay is regarded in the light of a prophet a benefactor a saint in many of the awful kennels in warsaw and lublin in kiev and libau his portrait is pinned to the wall such is the interest taken in him that recently his friend the author of oscar wilde the story of an unhappy friendship received from a jewish gentleman living in the east end of london a request that he should furnish his correspondent with biographical details about oscar wilde to be prefixed in form of a preface to a new edition of the yiddish translation of the soul of man such particulars having been eagerly asked for from the jewish proletariat all over poland and russia mr ruskin left for venice at the end of michaelmas term eighteen seventy four and did not return to oxford till a year later when he delivered a series of twelve lectures on the discourses of sir joshua reynolds during the month of november during eighteen seventy six he did not lecture at all and it was not till michaelmas eighteen seventy seven that he was seen again as slade professor of fine art under the circumstances it is nonsense to assert that his influence on oscar wilde extended any further than what is indicated in walter hamilton's most interesting book the aesthetic movement in england in the chapter which treats of oscar wilde Quote, but unfortunately he writes mr ruskin left for venice at the end of mr wilde's first term not however before he had inoculated a number of the young collegians with artistic tastes mr wilde occupied some fine old wainscoted rooms over the river in that college which is thought by many to be the most beautiful in oxford these rooms he had decorated with painted ceilings and handsome dados and they were filled with treasures of art picked up at home and abroad and here he held social meetings which were attended by numbers of the men who were interested in art or music or poetry and who for the most part practised some one of these in addition to the ordinary collegiate studies End quote. it was at this time therefore that a role was forced upon the young man which he had no natural qualifications to play it was here that the curtain rose on that tragic comedy in which his fine intellect was to lend itself to grotesque performances until just before a period was put to his existence he really found himself it was from these reunions in maudlin that dated that virtuosity in music and painting and the decorative arts which he was forced to assume by the hazards of life his own necessities and the folly of his contemporaries he knew little about music and little about painting and in the matter of furniture tapestries wallpapers and architecture he was no more of a connoisseur than is any man who can assimilate the current modes and the chatter of the arbiters during a long period of his life this pose which had been forced upon him must have galled his native rectitude face to face with himself he must have felt that it was an unworthy part for a man of his great intellect and wonderful gifts to play perhaps it was from this feeling that in some respects he was playing a double-faced role that proceeded that curious self-accusing manner which all his intimates noticed in him and which filled them with astonishment it is a fact that he had no knowledge of any instrument it is probable that he could with difficulty distinguish one tune from another yet he was forced to posture as a connoisseur 
and to speak and write about musicians and music with the air of one who was profoundly versed in all the technique of the art. A friend of his relates that the rare occasion on which he saw Oscar Wilde angry with him was once when he had frequently repeated in his presence a phrase from one of Oscar's essays, a phrase which had struck him by its effectiveness, so that he had the pleasure in repeating it, that actors have in mouthing a gag which has caught the popular ear. The phrase was this, A splendid scarlet thing by Dvorak. At the third repetition of these words, Oscar Wilde flew into a veritable passion, and rebuked the friend for wishing to ridicule him. It has always been held by the man who relates this story that Oscar's anger was caused by the suspicion that his friend knew that his claim to write about Dvorak, or any other composer, was a mere pretense, and that he cleverly veiled his ignorance by the use of sonorous and effective phrases. Mr. Hamilton quotes the following passage as given by one who was acquainted with Mr. Wilde at Oxford, as descriptive of his life there. Quote, he soon began to show his taste for art and china, and before he had been at Oxford very long, his rooms were quite the show ones of the college and of the university too. He was fortunate enough to obtain the best situated rooms in the college, on what is called the kitchen staircase, having a lovely view over the River Cherwell and the beautiful Maudlin Walks and Maudlin Bridge. His rooms were three in number, and the walls were entirely panelled. The two sitting rooms were connected by an arch, where folding doors had at one time stood. His blue china was supposed by connoisseurs to be very valuable and fine, and there was plenty of it. The panelled walls were thickly hung with old engravings, chiefly engravings of the fair sex artistically clad as nature clad them. He was hospitable and on Sunday nights after common room his rooms were generally the scene of conviviality, where undergraduates of all descriptions and tastes were to be met, drinking punch or a B and S with their cigars. It was at one of these entertainments that he made his well-known remark, Oh, would that I could live up to my blue china! His chief amusement was riding, though he never used to hunt. He was generally to be met on the cricket field, but, but never played himself, and he was a regular attendant at his college barge to see the May eight or races, but he never used to trust his massive form to a boat himself. Unquote. At this time, he had not yet adopted those eccentricities of costume which a few years later attracted universal attention to his person. The portraits which exist of him as an undergraduate of Oxford represent him comfortably and soberly attired in a tweed suit, a flannel shirt with a tie unassumingly gathered into a knot under his turn-down collar. In the winter, he used to wear an ordinary grey ulster. His hair, which was brushed back from his forehead, was not too long. The best-known photograph of Oscar Wilde at this period, that is to say in 1878, is the amateurish and therefore faithful picture of him taken by a man who was then a well-known character in Oxford, whose name was Guggenheim. The man used to be known as Goog, by the undergraduates. He was a kind of Hans Breitmann, a typical stage German, with tasselled smoking cap, carpet slippers, and a long-stemmed china pipe. His studio was in the high, and he had a reputation for taking college groups in an effective manner. Oscar Wilde attempted, while an undergraduate, to render himself proficient in painting, but nothing that he ever painted has survived. There is a story that for a period during vacation he studied art in Paris, and it is remembered at Oxford that, being once asked by a maudlin celebrity, as a joke, what he would do if his means suddenly failed him, and if he were to be thrown on his own resources, he answered, I should live in a garret and paint beautiful pictures. 
however no one at oxford who knew him in those days can remember seeing him paint and a suspicion existed that he could not paint at all and that his remark was only the outcome of the deception which he had resolved to practice it is quite probable though that he may have attempted painting and being dissatisfied with his progress preferred to talk pictures instead of painting them il passa si vit à ses parler and not with reference to pictures alone not in his dress therefore at this time but in his conversation and manners rather did he assume that dangerous and delightful distinction of being different from others of which he writes in his remarkable essay on thomas griffith's wainwright parentheses pen pencil and poison in intentions yet such as it was his affectation irritated the undergraduates and on one occasion at least they manifested their displeasure with the brutality which these overfed young men sometimes display oscar was once ragged at oxford some eight healthy young philistines waylaid the blue china cove while out walking fell upon him bound him with cords and dragged him up a hill trailing him along the ground he was much hurt and bruised but he did not resist for that was useless nor did he protest with a single word when at last they released him at the top of the hill he simply flicked the dust off his coat with the air of a regency beau flipping the grains from his tabatiere off his lace jabot and looking at the prospect said yes the view from this hill is really very charming courage was not wanting to him either physical or moral indeed very few men have displayed either quality in a more remarkable degree during the period that he was out on bail between his first and second trials his moral courage surprised and impressed all those who beheld him he refused to avoid the impending danger by flight with heroism he faced the awful prospect that lay before him with regard to physical courage it is on record that while a young man in london he assisted a man a friend to escape from the police and in the furtherance of this object exerted great physical strength holding a door against a number of constables while the fugitive was clambering out of the window to safety and freedom in paris he once expressed his desire to learn the use of the rapier so that he might be able to impose silence at the point of the sword on the slanderers who were attacking his reputation the fact is that oscar wilde was really a man of action in this respect he resembles many great irishmen who have found for their energies no other outlet than that of writing this aspect of oscar's character is held by certain of his friends who had the opportunity of studying his nature at first hand in other times and under other circumstances he might have been one of the greatest men of action of the world possibly the fact that his surroundings did not permit him to give play to this desire for action but pinned him down to the writing table generated not only that indolence and indifference which characterised him but fostered also that pessimism which in the end killed him cette tristesse est ce comique d'être un homme of which octave mirbeau speaks and which make for despair are felt by none so keenly as by men who burning to do are by circumstance condemned to inactivity the men who banished napoleon to saint helena could have found in the torture house of the kings no infliction more cruel during his stay in oxford oscar wilde contributed various poems and prose writings to magazines published in dublin notably to the tcd publication cotterboss and the irish monthly his first contribution to cotterboss appeared in volume two 1877 where it may be found on page 268 it is a poem headed 
the rose of love and with a rose's thorns and begins my limbs are wasted with a flame the poem appears under another title in his first volume of collected poems on page 298 of the same volume of Cotabos is to be found a poem adapted from the Greek entitled Threnodia. Parentheses eur. dot hec. dot 444 to 483, and described as a quote, song sung by captive women of Troy on the sea beach at Aulis while the Achaeans were then storm-bound through the wrath of dishonoured Achilles, and waiting for a fair wind to bring them home. Unquote. The first strophe is as follows. O oh, fair wind blowing from the sea, who through the dark and mist dost guide the ships that on the billows ride, unto what land, ah, misery, shall I be born, across what stormy wave or to whose house a purchased slave this threnody was very judiciously omitted from his volume of poems in the same volume we find on page three hundred and twenty quote, a fragment from the agamemnon of aeschylus end quote. and on page three hundred and thirty one a poem beginning two crowned kings all these poems are signed with his full initials, O-F-O-F-W-W, which shows that he had not yet come to regard with disfavour those patronymics which proclaimed his Irish descent and aggressively asserted his nationality. The same signature is found to a poem published on page 56 of the third volume of Cotabos, 1881, entitled Wasted Days. Quote, from a picture painted by Miss V. T. This poem is significant because we find here the first indications that he was assuming a mode of writing about physical qualities, which later on was to be brought up in evidence against him. Almost the very words are here employed which were repeated in a letter, the writing of which, after it had been made public, may nearly be said to have precipitated his ruin. The poem begins, A fair slim boy, not made for this world's pain, Pale cheeks whereon no kiss has left its stain, Red underlip drawn in for fear of love, and so on. It is on page 476 of the fifth volume of the Irish Monthly, that one of the earliest published prose writings of Oscar Wilde is to be found. This was written in 1877 in Rome. It describes the tomb of Keats, that Keats who was afterwards to inspire the writer with one of the noblest sonnets in the English language. Footnote on the sale of the love letters of Keats. The short article is headed with a quotation from some guidebook. Quote, as one enters Rome from the Via Ostiensis by the Porta San Paolo, the first object that meets the eye is a marble pyramid which stands close at hand on the left. End quote. This tomb, writes the young Oxonian, had been supposed to be that of Remus. It really was that of one Caius Cestius, a Roman gentleman of small note who died about 30 BC. Yet, he continues, though we cannot care much for the dead man who lies in lonely state beneath it, and who is only known to the world through his sepulchre, still this pyramid will be ever dear to the eyes of all English-speaking people, because at evening its shadow falls on the tomb of one who walks with Spencer, and Shakespeare, and Byron, and Shelley, and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, in the great procession of the sweet singers of England. Speaking of the poet's likeness, he says in a note, I think that the best representation of the poet would be a coloured bust, like that of the young Raja of Kulapur at Florence, which is a lovely and lifelike work of art. He concludes, 
as i stood beside the mean grave of this divine boy i thought of him as of a priest of beauty slain before his time and the vision of guido's san sebastian came before my eyes as i saw him at genoa a lovely brown boy with crisp clustering hair and red lips bound by his evil enemies to a tree and though pierced with arrows raising his eyes with divine impassioned gaze towards the eternal beauty of the opening heavens and thus my thoughts shaped themselves to rhyme here follows the poem on the death of keats which here is entitled hugh miserand pure this description of oscar wilde's feelings by the grave of keats is of special interest when it is remembered that after his release from prison he assumed the name of sebastian no doubt guido's picture came before his eyes in his cell in reading jail and he felt of himself that though pierced with arrows his eyes were still fixed on the heavens which during his confinement as is very clearly shown in de profundis had indeed opened before his gaze revealing to him beauties of which he had never dreamed before to the irish monthly he contributed various poems in volume four eighteen seventy six on page five hundred and ninety four we find a poem headed the true knowledge beginning thou knowest all i seek in vain what lands to till or sow in volume five of the same publication are various pieces which afterwards appeared in the collected poems we find on page four hundred and fifteen the poem which in his volume is entitled sonnet on approaching italy and which begins i reached the alps the soul within me burned this sonnet is here entitled salve saturnia tellus on page seven hundred and fifty five we find the poem vita nuova as in his volume it is called beginning i stood by the unvintageable sea in the irish monthly this poem is entitled hontos atronitos amongst other contributions to this volume of the irish monthly is his poem lotus leaves beginning there is no peace beneath the noon it is stated that it was quote, impelled by ruskin's lectures that quote, mr wilde visited italy this is of doubtful exactness if mr ruskin's discourses had inspired him with the desire to study the painters about whom the slade professor lectured oscar wilde would have found the finest specimens of their art much nearer home he very probably went to italy for the same reason that takes many young oxonians abroad whose means are not stinted and who are fond of travelling there is amongst the writers of biographical notices often a desire to do what a french popular idiom describes as cherche midi a quatorze heures to attribute to all kinds of influences the most commonplace acts of the people of whom they treat cook and sons and the other tourists agencies take many more people to italy than ever ruskin's lectures will send there the greatest of men have often the simplest motives for their ordinary acts in the same notice we read what is much more to the point that quote, in florence he became aware of the spiritual element in art and turned wistfully towards that religion which had inspired the great italian painters during this mood he produced some fine poems notably that entitled rome unvisited which won high praise from cardinal newman but the last wave of the ebbing tide of the tractarian movement though it lifted him off his feet did not carry him away End quote. it is quite true that at this time of his life he had some desire to join the church of rome if he did not do so it was because his faith was never ardent 
in later years it abandoned him altogether he was a tolerant agnostic in de profundis he writes quote, religion does not help me the faith that others give to what is unseen i give to what one can touch and look at my gods dwell in temples made with hands when i think about religion at all i feel as if i would like to found an order for those who cannot believe the confraternity of the faithless one might call it End quote. another consideration which may have restrained him was that these reversions to rome were much too common amongst oxford undergraduates and that the suspicion lurked in the minds of worldly men that in many cases they were simply caused by a desire for personal advertisement a wish to do something different from others to épater les contemporains various motives which to a man of oscar wilde's good taste would appear eminently reprehensible towards the very end of his life he often expressed the wish that he had sought refuge in the arms of the church which the spirit of calvin does not infect he is reported to have said more than once that if he had become a roman catholic when he was a young man he would never have fallen he would certainly have suffered less at the hands of his new co-religionaries indeed it is difficult to understand why those who inspire themselves from the teaching of calvin that is to say the very large majority of englishmen and women and who should therefore accept his doctrine of the predestination of man to sin of the futility of striving against its promptings should with greater ferocity than any other sect proclaim the entire responsibility of the man who has sinned and exact from him the uttermost suffering that moral penance can inflict Newtenant, writes Calvin, que le péché originel est une corruption répandue par nos sens et affections en sorte que la droite intelligence et raison est pervertée en nous. Et sommes comme pauvres à vogue et ténèbres, et la volonté est sujette à toute mauvaise cupidité, pleine de rébellion et adonnée au mal bref que nous sommes pauvres captifs détenus sous la tyrannie du péché non pas qu'en malfaisant nous ne soyons poussés par notre volonté propre tellement que nous ne saurions rejeter à lieu la faute de tous nos vices mais pour ce qu'étant issus de la race modée d'adam nous n'avons pas un seul goût de vertu a bien fait et toutes nos facultés sont vicieuses. It was the last act of friendship of a friend whose devotion to poor Wilde is the one beautiful thing in the terrible spectacle that humanity afforded in the final tragedy of that man's life, that on the deathbed Oscar Wilde was baptised into a kindlier creed than the one expounded above. Before the breath had left his body, pardon had entered into the death chamber, and to his friends remains the supreme consolation that shrived and sung he was carried to his grave. What would have been his obsequies if his friend had not been by his side at the last? In 1877, an event took place in connection with which it may truly be said that a new influence entered his life this was his journey in greece with the party which accompanied john pentland mahaffey of this journey it has been said that it contributed to make a healthy pagan of the man who was hesitating whether to join the church of rome wilde himself declared that the lesson he learned during his travels in hellas was that it was very right for the greek gods to be in the vatican helen he declared took precedence of the martyr dolorosa the worship of sorrow gave place again to the worship of beauty it is very much to be doubted whether for these fine phrases there was any foundation whatever in fact 
whether the relative claims of paganism and of catholic christianity ever troubled the young traveller's head at all the influence to which reference is made above was much simpler and much more important it was the result that might have been expected when the impressionable lad deeply read in classical literature received visual evidence of the actual existence of the beautiful things of which he had read for the first time the true call of the parthenon would reveal itself to his ears things which had been in his mind but words 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 became tangible and living realities it was then no doubt that for the first time his true enthusiasm for beauty was aroused it could hardly be otherwise seeing in whose company he was privileged to travel and who the man was who was at his side to expound to him the marvels that greece unfolds at every step the full account of this journey in greece is given in professor mahaffey's wonderful book rambles in greece which was one of the favourite books of monsieur ernest renan those who are interested in oscar wilde should not fail to read this book carefully for though it bears no reference to his name every page of it is significant to the man who tries to form a just appreciation of his extraordinary character it allows one to assert without fear of contradiction that after his return from greece his apostolate in the cause of beauty was no longer dictated by a sense of opportunism many writers allude to the wonderful beauty of ancient times but for the most part their writings have the stamp of artificiality when oscar speaks of the beauty for instance of a tanagra statuette he knows what he's talking about in many minds the suspicion lurks that in everything on which he wrote and spoke he was apt to use words which had a fine sound and which conveyed an artistic suggestion so as to create an impression of his knowledge it has been thought that the catalogues of museums the price lists of jewellers and other artificers lay at his hand when he was writing so as to enable him to heap up dazzling piles of coruscating words which to him were words and nothing else zola practised this deception and so did victor hugo but never oscar wilde in his references to classical antiquity take the example quoted above he frequently refers in his writing as he frequently referred in his talk to tanagra statuettes those who ever proclaimed the man an impostor have been heard to say that of tanagra statuettes he knew no more than any man who has access to a dictionary or encyclopedia now during the many days that he spent in athens with professor mahaffey and his friends the museums at athens were sedulously visited and particular attention seems to have been paid to these statuettes which in 1877 had only recently been unearthed in tanagra in boeotia with what attention quote, these little figures of terracotta often delicately modelled and richly coloured both in dress and limbs unquote, were then studied appears very clearly from mahaffey's book in chapter three of the rambles in greece under the heading athens the museums we find several pages devoted to a learned and interesting description of these figurines there can be no doubt that on his return from greece there was no man in england better entitled and better qualified to talk and write about tanagra statuettes than oscar wilde and the same proof could be given of the genuine knowledge which he possessed of all the other beauties of antique times when during the visit to paris in eighteen eighty three he was heard to say that he had passed hours in the louvre in admiration before the venus of milos people shrugged their shoulders and charged him with posturing affectation anyone who reads mahaffey's book and thus gathers under what guidance oscar's eyes were opened to the admiration of greek statuary by what teaching his critical sense of this form of art was created and fostered will understand that his sincerity 
could in no way be called into account any more than his profound knowledge of the subject the man was steeped in the glories that were greece those wonderful passages in de profundis in which he writes with such facility and eloquence of the classic days were inspired by no readings from a prison lempriere they came to him as naturally as came to him those other passages which refer to the horrors commonplaces of the life which he was leading Quote, for the greek gods in spite of the white and red of their fair fleet limbs were not really what they appeared to be End quote. such are the opening words of a passage of great beauty which it can be maintained was written as simply and with no more straining for effect than for instance the passage beginning i am completely penniless and absolutely homeless it is not possible here although it would be of paramount scientific interest to inquire too closely into the question whether with this awakening of enthusiasm for the beauties of ancient greece the latent tendency towards perversion was not also developed if danger there be in a classical education to lads who have certain hereditary instincts and abnormalities of temperament certainly no more powerful means for breaking down such resistance as religious education training and example might oppose could have been found than this journey in greece that remarkable writer henri de reynier in his study of oscar wilde which appears in his volume figures et caractères directly attributes his downfall to the fact that he had so steeped himself in the life of gone by days that he did not realise the world in which he was actually living the result would be that the laws of modern society would not restrain his powerful impulses Quote, je ne insisterai pas sur les causes d'une pareille aventure writes henri de Regnier. on les connaît monsieur wilde croyait vivre en italie au temps de la renaissance ou en grèce au temps de socrate on l'a puni d'une erreur chronologique et durement et a donné qu'il vivait à londres où cet anachronisme est pareil frequent End quote. there can be little doubt that the views enunciated above will by a more enlightened posterity be accepted in palliation of the things with which his name is so cruelly associated that will be when men have attained to some scientific comprehension of mental pathology at present even the pathology of the body is only just emerging from ignorance superstition and charlatanism the delights of the tour in greece were so great how great they must have been will appear to anyone who reads mahaffey's wonderful book that oscar wilde failed to return to oxford by the date when it was required of him to do the dons of Magdalen fined him forty-five pounds for this breach of discipline the money was however returned to him when in the following year he so greatly distinguished himself by taking a first class in the honour finals and by winning the newdigate prize for english verse the poem which he sent in for this competition was a poem entitled ravenna it is considered by many of oscar wilde's admirers as a very fine piece of work and it certainly shows a tremendous advance on the work which is to be found in the magazines to which reference has been made above by a curious coincidence in which the ancients might have seen a manifestation of the dread irony of the gods a fortuitous circumstance had equipped him admirably for success in this poetical tourney a triumph resulted both he himself and his friends may have considered the circumstance a piece of rare good fortune when we review his whole career we may ask ourselves if indeed it was for his happiness that this triumph was won and that in consequence he turned with confidence to the pursuit of that career of letters which when it is pursued side by side with the quest of pleasure and excitement 
leads inevitably to physical and mental ruin. The fortuitous circumstance referred to is described in the following terms by Mr. Hamilton. Quote, During a vacation ramble in 1877, he started for Greece. Visiting Ravenna by chance on the way, he obtained material for a poem on that ancient city, and singularly enough, Ravenna was afterwards given out as the topic for the Newdigate competition, and on the 26th June, 1878, the Newdigate prize poem Ravenna by Oscar Wilde of Maudlin was recited in the Theatre, Oxford. End quote. The poem was, as is usual, published by Messrs T. Shrimpton and Sons. The original edition is very rare and high prices are obtained for copies. Many forged editions have been issued which can be distinguished from the original by the fact that on title and cover pages the university arms are generally missing. The poem has been reprinted in extenso by Mr. Mosh's collected edition of Wilde's Poems, published in Portland, Massachusetts, a very beautiful volume. The poem contains some beautiful lines, and anyone who remembers the extraordinary musical beauty of Oscar Wilde's voice will readily understand that, as is recorded in a contemporary account of the recital of Ravenna by its author, it was listened to with rapt attention and frequently applauded by the crowded audience. Here are the opening lines. O oh, lone Ravenna, many a tale is told of thy great glories in the days of old. Two thousand years have passed since thou didst see Caesar ride forth to royal victory. Mighty thy name when Rome's lean eagles flew from Britain's isles to far Euphrates blue, and of the peoples thou wast noble queen, till in thy streets the Goth and Hun were seen. So far the listening competitors may have wondered at their defeat. Immediately afterwards, however, they would be forced to admit that a true poet had revealed himself. Discrowned by man, deserted by the sea, thou sleepest, rocked in lonely misery. No longer, now upon the swelling tide, pine forest-like, thy myriad galleys ride. For where the brass-peaked ships were wont to float, the weary shepherd pipes his mournful note, and the white sheep are free to come and go, where Adria's purple waters used to flow. How many of those who were present in the Sheldonian on that June afternoon, and applauded the handsome youth as he recited in the most melodious of voices his effective lines, realised that they were listening to what was a very allegory of the startling contrasts that were to mark the poet's life. Greatness was to come to him, and, upon greatness, desolation and lonely ruin were to follow. The man, though he knew it not, was telling the story of his own splendours to come, and of the misery that was to follow upon them. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of The Life of Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 On 1st May in this year, 1878, Oscar Wilde appeared at a fancy dress ball at Headington Hill given by Mrs. Morell. He presented himself in the costume of Prince Rupert, and his fine and striking appearance was commented upon in the social chronicles of the time. For some period of his life subsequent to this event, he was to be seen figuring in masquerade. Later on, society forced him to assume another travesty, which in its essential features was not dissimilar to the one he had assumed when he went up to London in the role of a professor of aesthetics and art critic, as Foster describes him in his Alumni Oxonienses. The more one studies the lives of great men, 
the more does the certitude impress itself upon one that our human destinies are ruled by a power of which a mocking irony is the prime characteristic the ancients discovered it long ago the modern world is beginning to perceive it for some part of his life oscar wilde masqueraded in defiance of society and then later on society made him masquerade in defiance of himself an authoritative writer who however throughout oscar wilde's career was his sternest critic and censor declared at the time of his downfall that oscar wilde had been heard to explain that the reason why he assumed that costume which it pleased him to describe as the aesthetic costume was merely to attract attention to his personality he adds that oscar wilde had said that for months he had tried in vain to find a publisher for his collected poems and that having failed to do so because he was an unknown man he determined to make himself known and had hit upon the device of appearing in public in an extraordinary dress he adopted as the aesthetic costume a velvet coat knee breeches a loose shirt with a turn-down collar and a floating tie of some unusual shade fastened in a lavalier knot and he not unfrequently appeared in public carrying in his hand a lily or a sunflower which he used to contemplate with an expression of the greatest admiration let it be added to this that he wore his hair long and was clean-shaven as to his face and when it is remembered how striking a form and what memorable features were his already by nature it will be understood what attention his appearance must have attracted one might find other and more charitable explanations for this self-travesty perhaps with all the more justification that commercial instinct does not appear to have been very strong in oscar wilde he was a young man at the time he was by nature and atavism inclined to schwarmerei he may have thought that the costume suited him he may have wished to set society at defiance at the prompting of that anarchist spirit which was within him as it is within all men who are really great for the rest whatever the man's motives were that he gave effect to his plan shows that he possessed great moral courage it is by no means every man who has the strength of mind to make a laughing stock of himself in the eyes of london the london gamins are pitiless and on each of his walks abroad the young aesthete must have veritably run the gauntlet it may further be noted that many men and women of approved capacity have shown and do show this curious love of self-advertisement it has already been the malady of the great in recent years it has grown into an epidemic the advance of commercialism may account for it commercialism has made it clear that the only method by which a man can call attention to the excellence of his wares is by persistent puffery artists actors writers philosophers and politicians have equally wares to sell in this age every man who is not independent is a tradesman of sorts and one can hardly blame them if they adopt the means for selling these wares which succeed in other branches of trade the public moreover is gradually becoming so accustomed to these methods that far from regarding with suspicion the man of letters who by the eccentricity of his costume the length of his hair the frequency or the rarity of personal mentions and portraits of him which appear in the papers is the carrier of his own advertising boards the importunate distributor of personal leaflets it gives more and more its exclusive attention to the person who most loudly shouts his wares this is the case in england and america in the latin countries and in germany where art is still regarded in much the same light as religion these tricks would fail of their desired effect but in england we are a commercial nation and as dr johnson never tired of pointing out to boswell we must be dealt with by commercial methods 
There is no call in this biography to give any extended description of that aesthetic movement in England with which Oscar Wilde, for a short period of his life, and for motives which are not quite clear to us, associated himself. Anyone who is curious on the subject of one of those crazes which sent the British public once more into what Carlyle called a bottomless abyss of delirium and confusion and nameless distraction. Footnote. Carlyle once observed to my father, upon the whole, the British public, with its contagious enthusiasms, reminds me of nothing so much as the Gadarene swine. There they are quietly grubbing and grunting in search of what pignuts or other elements may present themselves for their sustenance and comfort. When suddenly the devil enters into them, up go their tails into the sky and away they go, plunging into bottomless abysses of delirium and confusion and nameless distraction. Random Reminiscences by Charles H. E. Brookfield End footnote should read Walter Hamilton's excellent and most interesting book, The Aesthetic Movement in England, to which already frequent reference has been made, and from which material yet remains to be drawn. It is the work of a man who was not unsympathetic with the movement, and who had for the leaders and camp followers of it esteem, admiration or tolerance. And side by side with Mr Hamilton's book, the volumes of Punch for the years 1880 to 1883 may be turned over. It is from the satirist that one learns most of social life, and Juvenal and St. Simon are the best historians. The aesthetes, wrote Mr. Hamilton, are they who pride themselves upon having found out what is the really beautiful in nature and art, their faculties and tastes being educated up to the point necessary for the full appreciation of such qualities, whilst those who do not see the true and the beautiful, the outsiders in fact, are termed Philistines. Even at the height of the craze, there was a very considerable proportion of the public in England who did not even know the meaning of the word aesthetic. It was usual enough to hear people express the surmise that as anaesthetic was something which sent you to sleep, an aesthetic must be something which... The movement was generally associated with sunflowers, certain peculiar shades in pottery and tissues, a languid demeanour, and a certain angularity of furniture and attitude. The penalty for this craze is still being paid by an innocent posterity in the enormities of cheap and tawdry accessories which are forced upon the ignorant public by the manufacturers under the sacred name of art, never so ruthlessly profaned. As usual, certain men who put themselves forward as active agents of the movement, of the reform, attained to popularity and wealth. Certain tradesmen, commercial or self-styled artistic, emerged from poverty and obscurity by supplying the properties of the burlesque which England was enacting. The sincere men who had initiated all this enthusiasm remained, as usual, in the background, and continue today in the same serene solitude and silence the work they then began. For his part in popularising their theories, one might almost say in burlesquing them, Oscar Wilde derived a certain and wide notoriety, leaped into the public eye, found a publisher for his poems, and, in the event, engagements to lecture in the Three Kingdoms and in America. On the other hand, he started his artistic career amidst the suspicion of his contemporaries. This suspicion still clings to his name. The public memory is tenacious. The public mind does not readily accord to one man the right to play more than one part in life. It is diffident of versatility. Universality of genius it blankly refuses to admit. The funny man can never get people to take him seriously. Sidney Smith has described this. The hands worst must be hands worst till the end of the chapter. 
there can be no doubt that Oscar Wilde's early eccentricities created an erroneous impression concerning his capacities which, for years militated, and in certain quarters still militates, against the reputation which his high genius entitled him to enjoy. Fame is not to be violated with impunity, and when the claims of the Pont d'Arcal were denied, could the peacock's feather and the sunflower prevail? The pose, such as it was, was eminently successful. If notoriety was sought after, it was gained to the fullest extent. Punch celebrates week in, week out the eccentricities of the school. On the parts played in this circumstance by both de Maurier and Bernand, Mr Hamilton's most interesting book can be consulted. There can be no doubt that all the time when Oscar Wilde was thus mumming and masquerading, the bitterness at his heart was great. Knowing what was in him, feeling the flame of the genius that burned within, conscious of the part that he might have been playing on the stage of the world, to none more than to himself can his notoriety, acquired as it was and kept alive by such means, have appeared despicable and a matter for regret. At the same time, it helped him to some extent to gain that entree into London society, which, when he left Oxford and went to the metropolis, was his immediate object. The lion hunters with which the capital abounds were not sorry to be able to produce at their tables and during their receptions the man about whom England was speaking, and of whom the comic papers made weekly sport. In this way, he certainly achieved some part of his purpose, which otherwise might altogether have failed of effect. For in a world where the first question that is asked about a newcomer is, what has he got? And the next is, who is he? The younger son of an Irish professional man, with the very smallest of incomes, was doomed by the very nature of things to utter failure of his social ambitions. In addition to this, the reputation of his brother Willie, who had preceded him to London, was already a damaging one, and there is no doubt that Oscar's subsequent animosity towards his brother was caused by his remembrance of the extent to which he had been a stumbling block in his early path, when the conquest of social London was the aim of his endeavours. But for the curiosity which attached to his name, it is certain that none of the doors through which he desired to pass would ever have opened before him. As it was, he had the moderate social success which London accords en passant to those who can divert its stagnant ennui. But he was never popular in society. He was mistrusted and misunderstood. And in the end, he was disliked. His superiority was too crushing. The men and women who gathered round him wishing to laugh had the disagreeable surprise of finding that the buffoon's bladder was weighted with lead, and that the point of his wit left an intolerable sting behind it. A letter is in existence written by a lady who belongs to the highest English nobility, and who saw him in those early days in London. She appreciated his qualities to the full, but she also was forced to admit that as far as winning the suffrages of what is known as good society in London, he failed utterly. I knew him, so runs the letter, first at a Huxley dinner, just after he left Oxford. I was then old enough to be his mother, but I thought I had never met so wonderful and brilliant a creature. Even you, she adds, addressing the person to whom this letter was written, seem hardly to know how the ordinary run of English society hated him. I was never allowed to ask him to our house. How unconscious he must have been of this hatred when he thought that society would stand by him, poor thing. That he should have represented an aristocrat to the howling crowd is most curious. One has to remember that England is a commercial country where worth, merit, character, quality, genius are estimated only by the amount of money which a man earns or possesses. 
the only poet who is allowed to show consciousness of superiority is the poet who can show from royalties earned by his books an income superior to that enjoyed by the people whom he wishes to impress with his superiority. Our novelists rank according to the amount of shillings or pounds they receive per thousand words. In England, the poor man is not allowed to show pride. Assumption of superiority, which in the man of genius is inevitable, is resented in English society when that man of genius is not able to show the actual cash value of his talents. That the younger son of a Dublin oculist, who was reported to have a bare 200 a year, derived from land in Ireland, should try to impress London society, should show superiority and act with arrogance, was such an offence against the first precepts of English society and the Church of England catechism that the hatred and indignation of his contemporaries can only be too readily believed. It requires a man more versed in psychology than is the ordinary man of the world to understand that a man of genius is proud because he is conscious of his superiority, because he cannot help but feel this superiority, and feeling it cannot help but show it. Guard himself against this as carefully as he may. When André Chenier, waiting his turn at the guillotine, struck his head against the uprights of the instrument of punishment and infamy, and cried out, And yet there were great things here, the mob roared with laughter. The mob always laughs when the man whom it has degraded yet claims any kind of preeminence. Oscar Wilde, in these early days of the attempted conquest of London, displayed a pride which impressed the onlookers as arrogance. He figured as the maitre, he assumed the office of arbiter, and he was, perhaps, too young and inexperienced to carry the burden of the part. He used to relate with some gusto certain of the retorts which he had made during this period. They display that quality which Rabelais describes as outrecuidance, which, where it does not subjugate, excites inextinguishable enmity. One of these stories also shows his readiness of repartee. One day, arriving very late at a luncheon party, his hostess mildly remonstrated with him for the delay, pointing to the clock in support of her rebuke. "'And what, madam?' he answered. "'Do you think that that little clock knows of what the great golden sun is doing?' The retort was an able one, but nonetheless would that hostess fail that as an excuse for her burned entrees and the inconvenience of her other guests? It was hardly the amende honorable which she was entitled to expect, and in her heart there would be a feeling of grudge against the wit. This anecdote enables one to institute a comparison between the readiness and powers of repartee of Oscar Wilde, and the same qualities in that rival of his, Whistler. Whistler has always been considered as far superior in this respect to Oscar Wilde, and tourneys of repartee are quoted in which invariably the younger man was defeated. Yet on a similar occasion, Whistler, arriving late for lunch and being chidden therefore, found nothing better to do or to say than to fix his eyeglass firmly in his eye to stare around the room and to cry, Ha ha! Lunch, lunch, lunch! Bunch, bunch, bunch! The hearers laughed and found the wit divine, but when the thing had crystallised it must have appeared to the hostess even a more pitiful excuse than the one which had been tendered by Oscar Wilde. During his early years in London, Oscar Wilde did not live with his mother and Willie. He occupied lodgings in unfashionable districts. For some months he lived in a couple of furnished rooms in Salisbury Street off the Strand, in the very bohemia of letters. It was not till later that he moved to Charles Street, Grosvenor Square, which was his address during the last period of his bachelor days. His income was a very small one, and the struggle to figure as a man of the world was constant. 
by mortgaging and selling his property in Ireland, by the help of friends and by anonymous literary work, he was just able to maintain himself. If hopes of wealth ever came to him, they proceeded from the fact that a rich friend, a lady, had bestowed upon him a large quantity of shares in Keeley's perpetual motion engine, a fraud in which she had invested very largely, and in which she had the greatest confidence. At one time when Oscar's name was most prominently before London as the darling of London society, his entire assets consisted of a sheaf of these worthless green papers. If his desire in assuming the masquerade of the aesthetic costume was to influence a publisher to accept the risk of printing his poems, success here, at least, awaited him. He found in David Bogue, who was at that time in business as a high-class publisher in St. Martin's Lane, a commercial man ready to produce his book in the best style. In the Athenaeum for 2nd July 1881, the book was announced in the following terms. Now ready. Crown, eight volumes, price ten shillings, six pence. Poems by Oscar Wilde. Printed on Dutch handmade paper and handsomely bound in parchment. This advertisement to anyone who knows the difficulties that the young aspiring poet has in finding a publisher for his works is a plain certificate of success. The price at which the volume was offered the paper on which it was printed, and the parchment in which it was bound are all so many tributes to the skill with which the young man had impressed his personality on business London. It is not in this livery, this court dress rather, that the Cinderella muse goes to the palace of fame, unless, indeed, a fairy godmother has intervened. The irony of things shows itself once more on this page of the Athenaeum. As one glances down the list of David Bogue's announcements, one notices among the other new books which he was issuing at the same time as Oscar Wilde's poems the following works. Music and Morals by Howace, Conscious Matter by W. Stuart Duncan, and, here one can almost perceive the sardonic laughter of the immortals, how to Make the Best of Life by J. Mortimer Granville. This volume of poems consisted mainly of reprints of verses which Oscar Wilde had contributed to various periodicals, Cotterboss, the Dublin University Magazine, the Irish Monthly and certain London periodicals and journals. After leaving Oxford, he had published poems in different weekly and monthly papers. Edmund Yates, who had a great esteem for him, and was always his literary and social protector, had opened to him the pages of Time and the columns of The World. Much of his most effective verse had appeared in The World. Of these poems, which have now been reprinted and are open to the judgment, nothing need be said in criticism in this place beyond the fact that they appealed very strongly to the public of the day and that four editions were readily sold in a few weeks. Many found great delight in them. The great and beautiful Ellen Terry, to whom the young poet dedicated two of the sonnets in this book, was charmed by his tributes, and what better success could a poet desire than having hymned Ellen Terry to win a smile of approval from her lips? Of the two sonnets, to Portia and to Queen Henrietta Maria, which appeared in this book, the one which gave most pleasure to the wonderful and great-hearted artist to whom they were addressed was the latter. This is it. Queen Henrietta Maria. In the lone tent waiting for victory, she stands with eyes marred by the mists of pain. Like some wan lily overdrenched with rain, the clamorous clang of arms, the ensanguined day, War's ruin and the rack of chivalry to her proud soul no common fear can bring. Bravely she tarrieth for her lord the king, her soul aflame with passionate ecstasy. O hair of gold, O crimson lips, O face made for the luring and the love of man, 
with thee i do forget the toil and stress the loveless road that knows no resting place time's straitened pulse the soul's dread weariness my freedom and my life republican this sonnet then achieved what many sonnets of far greater beauty have failed to achieve it appealed to the lady to whom it was inscribed it is still remembered as a tribute by one upon whom tributes have been rained down like the dew of heaven for the rest this supreme artist like many other of the greatest women of the day has always had admiration for the poet and pity for the man in the spring of 1905, while England was still wondering whether it would be right and seemly to pronounce the name of the man who, although he had written De Profundis, had yet ten years previously been convicted of conduct for which he had paid the utmost penalty of the law, and the further penalty of some years of lingering agony and a miserable death, at that time, then, Miss Terry had the courage, speaking publicly at Frascati's at a meeting of the Gallery First Nighters Club, to include the name of Oscar Wilde amongst the list of men whom she used to see at the Lyceum in her old triumphant days. Quote, in the gallery and pit at the dear old Lyceum, she said, there used to be seen faces of many men who had won or were about to win distinction in the world. The Byrne Joneses, the Justin McCarthys, Alfred Gilbert, the great sculptor, the late Oscar Wilde, the poet O'Shaughnessy. End quote. The reference was a courageous one. The act was worthy of the woman. Its quotation here serves another purpose. It enables us to gather that in the days when Oscar Wilde was writing his verse, he was not a prosperous man. The young man whose circumstances force him to go to the pit or the gallery of the theatre a la mode will find difficulty in storming the fortresses of the British aristocracy. For the limitless ambition of his, of which he used to speak as a young man, aimed at the very highest social success. The upper middle class from which he sprung filled him with disdain. He used to speak with contempt of Bayswater as the stronghold of all that was common and vulgar and to be avoided. A Bayswater view of things. He could find nothing more scathing than that. When in the end he found that the higher aristocracy while willing enough to be amused by him, did not readily yield to his advances, he came to speak with some contempt of the old nobility. They are nothing but exaggerated farmers, he used to say. Amongst the modern souchets he had some acquaintances, and perhaps because of their greater affability, these found no more valorous defender than Oscar Wilde. It was an imprudent thing for anyone to venture to joke on the nobility of the big brewers, for he happened to have some friends among men who had risen to the ranks of the aristocracy by the ladder of heaped-up barrels of beer. It is a fact that social success always impressed Oscar Wilde. The man who made money and got on in life enjoyed his regard. For the failure he had nothing but abhorrence. Intimate friends of his have wondered to hear him speaking with praise of very common fellows who by reason of a little commercial cunning had reached to reputation and prosperity. In this regard he was essentially a worldly man, and, so considered, one wonders whether the anarchist doctrines to which he later yielded did not result from his vexation at the small amount of real social success to which he attained as a young man. In only a very few good houses in London was he taken seriously, or invited as an honoured guest. Literary history affords few more distressing pictures than these early years of Oscar Wilde, where we see a man of supreme superiority wasting his time and humiliating himself in running after the worthless favours of men and women so entirely his inferiors. In the artistic world, however, his success was incontestable. He enjoyed from an early age the friendship and approval of many men of high distinction. He was the associate of Whistler. He sat at the feet of George Meredith. 
he was the companion of the pre-raphaelites and he proclaimed a sympathy for swinburne which the elder poet did not reciprocate in later life he did not often refer to these days and when he did so it was to talk of the arcana of london rather than of its heights he had anecdotes to tell of an extraordinary man named howell who seems to have exploited the naive pre-raphaelites in a pitiless and constant manner and who had had many amusing passages of arms with whistler for the cleverness of this man oscar wilde seemed to have some admiration he used to quote as a witty saying of howells a retort that he once made when a group of artists anxious to get rid of him had offered to pay his passage out to australia who said howell would go to australia if he had the money to go with he found that it was a very clever invention on the part of howell being asked one day by whistler whether he had ever happened to ride in cab number one in london to have answered no but a few days ago i drove home in cab number two he seems to have watched with poignant interest the career of that unfortunate artist solomons who as fate would have it survived oscar wilde by some years and died under circumstances not more tragic than those which attended the death of the man who used to express such pity for his terrible life that even at the time when patience had been running for some months and bogue was announcing his poems at the price of half a guinea he had not imposed himself on true london society is made clear by a note which edmund yates his friend inserted in the world as a preliminary announcement of these poems it appeared in the number for sixth july eighteen eighty one and runs as follows Quote, people who hearing of oscar wilde ask who he is and what he has done will now be able to learn and a volume of mr wilde's collected poems will shortly be published End quote. that edmund yates had a sincere admiration for oscar wilde will be all the more readily understood when it is recorded that many of wilde's poems which appeared in the world had brought to the editor from different parts of the world letters of high commendation from the readers of that journal one incident especially appealed to yeats it came to his knowledge that a copy of the world containing wilde's poem our way imperatrix had been received by a mess of british officers in one of the regiments which followed lord roberts on his march to kandahar and that these men had been struck with the truth and beauty of the picture which the poet had drawn of the very spot where they were encamped sarah bernhardt's admiration for and friendship with the young poet would also impress that most parisian of londoners edmund yates sarah always had a high regard for oscar wilde she used to say that she had been charmed with the courtesy of his manner and with his kindness of heart most men who are civil to actresses and render them services she used to say have an arrière pensée it was not so with oscar wilde he was a devoted attendant and did much to make things pleasant and easy for me in london but he never appeared to pay court in other words sarah had discovered amongst the young men of london one who was an english gentleman in every sense of that much misused term and this may be put on record here once and for all oscar wilde was the beau ideal of an english gentleman that is to say the sane oscar wilde what he may have been when his epileptiform fits took him it is for the outcasts to say who saw him on these rare and mournful occasions oscar wilde's volume of poems received with enthusiasm by the public found little favour with the critics the book was roundly abused the saturday review which in those days had still some importance as an arbiter in literature contemptuously disposed of the book in a few sentences at the end of an article on recent poetry this review appears in the number for twenty third july eighteen eighty one it begins quote, mr wilde's verses belong to a class which is the special terror of the reviewers the poetry which is neither good nor bad which calls for neither praise nor ridicule and in which we search in vain for any personal touch of thought or music 
end quote. Lower down, quote, the great fault of all such writing as this is the want of literary sincerity which it displays. For instance, Mr. Wilde brings into his verse the names of innumerable birds and flowers, because he likes the sound of their names, not because he has made any observation of their habits. He thinks that the meadow sweet and the wood anemone bloom at the same time, that that shy and isolated flower, the harebell, breaks across the woodlands in masses, like a sudden flush of sea, and that owls are commonly met with in mid-ocean. End quote. Strong exception is next taken to the sensual tone of the poems, and the review concludes with the following, quote, This book is not without traces of cleverness, but it is marred everywhere by imitation, insincerity, and bad taste. End quote. This reviewer was no doubt sincere, for we find in his comments the repetition of much that, so far, we have heard raised up in blame against the young poet. We have heard him spoken of as an average sort of man. We know that his educational weakness was a neglect of the rudiments. In this case, he is blamed for a lack of the botanical and zoological rudiments, and we have already seen him charged with imitation of others. Moreover, he is here once more rebuked for that imprudent manner of his of talking about the physical beauties of man and woman, which, later on, was to render him such signal disservice. It was a habit gained from his classical training and his enthusiasm for the literature of the ancients, but it was a literary habit which in modern days was fraught with considerable danger. The Athenaeum gave him the place of honour in its number for 23rd July 1881. The long review of his poems accompanied its first page. The review is a very careful one, well written, as are all the reviews in that periodical which stands first amidst the critical papers of the world. It was evidently the work of a man who was not biased either for or against the young poet, and who had very conscientiously prepared himself for his task as the critic of the book. The review was an unfavourable one. It begins, quote, Mr. Wilde's volume of poems may be regarded as the evangel of a new creed. From other gospels it differs in coming after, instead of before, the cult it seeks to establish. We fail to see, however continues the reviewer after an exposition of oscar wilde's teachings that the apostle of the new worship has any distinct message lower down quote, turning to the execution of the poems there is something to admire mr wilde has a keen perception of some aspects of natural beauty single lines might be extracted which convey striking and accurate pictures the worst faults are artificiality and insincerity, and an extravagant accentuation of whatever in modern verse most closely approaches the estilo culto of the 16th century. End quote. An able and scientific, if not very charitable, requisitoire bearing out the charges in this indictment follows. The charge of imitation is particularly insisted upon. Quote, the sonnet on the massacres of the Christians in Bulgaria reflects Milton's sonnet on the massacres in Piedmont. The Garden of Eros recalls at times Mr. Swinburne, at times Alexander Smith. In the descriptions of flowers which occur in the poem last named, there is a direct and reiterated imitation of Shakespeare. Some violets lie that will not look the gold sun in the face for fear of too much splendour. Reminds one of the pale primroses that die unmarried ere they can behold bright Phoebus in his strength. Mr. Wilde's budding marjoram which but to kiss would sweeten Cytherea's lips, and his meadow sweet whiter than Juno's throat, bring back the Violets dim, but sweeter than the lids of Juno's eyes or Cytherea's breath. And the rustling bluebells, rustling bluebells is a vile phrase, 
that come almost before the blackbird finds a mate and overstay the swallow are but the daffodils that come before the swallow dares traces of this kind of imitation abound and there is scarcely a poet of high mark in the present century whose influence is not perceptible End quote. the conclusion is not an inspiring one quote, work of this nature has no element of endurance and mr wilde's poems in spite of some grace and beauty as we have said will when their temporary notoriety is exhausted find a place on the shelves of those only who hunt after the curious in literature they may perhaps serve as an illustration in some chapter on the revival in the nineteenth century of the gongorism of the sixteenth against the charge of imitation wilde's warmest friends will not be able were they desirous of so doing to defend him he was essentially an artist and the artist is essentially imitative art is imitation the only original creation which is not the reproduction of anything else of which we know is the creation of the world and on that circumstance the data are too vague for us to be quite certain that here too imitation did not overhang the labour models were certainly not lacking or the astronomers have misled us there has never been a writer yet against whom charges of plagiarism have not been brought of those charges moliere briefly and wittingly exonerated himself moliere was in the right the artist is entitled to appropriate for his own treatment the thoughts the conceptions of others it is not the highest form of literary art but it gives pleasure and it is a tribute to the man from whom the borrowing took place it seems that it would be as unfair to say that a prima donna who sings us the jewel song out of faust ought not to be listened to because we have heard other prima donna sing that song before she came on the stage it is one of the most detestable axioms of commercial philistinism that the exclusive right in a thought or a comparison belongs to the man who first voiced them in the republic of letters and amongst true artists no such proprietary instinct prevails it is the true artist's greatest joy to feel that he has given forth fecundating atoms which shall breed beauty in ages to come most of the reviews were equally unfavourable in some private enmity was allowed to show itself the notice which appeared in punch may be humorous it is certainly not marked with courtesy as a specimen of the kind of criticism of himself which oscar wilde had provoked some extracts from this notice may be quoted it commences thus quote, mr lambert strike in the colonel published a book of poems for the benefit of his followers and his own mr oscar wilde has followed his example End quote. As Mr. Hamilton points out, the character of Lambert Strike in Burnham's adaptation, The Colonel, is that of a paltry swindler, who, shamming aesthetic tastes, imposes upon a number of rather silly ladies, and is finally exposed by the Colonel. The review continues. Quote, the cover is consummate, the paper is distinctly precious. The binding is beautiful, and the type is utterly too. Poems by Oscar Wilde, that is the title of the book of the aesthetic singer, which comes to us arrayed in white vellum and gold. There is a certain amount of originality about the binding, but that is more than can be said for the inside of the volume. Mr Wilde may be aesthetic, but he is not original. This is a volume of echoes. It is Swinburne and Water, while here and there we notice that the author has been reminiscent of Mr. Rossetti and Mrs. Browning. End quote. The poems were commercially a great success, and this success pleased Oscar Wilde very much. He used to speak with pride of the fact that his volume of poems had run into four editions in as many weeks. For the rest, as his powers developed, he came to look upon this early work in the light of a 
Peche de Jeunesse. Certainly the author of Keats' Love Letters, and other of his later poems, could not help but be critical towards the verse contained in this volume. Yet, such as it is, it has outlived the various periods of notoriety which brought their author's name so prominently before the world. Recently republished in America by Mr. Mosher of Portland, a large and constant demand for the book continues. Already at the time of its original publication, the American edition met with great success. In a paragraph in The World for 9th November 1881, we read, quote, Mr. Oscar Wilde has arranged to leave England next month for America, where he will deliver lectures on art subjects. Mr. Wilde's volume of poems, which has had a very large sale in America, will have prepared the way for him and no doubt ensured him a brilliant reception in that country. I hear that Mr. Wilde is also making arrangements for bringing out an original play before he leaves London. End quote. The play here referred to is Vera, a nihilist drama. It was not produced until much later in America, where it met with instant failure. The great objection to the play was the fact that it contains only one female role, that of Vera, the nihilist heroine. This drama has been printed and can be obtained in London with various annotations. It was not as amiably represented by Edmund Yates as the author of a successful volume of poems that Oscar Wilde received encouragement to go to America to lecture. It was suggested to him that a good deal of curiosity existed in that country in the aesthetic movement and school, that his personality aroused interest, and that a profitable lecturing campaign might be carried out there. At the same time, he was anxious to produce Vera, which he had not been able to place upon the stage in London. He had no arrangement with any impresario when he left England. Major Pond afterwards undertook to run him in the States, that is to say, after his appearance at the Chickering Hall and his success there. He sailed on board the Arizona on Saturday 24th December 1881, his original intention being to deliver one lecture on the recent growth of art in England, and he proposed to be absent for three or four months. A few days before his departure, there appeared in the world, under the heading of The Lights of London, a sketch of him by H.B., described as Ego up to Snuffybus Poeta with certain humorous verses attached, of which the following may be quoted. Quote, Albeit nurtured in democracy, and liking best that state bohemian, where each man borrows sixpence and no man has aught but paper collars, yet I see exactly where to take a liberty. Better to be thought one whom most abuse for speech of donkey and for look of goose, than that the world should pass in silence by. Wherefore I wear a sunflower in my coat, cover my shoulders with my flowing hair, tie verdant satin round my open throat. Culture and love I cry, and ladies smile, and seedy critics overflow with bile, while with my prince long sykes meal I share. This parody meant to be friendly, but there can be no doubt that it aroused bitter feelings of self-reproach in Oscar Wilde's mind. Of self-reproach? but also of indignant revolt against the order of things which in these modern days condemns a man of action to inactivity, who, if he would emerge from the stagnant obscurity to which the world condemns him, must play the part of pantaloon. Vital, full of genius, and of that physical energy which is the genius of the body, fitted for any part that the world has ever yet bestowed upon a man, he found himself at twenty-seven years of age crossing the Atlantic in masquerade, to amuse, to be laughed at, and, in his bitter humiliation, to appear to take pleasure in the part. In the whole of his mournful career, few periods could have been more full of suffering. We reach here the heights of tragedy to which Shakespeare attains in King Lear. Higher heights, for the king was here a youth. We are to remember, too, that the man was a man of genius, and that being so, he could not help but show it. End of chapter 8 
Chapter Nine of The Life of Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Nine. The next thing that London heard about Oscar Wilde was that on arriving in New York he had declared himself disappointed with the Atlantic. This remark of his was seized upon by his critics as a further proof of the man's intolerable conceit and arrogance. As a matter of fact, it was the very simple expression of the feeling with which most people who cross the Atlantic for the first time look back on the passage when that voyage has been performed during fine weather. One expects a tumultuous sea, a succession of awe-inspiring spectacles, great heights and abysmal depths of surging waters. And when the sea is calm, well, it's calm. The man could not say the simplest thing without exciting malevolent criticism. Before he landed, Oscar Wilde was, as is usual in America with visitors of distinction, quote, interviewed by various reporters who had come out to meet the Arizona. The report which appeared in the New York Herald gives, as he himself declared, the best account of what he said, and may therefore be reproduced here. Quote, men may come and men may go, but it is not every day that an apostle, Thwaite, of aestheticism comes to the shore of America. It was for this reason that the Herald reporter met Mr. Oscar Wilde at the first available place, namely, quarantine. Mr. Wilde was not at all adverse to the American process of interviewing, and began by informing the reporter that he had come to the United States to lecture on the Renaissance, which he defined as the revival of the intimate study of the correlation of all the arts. I shall lecture said Mr. Wilde, a little reservedly, in Chickering Hall on the Renaissance. My future movements will depend entirely upon the results of my lecture in a business sense. I have come here with the intention of producing upon the American stage a play which I have written, and which I have not, for reasons, been able to produce in London. It is exceedingly desirable that it should be produced with a cast of actors who shall be thoroughly able to represent the piece with all the force of its original conception. But, said the reporter, do you not intend to produce a volume of poems while you're in America? No, I shall not, certainly for some time to come, publish another volume, but I hardly care to say what the future may develop. You will certainly lecture, however said the reporter. I certainly shall, but I do not know if I shall lecture in other cities besides New York. It will depend entirely upon what encouragement I find in the acceptance of my school of philosophy. Do you then call aestheticism a philosophy? asked the reporter. Most certainly it's a philosophy. It is the study of what may be found in art. It is the pursuit of the secret of life. Whatever there is in all art that represents the eternal truth is an expression of the great underlying truth. So far, aestheticism may be held to be the study of truth in art. Aestheticism, said the reporter, has been understood in America to be a blind groping after something which is entirely intangible. Can you, the exponent of aestheticism, give an interpretation which shall serve to give a more respectable standing to the word. I do not know, said Mr. Wilde, that I can give a much better definition than I have already given. But whatever there has been in poetry since the time of Keats, whatever there has been in art that has served to devolve the underlying principles of truth, Whatever there has been in science that has served to show to the individual the meaning of truth as expressed to humanity, that has been an exponent of aestheticism. Unquote. And so the two augurs parted and without a smile. Of Oscar Wilde's personal appearance at the time of his landing in New York, 
it may be recorded that when the late sir henry irving arrived in america on his first visit to the states it was generally said that he much reminded people of wilde in frederick daly's monograph henry irving we find the following passage in the chapter describing the reception given to the great actor on his landing in new york Quote, but the only unkind thing said of mr irving on his arrival was that he resembled mr oscar wilde the figure was muscular as the aesthetes was and the face was long and a trifle like his but there was far more strength in it and it was more refined and manly thus there was a dash of bitterness in mr irving's first american cup though the writer who commended the chalice to his lips was not without a desire to sweeten the draught Unquote. at the time of sir henry's first visit to america oscar wilde had not yet shown himself he was still masquerading and mumming and if there is one person in the world for whom the hard-working and conscientious actor the sincere artist has a dislike it is the man who acts as an amateur by grimace and posture on the stage of life oscar wilde's worst enemies were amongst the actors and the spirit that prompted this resentment was not always the natural and excusable feeling that vexed henry irving when he the conscientious artist found himself compared to a man as to whom he did not then understand on what he based his claims to rank as an artist the same feeling was shown by cocaine the younger who is of modern actors one of the most hard-working and in the story of an unhappy friendship we find in this connection the following reference Quote, i had invited him to lunch with me at payards to meet cocaine cadet cocaine cadet was not greatly impressed by my friend and i imagine that as a general rule oscar wilde did not have much success with actors these may have thought his affectation harmless as it was an infringement on their own rights a trespass on their domain Unquote. when catastrophe came upon him there were two actors who most zealously worked to complete his downfall but in both cases there was personal animosity it is difficult to trace any resemblance between oscar wilde in eighteen eighty one and henry irving some years later yet on one occasion one who knew both men did notice the most striking and extraordinary likeness this man was attending one night the performance of the lion's mail in the beautiful prince of wales theatre in birmingham in the scene where le cirque having been denounced by the witnesses from the inn makes his pathetic appeal to one of the women to speak the word which admitting her mistake shall absolve him from the horrible charge which has been brought against him and the witness turns mournfully but resolutely away le cirque's face assumed a look of agony and horror as the vista of what lay before him opened out a look in which the blood rushed to the face and made it turgid and voluptuous. there was at the same time a distending of the eyeballs which seemed about to leap from their sockets a twisting and contortion of the mouth roughly kneaded into a mass of agony by torturing hands while the face lengthened as though by two crushing and simultaneous blows on each cheek it had been flattened downwards the look of unspeakable anguish and dismay was cast sideways at the woman in whose silence le cirque read his ruin shame and death the spectator to whom reference has been made fell back in his chair from excessive emotion at the sight of a piece of acting so consummate at that moment irving presented the exact facial picture of oscar wilde as looking sideways at the foreman of the jury from his place in the dock in the old bailey he listened to the verdict that meant to him ruin shame and death the lecture at chickering hall was a great success we read in the new york world the following account of oscar wilde's debut before the american public Quote, it is seldom that chickering hall has contained so fine an audience as that which gathered there last evening monday ninth of january eighteen eighty two to see mr oscar wilde and to listen to his exposition of those peculiar views which have distinguished him from everyday folk in england 
and mr wilde was well worth seeing his short breeches and silk stockings showing to even better advantage upon the stage than in the gilded drawing-rooms where the young apostle has hitherto been seen in new york no sunflower nor yet a lily dangled from the buttonhole of his coat indeed there is room for reasonable doubt as to whether his coat had even one buttonhole to be put to such artistic use but judging his coat by the laws of the philistines it was a well-fitting coat and looked as though it had been made for the wearer as a real coat and not as a mere piece of decorative drapery promptly at eight o'clock the young lecturer came upon the stage and with the briefest possible introduction from colonel morse mr wilde began his lecture Unquote. in the new york review the nation appeared at the end of that week a long article analysing the lecture and giving the impressions of the audience. It was written by a representative man who admits at the very outset of his remarks that Oscar Wilde's lecture was a success. Yet his conclusion was that, quote, Mr Wilde was essentially a foreign product and can hardly succeed in this country, what he has to say is not new and his extravagance is not extravagant enough to amuse the average american audience his knee breeches and long hair are good as far as they go but bunthorne has really spoiled the public for wilde Unquote. he was not taken seriously by many an intimate friend of his relates that the only reference which he ever heard oscar wilde make to the coarse things of life was in connection with this lecture as soon as it was over he said a number of fashionable young men who had been present and who met me at the club to which i went that night wished to take me out to the night houses of new york of course they said after lecturing on art and culture you'll want to go and see the girls Unquote. From a commercial point of view, the lecture was a decided success, and at once a proposal was made to Oscar Wilde by that enterprising lecture agent, the late Major Pond, who offered to run him for a series of lectures through the States. It has been generally understood that this series of lectures was very successful, that Oscar Wilde's progress through the States was a triumphant one, and that the venture resulted in great financial benefit to himself and his impresario. Major Pond, however, himself stated, during his last visit to England and at a time when he had visited Hall Kane at Greba Castle to endeavour to persuade the novelist to undertake a lecture tour under his management, that Oscar Wilde's lectures had not been successful, and that he had abandoned the tour before the entire list of towns arranged for had been visited. This statement was made, however, at a time when everybody who had anything to say in detriment to Oscar Wilde was only too ready to give utterance to it. At the same time, the Major was speaking to two men whom he knew to be friends of Wilde, which allows it to be supposed that he was speaking the truth and another thing is that major pond had been speaking very freely about the different men whom he had run and the financial results which had been obtained the first town that oscar wilde visited after leaving new york was boston where from the very nature of the place and the bent of its inhabitants he might have been assured of a large and attentive audience the audience was indeed large but it was not a representative one. It was mainly composed of the curious, who had been attracted by the announcement that a number of Harvard students, dressed up in a burlesque of the aesthetic costume, intended to be present and most probably would guy the lecturer. A large audience congregated to see the fun, but the prominent Bostonians stayed away. The masqueraders waited until Oscar Wilde had stepped upon the platform, and then trooped in in single file, each assuming a demeanour more absurd than that of the man who followed him. There were sixty youths in the procession, and all were dressed in swallowtail coats, knee breeches, flowing wigs, and green ties. They all wore large lilies in their buttonholes, and each man carried a huge sunflower as he limped along. 
sixty front seats had been reserved for the Harvard contingent, and it was amidst shouts of laughter that they filed into their places. The effect that they had wished to produce was, however, spoiled, to some extent, by the fact that Oscar Wilde had for that occasion discarded his peculiar costume and appeared in ordinary evening dress, so that those of the audience to whom his usual appearance was not familiar entirely missed the point that the Harvard students wished to make. The young men behaved with little decorum. Though they did not guy the lecturer, whose counter-manoeuvre had somewhat abashed them, they took the opportunity of such pauses as occurred during the lecture when Oscar Wilde paused to drink water to applaud in a most vigorous and derisive manner. Oscar Wilde, however, triumphed in the end, as an English gentleman always will triumph in a contest with boars. On the following day there appeared in that excellent paper, the Boston Evening Transcript, 2nd of February 1881, the following account of the lecture, which shows with what tact and success the young foreigner turned the tables on the men who had tried to discomfort him. Quote, Boston is certainly indebted to Oscar Wilde for one thing, the thoroughgoing chastening of the superabounding spirits of the Harvard freshmen. It will be some time, we think, before a Boston assemblage is again invaded by a body of college youths, masters such, to take possession of the meeting. This is not unimportant, for if the thing should grow into a practice and succeed, anything in the way of public entertainments here must finally be done with the leave only of the youngest and most ill-bred class of Harvard students. Whether in his first off-hand observation, or in the pointed remarks scattered through his address, or in the story he told of the Oxford boys and Mr. Ruskin, nothing could have been more gracious, more dignified, more gentle and sweet, and yet more crushing than the lecturer's whole demeanour to them, and its influence upon the great audience was very striking. A goodly number of the latter, it seemed to us, had gone there to see the fun in hopes of a jolly row, but the tide of feeling was so completely turned by Mr. Wilde's courteous and kindly dignity that even this portion of the audience took sides with him and hissed down every attempt on the part of the rougher element to disconcert or interrupt the speaker by exaggerated and ill-timed applause. Mr. Wilde achieved a real triumph, and it was by right of conquest, by force of being a gentleman in the truest sense of the word. His nobility not only obliged him, it obliged his would-be mockers to good behaviour. He crowned his triumph, and he heaped coals of fire upon those curly and wiggy heads, when he, with simplicity and evident sincerity, made them an offer of a statue of a Greek athlete to stand in their gymnasium, and said he should esteem it an honour if they would accept it. This really seemed to stun the boys, for they even forgot to recognise the offer with applause. It was a lovely, though sad, sight to see those dear silly youths go out of the music hall in slow procession, hanging their heads meekly and trying to avoid observation, followed by faint expressions of favour from their friends, but also with some hisses. A lady near us said, how mortified I should be if a son of mine were among them. We think that everyone who witnessed the scene on Tuesday evening must feel about it very much as we do, and that those who came to scoff, if they did not exactly remain to pray, at least left the music hall with feelings of cordial liking, and perhaps, to their own surprise, of respect for Oscar Wilde. Unquote. Courteous and kindly dignity, that was perhaps the trait in Oscar Wilde's character which won him such enthusiastic friendships, and so fervent a following of admirers. The conduct of these Harvard lads was remembered at the time when it was the popular thing to heap abuse on Oscar Wilde, and in 1895 many of the baser American prints retold the story, but gave the bow roll to the lads who had been so sorely discomfited. 
some rochester students who had imitated the pranks of harvard also came in for commendation when to have flouted oscar wilde at any time in his career was supposed to entitle a man to social recognition and gratitude but rochester did not in fact come off any better in the encounter between brains and manners with stupidity and boorishness than harvard had done by his lecture and especially by his demeanour in the course of its delivery, Oscar Wilde won many friends in Boston, and that city of learning having set the seal of its high approval both on the lecturer and the lecture, the respectful attention of cultured Americans throughout the States was, at least, ensured to him. Some of the Boston ladies expressed the highest enthusiasm for the handsome young poet, Oscar Wilde's behaviour towards them only increased the respect with which he had come to be regarded. "'Oh, Mr. Wilde,' said to him at a reception by a young lady, "'you have been adored in New York, but in Boston you will be worshipped.' "'I do not wish to be worshipped,' said Oscar. A circumstance which made for such success as he enjoyed during his lecture tour was the support given by the Irish Americans to the son of Speranza. Certain remarks in his lectures in which England and English society were scathingly criticised appeal strongly to this section of his audiences. To disagree with three-fourths of all England on all points is one of the first elements of sanity, is one of these remarks. But for the Americans, in general, there was such praise in some of his sayings as may have satisfied the almost morbid national self-conscientiousness of that country. It is rather to you, he said in the course of his lecture on the English Renaissance, that we turn to perfect what we have begun. There is something Hellenic in your air and world. You are young. No hungry generations tread you down and the past does not mock you with the ruins of a beauty, the secret of whose creation you have lost. Love art for its own sake, and then all things that you need will be added to you. The Americans called this taffy, but they liked it. From Boston he went to Omaha, where he lectured on decorative art. In the course of the lecture, he described American furniture as not honestly made and out of character. This remark may not have pleased his audience, but it was a plain expression of the truth, and that he made it shows that he had an observant eye, and even in the matter of household furniture could tell bad workmanship from good. Only last year there was published in London a book by J. Morgan Richards, one of the keenest American businessmen living, who, speaking about the various kinds of goods which American commerce had unsuccessfully tried to introduce into England, specially refers to American furniture, which he describes in almost the very words which the young Eastheat used in his lecture in Omaha. When in an obituary notice of Oscar Wilde, that wonderful writer Ernest La Jeunesse said of him, Il savait tout, he knew everything, he advanced a proposition which Oscar Wilde's admirers could support with numerous arguments and illustrations. Wherever he went in the States, says Mr. Walter Hamilton, he created a sensation and it was gravely asserted that he had been induced to cross the Atlantic in order to work up an interest in patience, the satire of that opera not having been sufficiently understood in the States, except by reading people. Such an idea had probably never entered his head. He is scarcely the man to condescend to become an advertising medium for a play which professes to ridicule nearly everything he holds sacred in art or poetry, but his visit did certainly have a most beneficial effect upon the success of the piece, which, beyond a certain point, had created little interest amongst middle-class Americans, whose ideas of culture are only awakened by an occasional visit to Europe. Mr Hamilton, in his commendable enthusiasm for Oscar Wilde, is here rather too severe, both on the middle-class Americans and on Gilbert and Sullivan's operetta. 
the middle-class americans are certainly not lacking in culture in this respect indeed they show themselves superior to the middle classes of europe and as to patience the main idea of that amusing and inspiriting piece is one which men have appreciated ever since stage plays first existed it is a theme which has been handled by most dramatists it is moliere's tartuffe created in gilbert's kindly and humane manner it would appeal to anyone who had never heard of oscar wilde or of the aesthetic movement this slight opera bouffe parodies in advance the great movement that is still going on in france the struggle between the intellectuals and the military party it is very much more than an amusette though as such thanks to sullivan's delightful music it takes the highest place amongst pieces of its kind louisville was another city which he visited and where he lectured on decorative art some offence was taken here at his description of american houses as illy designed decorated shabbily and in bad taste but on the whole the reception was a favourable one and the local papers were filled with flattering articles about the lecturer his experiences were varied in some cities he had a fine welcome and a large audience in other places he was received with indifference or even ridicule and the takings at the door of the lecture hall were not sufficient to cover major pond's expenses at denver he lectured to a very rough audience and he used to relate that the week previously a man had been shot in the public room in which he lectured there while he had turned his back on the crowd for the purpose of examining a chromolithograph which shows oscar wilde used to add that people should never look at chromolithographs Quote, from the states he went to canada visiting quebec montreal ottawa kingston and toronto in the latter city he was present at a lacrosse match between the torontos and the saint regis indians which he pronounced a charming game quite ahead of cricket in some respects his lecture in the grand opera house toronto was attended by one thousand one hundred persons and wherever he went his movements and lectures created great interest unquote. charming was at that time his favourite word to express his approval later on he adopted the word amazing to describe anything very good the opposite feeling was expressed by the word tedious which he retained till the end of his life he proceeded from canada to nova scotia lecturing at halifax on 8th of october 1882 and on the following day the subjects of his lectures were the decorative arts and the house beautiful the following account of his personal appearance was given by a writer in the halifax morning herald who prefaces his article by referring to the winning and polite friendliness with which he was received by oscar wilde Quote, the apostle had no lily nor yet a sunflower he wore a velvet jacket which seemed to be a good jacket he had an ordinary necktie and wore a linen collar about number eighteen on a neck half a dozen sizes smaller his legs were in trousers and his boots were apparently the product of new york art judging by their pointed toes his hair is the colour of straw slightly leonine and when not looked after goes climbing all over his features mr wilde was communicative and genial he said he found canada pleasant but in answer to a question as to whether european or american women were the more beautiful he dexterously evaded his querist that i cannot answer here i shall wait till i get in mid-ocean out of sight of both countries your women are pretty especially in the south but the prettiness is in colour and freshness and bloom and most of your ladies will not be pretty in ten years i believe you discovered mrs langtree a look of rapture came to oscar's face and with a gesture the first of the interview he said 
i would rather have discovered mrs langtry than have discovered america her beauty is in outline perfectly moulded she will be a beauty at eighty-five yes it was for such ladies that troy was destroyed and well might troy be destroyed for such a woman Unquote. he on that occasion expressed his opinion that poe was the greatest american poet and of walt whitman he said that if not a poet he was the man who sounds a strong note perhaps neither prose nor poetry but something of his own that is grand original and unique Unquote. it would seem from the account of the morning herald reporter that oscar wilde during his canadian tour had been dyeing his hair for never at any time could its natural colour have been described as the colour of straw it was of a peculiarly rich brown a very beautiful colour and it was opulent and abundant during his lecture tours oscar wilde always carried a make-up box with him as he was playing a part he seemed to feel that he might enlist all the advantages that actors assume the reference to the absence of gestures on his part is interesting this struck other people who met oscar wilde in the states elsewhere than on the lecture platform some people malevolently spoke of it as affected languor one very prominent american statesman used to describe a visit he paid to oscar in his hotel in boston where he found him lying on a sofa smoking cigarettes and he said that he had been most unfavourably impressed by seeing a young man in such a state of slackness this gentleman who was a person of very great importance in the states seems to have expected to find oscar wilde hustling round his room it did not occur to him nor to the other people who blamed oscar for affected languidness that the exertion of lecturing to large audiences night after night in addition to the filling of innumerable social engagements might make it necessary for the young man to rest himself whenever opportunity to do so offered itself poor oscar wilde the simplest things he did were turned into reproaches against him for every act of his an evil motive was uncharitably devised one would fancy that he committed an unpardonable offence in ever coming into the world at all he was accused of posturing on his very deathbed what ferocity does great preeminence not arouse in the envious heart of man some time after his visit to halifax oscar wilde visited walt whitman the meeting was not any more successful than was the meeting between him and paul verlaine oscar wilde was distressed by the poverty of walt whitman's appearance his shabby attire and especially by the untidiness and squalor of the one room in which the american poet lived the place was littered with great heaps of newspapers for walt whitman collected everything that was printed about him and these papers were strewn all over the room and over them was so thick a coat of dust that it was impossible for any visitor to find a clean spot where to sit down walt whitman primeval natural aboriginal would feel little sympathy for the dandified helene one may think of a meeting between alcibiades and diogenes to understand the lack of sympathy that must have reigned during this memorable interview oscar wilde's great kindness of heart frequently manifested itself during this lecture tour while in philadelphia he made great efforts to find a publisher for an american edition of the poems of a friend of his a young oxford man who since has come to very high honours and whose verse was certainly of a very high order but at that time the young poet was unknown and the american publishers fought shy of the expense of publishing the volume at last one firm agreed to produce the poems provided that oscar wilde wrote a preface to the verse he at once agreed to do so and the preface which he wrote is one of the finest pieces of prose that he had written up till then the book was printed in lamentable style 
the notions of the publishers as to what constituted the aesthetic decoration of a volume were curious in the extreme and the english poet friend felt himself aggrieved by oscar wilde after receiving the book from america he wrote a letter to oscar putting a period to their friendship candidly stating that his political ambitions would be balked by its continuance and particularly chiding him for having allowed his poems to be produced in a style which could only cover their author with ridicule oscar wilde's comment on this letter was characteristic what he says was his only remark is like a poor little linnet's cry by the side of the road along which my immeasurable ambition is sweeping forward the poor man was not to know to what a goal of glory he was to reach per varios casus per tot discrimina rerum the frantic applause of the dresden opera house fell short of the lonely grave in banyeur cemetery on his arrival in chicago where he lectured afterwards to very large audiences he received a letter at his hotel from a young irish sculptor who told him of the misery in which he was living of the anguish that he an artist who felt himself capable of great things suffered to be slighted and ignored in such a city as chicago and begged him to come to the garret which was his studio and look at his work and give him the encouragement of his praise if praise he could find to give directly after receiving this letter oscar wilde set out for the address given by the writer and after a hazardous excursion into the slums of chicago found john donoghue's abode he stayed with him for a long time he praised his work he comforted him he told him the great consolation of l'art pour l'art and he did not leave him without commissioning him to do a piece of work the next evening john donoghue sitting amongst the audience in the crowded lecture hall suddenly heard oscar wilde in the course of his lecture reproach the fashionable and distinguished men and women who were listening with rapt attention to his words with the fact that a young sculptor of undoubted genius who was living in their midst was being allowed by them in their ignorance and indifference to art to die of hunger and that starvation which more rapidly kills the artist the contemptuous neglect of the public he went on to describe his visit to john donoghue's studio he spoke of the beautiful things that he had seen there of the beautiful things that this young man could do of the honour which he could bring to the city of chicago if only people would encourage his endeavours the consequence was that next day john donoghue was everywhere discussed in chicago people flocked to his studio commissions poured in and after a very short while one of those munificent patrons of art who exist in america alone as though mycenas had transmigrated to the states after the fall of the roman empire came forward with an offer to maintain the young man during a course of study in the atelier of france and italy john donoghue's artistic career was assured he came to europe he studied he prospered but he was not a great man nor was he a great artist in oscar wilde's adversity he had not a word of comfort to send him but the circumstances of his own death seem to show that in his last days he reproaches himself for his ingratitude mr walter hamilton describes a curious incident which occurred towards the end of oscar wilde's tour in nova scotia Quote, after leaving halifax oscar wilde went to lecture in several smaller towns in nova scotia amongst others to monkton where his experiences were of a somewhat unpleasant description owing to a misunderstanding he had with a so-called young men's christian association it arose thus two committee men had been negotiating to secure him the y m c a committee telegraphed to mr wilde's agent offering seventy five dollars for a lecture on friday night mr hustard answered that the terms were satisfactory for thursday night and requested a reply this was about four p m at about eight p m four hours later the y m c a replied that thursday night was satisfactory mr wilde then replied in effect 
waited till seven then had to close with other parties sorry another committee of townspeople had in the meantime closed with mr wilde then the y m c a obtained a writ which was served on mr wilde the y m c a laid damages at two hundred dollars mr hustard offered to give them twenty dollars and pay costs this was not accepted finally mr Esty and mr weldon gave their bonds for five hundred dollars for mr wilde's appearance the action of the y m c a is generally condemned in the colony both by the very pious who lift up their eyes and hands in pious horror at one who attempts to raise the love of art and beauty into a kind of religious worship and by the ungodly who see that the YMCA merely sought to fill its coffers out of the attraction of the arch-prophet, irrespective of his teachings, and failing that, feed their revenge by attempts to levy blackmail. Unquote. The incident is worth recording, because it shows that Oscar Wilde's financial position towards the end of his lecturing tour was such that he was not unwilling to accept the sum of fifteen pounds for travelling to a small town like Moncton and lecturing there, and that he had no objection to appearing under the auspices of a young men's Christian association. It also shows that by this time Major Pond had determined his arrangement, for the name of Mr Wilde's agent appears to have been Husted. Yet he did not return to New York without a substantial sum of money, and his mode of life there previous to his departure for Europe was such that it attracted the attention of the New York Flashmen. Oscar Wilde fell into the hands of the Bunko Steerers. He was actually involved in playing a game of poker with some affable gentleman whose acquaintance he had made in a casual manner. They had introduced themselves to him as having attended his lecture in Boston with great edification to themselves. The result of the friendly game was what might have been expected. Oscar Wilde was cleared out of all the cash he had in his pocket, and when he left the table he had to give a cheque for a large amount on a New York bank to settle what he owed as losses. However, not long after he'd left the house where he'd been fleeced, it occurred to him that he had simply been swindled, and promptly drove to the bank and stopped the cheque. The men, it appeared, were notorious bunco steerers. During his visit to America, his irony did not spare the Americans, and he gave utterance to a few remarks which would not make for his popularity amongst the people against whom they were aimed. Some of these sayings he afterwards used in his plays, he was, perhaps, proudest of having defined American dry goods as the productions of the American novelists. The American novelists, lui en ut garde un deni. On a subsequent occasion, he found everybody in the States reading Robert Ellesmere, and during a luncheon party in Dublin after his return from the States, he described how in the trains every passenger seemed to have a cheap edition of this book in his or her hands. As each page is finished, it is torn out and flung through the window, he said, so that in the end, the American prairie will get a top dressing of Robert Ellesmere. One disappointment had awaited Oscar Wilde in America. He was unable to find a manager who was prepared to produce Vera so that in his original purpose in going to America, he was not successful. Vera was produced about a year later in New York at a trial evening, but badly mounted, badly played, it met with so unfavourable a reception that it was instantly withdrawn. It was not a good play in the sense of a stage piece, but it certainly merited to be spoken of with more respect than in the following paragraph in Punch, in which Wilde's disappointment at the Adelphi was recorded. In its number for 10th December 1881, the following Impression du Théâtre appeared. Quote, the production of Mr. Oscar Wilde's play Vera is deferred. Naturally, no one would expect a Vera to be at all certain. It must be, like a pretendedly infallible forecast, so very weather-cocky. Vera is about nihilism. This looks as if there was nothing in it. 
but why did mr o wilde select the adelphi for his first appearance as a dramatic author in which career we wish him cordially all the success he may deserve why did he not select the savoy surely where there's a donkey cart we should say doily cart there ought to be an opportunity for an oscar in answer to numerous inquiries we beg to state that as far as we know the wilds of scotland are no relation to the wilds of ireland ed Unquote. although he did not succeed in placing his drama and though the lecture tour was not as fruitful as he may have been led to expect after his triumphant reception both in new york and in boston this year's travelling in america was productive of the greatest good in the development of his character brought into daily and hourly contact with the most energetic of men his latent energy aroused itself he returned to Europe sharpened and stimulated to a degree that made him almost irrecognisable. America had taken all the nonsense out of him, if so trivial a phrase may be used in this connection. The dealings he had had with men, the struggles both social and commercial in which he had in the main triumphed, had given him experience which years of life in London might never have afforded. His eyes had, moreover, been opened to the exact value, as an asset to a man who wishes to reach to influence and power, of the affectations which he had till then assumed. He had had, so to speak, a sound commercial training during those twelve months in America. The conclusion to which he came in the end was that it would be to his interest to discard the unworthy posturings which till then had disfigured him, he dropped his masquerade overboard into the Atlantic and never again assumed it. And here masquerade applies as much to the affectation of manner and speech as to the actual disguise he had been wearing. End of chapter 9《ハッピーナイト》ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッピーナイト。ハッ He repudiated all responsibility for the Oscar Wilde of the aesthetic movement. That was the Oscar Wilde of the second period, he used to say. I am now in my third period. On returning from America after a very short stay in London, he proceeded immediately to Paris. Here he definitely abandoned his peculiar costume. For a short time still he wore his hair long, but he had not been very many days in Paris before he discovered that an affectation of bohemianism was a pose which the men of letters in France who counted had long since abandoned. Merger's heroes were entirely out of date. A transformation imposed itself, and one day he went to the coiffeur, from whose hands he emerged with the appearance of a gentleman in the mode of the day. He used to explain that it had been on contemplating the bust of Nero in the Louvre that he had decided that hair must not be worn long, and he used to speak of the style in which he then wore it as my Neronian coiffeur. Very shortly after his arrival in Paris, Mr. Theodore Child, the correspondent of the world, recorded the event in his journal in the following terms. Quote, Amongst other illustrious visitors to Paris, besides the Gladstone family, we have had, and still have, Oscar Wilde. Mr. Wilde is, of course, utterly unknown to the French, and does not probably intend to take any measures to make himself known. Last week he was entertained at dinner by some English and American artists and journalists, and at dessert he made a very clever little speech on his American experience. Generally speaking, Mr. Wilde told us, 
while in america he had to converse on art with people who derived their notions of painting from chromolithographs and their notions of sculpture from the figures in the front of the tobacconists shops in colorado however and the rocky mountains mr wilde was agreeably surprised by the aesthetic predispositions of the natives and at leadville in particular he found some of his own theories on art police fully accepted when i arrived in leadville mr wilde said in the evening i went to the casino there i found the miners and pianist sitting at a piano over which was this notice please do not shoot at the pianist he is doing his best i was struck with this recognition of the fact that bad art merits the penalty of death and i felt that in this remote city where the aesthetic applications of the revolver were already admitted in the case of music my apostolic task would be much simplified as indeed it was End quote. oscar wilde had very tactfully come to the conclusion that as there was a great deal of what was ridiculous in the pretensions of the oscar wilde of the second period it would be the wisest thing to do to laugh with his mockers and he certainly seemed to take huge delight in bringing out the funny aspects of what he called his apostolic task he was full of anecdotes about his american tour and it is a great pity that he never gave execution to the plan he had formed on leaving america of writing a volume of his american impressions it would have been full of humour and from the nature of the man the humour would have been kindly he was bitter only against affectation and pretentiousness the simple and kindly americans would have been spared the lash of his satire the story about the pianist in leadville was a favourite one of his and he developed it as he repeated it on the fifth of may of that year he was dining with edmund de goncourt who in his diary thus records what oscar wilde told him quote, dined with the poet oscar wilde this poet who tells the most improbable stories gave us an amusing picture of a town in texas with its population of convicts its revolver habits its pleasure resorts where one reads on a notice please do not shoot at the pianist who is doing his best he tells us of the hall at the casino where as it is the biggest room in the place is used for the assize court and here they hang criminals on the stage after the performance he told us that he had seen there a man who had been hanged clinging to the scenery uprights while the audience fired their revolvers at him from their seats in those places it would also appear the theatrical managers look out for real criminals to play the parts of criminals and when macbeth is to be staged and a person is wanted for the role of lady macbeth offers are made to a woman who has been convicted for poisoning and who has just been released after serving her sentence one sees posters thus worded the part will be taken by mrs x and in brackets the words ten years penal servitude End quote. it may be noted that monsieur de goncourt did not faithfully record in his diary the things that he heard he allowed his fine imagination to play when he sat down to his journal de goncourt his entries have little historical value he used to touch up an anecdote he used to add to a statement of fact he was always preoccupied as to the effect that the passage would produce on the reader this great artist would have made the ideal city editor on a new york journal in his diary for eighteen ninety five he records a conversation which he had with a gentleman who told him of Wilde's arrest at midnight at his mother's house in Oakley Street, after his release on bail, in a manner in which malevolence seems to have guided his pen. The gist of this page is that everybody was drunk in the house in Oakley Street, and for this statement his informant's narrative had not given the shadow of a suggestion theodore child was in error when he wrote that oscar wilde did not probably intend to take any measures to make himself known in paris he did take active measures he brought with him from london a number of copies of his volume of poems 
and soon after he had settled down in his rooms in the hotel voltaire on the quai voltaire he sent his book accompanied by a letter to a number of leading men in paris both writers and painters at the time of his trial in many drawing-rooms this volume and the letter which had accompanied it were laid out on view as curiosities d'actualité and people were able to convince themselves of the extraordinary knowledge of French which these well-written letters displayed. His advances were favourably received, as such advances always are in humane and enlightened Paris, and many doors were opened to him. He was frequently in the exclusive society which numbered Edmund de Goncourt amongst its ornaments. He frequented the leading painters of the Impressionist school, and he was welcomed at the house of Sarah Bernhardt, where he met many of the most distinguished people in Paris. He was generally liked and admired, but he would certainly have produced a better impression in literary Paris if he had not deemed it necessary to amaze the Parisians by telling them stories and making statements to them, which, with all their badauderie, they could not accept as truthful fact. For instance, at an evening party on 21st of April, Oscar Wilde, speaking to Monsieur de Goncourt in the presence of a large number of highly cultured people, was heard to remark that the only Englishman who till then had read Balzac was Swinburne. Such a statement as that would appear to the people who overheard the remark nothing more than what the French call un blague, and Oscar Wilde would create the impression of being un blagueur. Now, no worse impression can be created in literary Paris than this. The Parisians have a certain reverence for the things of literature and art. They desire these things to be treated with the respect that is accorded to religion by others, and to be paradoxical and outré about them is to forfeit the attention of those whose good opinion it is worth while to cultivate. It is to be feared that Oscar Wilde was never really understood in Paris. A man who does not take himself seriously in Paris as a writer or an artist will never induce people to take him seriously. A large number of Parisians listening to Wilde's brilliant talk and failing to perceive the humour which overhung his remarks simply set him down as a charlatan who was trying to deceive them and resented the attempt. It is only since his death since the publication of Jean-Joseph Renaud's masterly translation of Intentions and the writings which have appeared on De Profundis, that the Parisian men of letters are beginning to see that they totally misunderstood the brilliant young man who'd made such efforts to interest and amuse them. At the same time, it's not difficult to imagine what effect must have been produced on an audience of artists in Paris when Oscar Wilde told them a thing which he was at that time very fond of repeating, that he used to spend hours at the Louvre in rapt admiration before the Venus of Milos. Alphonse Daudet, who met him in those days in Paris, both at his own house and at Soirées, notably at the house of the famous painter of Parisian landscapes, Dinitis, conceived from hearing him talk in this manner a distrust of him, which he was never able to cast off. Now, Daudet was very quick at noting the salient traits in a man's character, and it shows that Oscar Wilde must have dissembled his real nature with the greatest skill, the most unfortunate ability, for he was just of that exquisite artistic mould which would have delighted Alphonse Daudet, while his kindness of heart and great refinement would have won for him the warm friendship of the impressionable southerner. Daudet was deceived by Oscar Wilde's outward manner, which shows that he must have exerted great powers to dissimulate the superiority of his nature, just as others who came into contact with Daudet by a similar exertion of profound hypocrisy were able to deceive him as to their worthlessness. At Victor Hugo's house, Oscar Wilde enjoyed one evening no little success, although the master himself did not interrupt his usual nap to listen to his visitor. But it was just after Swinburne's visit to Hugo's house, and the habitués of Hugo's salon were most interested to hear Wilde speak of the English poet. There was a lady there, a Polish princess, who had translated some of Swinburne's poems into French, 
who was so pleased with Oscar Wilde's eloquent championship of the poet, against whom a certain hostility reigned in that milieu, that she became the speaking trumpet of the young Irishman's fame in the many good houses in Paris which she visited. Although Oscar Wilde had laid aside his aesthetic masquerade, there were certain points about his dress which did not please the Parisians. For one thing, he used to wear fur coats. Of these he had two or three. One was a very noticeable one, being made of green cloth with black brandeburgs. Now, in those days, gentlemen did not wear fur coats in Paris. It was also his habit to have his hair curled every day. There was too much get-up about his appearance to please the Paris men of the world. As a matter of fact, though Paris did not perceive it, Oscar Wilde was paying to French literature the compliment of modelling himself on the great writer Balzac. He was then in a period of imitation of this great writer for whom his admiration increased with each year of his life. When at work in the Hôtel Voltaire, he used to put on a white gown with a monkish cowl, because it was in a dressing gown like this that Balzac, who wrote mostly at nights, used to work. At the time when Balzac, who had doomed himself for years to celibacy and continence, at last went courting, the recluse assumed all the graces of the contemporary Parisian dandy. He wore the most elegant costumes, he adorned himself with jewellery, and he carried when he went abroad a walking stick, which was so noticeable that it inspired Delphine Gay with the subject of a novel, La Can de Monsieur de Balzac. In all these points Oscar Wilde imitated the master with whose industry and enthusiasm for literary art he was endeavouring to imbue himself. He dressed much after the fashion of the fops of 1848. He wore noticeable jewellery, and he carried a stick which was the replica of Balzac's can. This was a stick of ivory with the pummel set with turquoises. The costume was the outward sign of a very laudable effort. It can be to nothing but the credit of any writer to wish to imitate Balzac, and if by adopting his peculiarities a man might hope to attain to any degree of his powers of production and style, one would like to see the whole republic of letters, curled as to the hair, bejeweled, clad in 1848 costumes, and carrying ivory sticks with turquoise stone pummels. But Paris did not understand the suggestion of Oscar Wilde's dress, and did not believe that a man who seemed to talk so flippantly had any real artistic strivings in him. Oscar forgot that not any more in Paris than in London, in London than in Berlin, are men prone to a charitable interpretation of any act of fellow man. He was labelled a poseur when he was only trying by dressing apart to enter into the very spirit of the man whom he wished to imitate in his excellent qualities. Many of the greatest actors which the stage has ever produced would have failed utterly to represent the parts in which they most triumphed had they not been allowed to dress the parts. Paris might have understood this, but preferred to disbelieve that any such strivings animated the young man. Yet at that very time he was actually inspiring himself from Balzac's example, and at no period in his life, except perhaps when he was writing De Profundis, did he more sternly discipline himself to that constant labour which, as Balzac said, is the law of art. During these months at the Hôtel Voltaire, he wrote that great play, The Duchess of Padua, which some of his admirers rank with the Elizabethan masterpieces. This play was originally written for Mary Anderson, and while Oscar was yet in Paris, the manuscript was sent to her for her perusal. She declined it, greatly to the author's secret discomfiture. Mary Anderson probably saw that it was not likely to succeed as a play for the stage. The opinion proved itself in the event to be a right one. The Duchess has been tried twice in two different languages and has failed each time. The first performance was given in New York in the early 90s. It gained a great success d'estime, but it never came to be considered a paying piece. Only last year, negotiations were being made between a beautiful young American actress, 
who was anxious to mount the play and take the part of the Duchess, and a lady who owns the American acting rights. The negotiations fell through on other grounds but those of terms, and when it is recorded that the only fee demanded by the holder of the copyright for the right of performance was five pounds a week, it will be understood at what a low figure the financial possibilities of the play were estimated in the American theatrical world. But the play for all that had warm admirers. Indeed, it was at the suggestion of her mother that the young American actress referred to above had desired to mount the Duchess of Padua. In a letter to one of Oscar Wilde's friends, this lady wrote, quote, Many years ago I saw a performance in New York of Oscar Wilde's play, The Duchess of Padua, with Lawrence Barrett and Mina Gale in the leading roles. The play made a decided impression upon me, and I have often wondered why it has not been revived. End quote. This play has not been published in England, but an excellent German translation by Dr. Max Meyerfield of Berlin appeared more than a year ago. This version was produced in December 1904 at one of the leading theatres in Hamburg. It was not a success, and after three nights was withdrawn. It cannot be said that justice was done to it, nor that it had a fair trial. The translation is excellent. Dr. Meyerfeld has rendered Oscar Wilde's verse in German verse of quite equal merit, nor has he in any way sacrificed the original to the necessities of translation. The German play is, in itself, a fine piece of literature. The acting was, however, deplorable. The man who played the part of Guido was suffering from influenza, and for this reason made a burlesque of the last act. In this act, the great scene is where the Duchess finding Guido asleep in his prison addresses him in impassioned language. The Duchess's fine tirade was at the Hamburg theatre constantly interrupted by the snuffling, sneezing and coughing of the sleeping hero. The Duchess was herself by no means word perfect, but the climax of misfortune was reached on the night of the third performance when the actor who played the part of the Cardinal suddenly went mad on the stage and had to be removed, viet armis, to a lunatic asylum. The official receiver in Oscar Wilde's bankruptcy then intervened, questioning the right of the poet's literary executors to give Dr. Meyerfeld the right to produce the play in Germany. And under the circumstances, the doctor thought it advisable to withdraw it from the stage. Footnote. The Duchess of Padua was revived early this year in Berlin. It was killed by the critics, and its ill-fated performance resulted in a heavy financial loss to the devoted Meyerfeld. End footnote. His version was enthusiastically reviewed in the Daily Chronicle by William Archer, who saluted Oscar Wilde as having revealed himself in this play a dramatic poet of very high rank. It was this play which Oscar Wilde was writing at the time when the Paris men of letters were regarding him with suspicion as a literary charlatan. As an artist and as an intellect, there were not more than three men in the Paris literary world of that day who were the equals of this literary charlatan. Some of his finest verse was also written at this time, notably The Sphinx, over which he laboured with the application of Flaubert but perhaps with better results. This piece has been published several times. The original edition was issued in a beautiful form in September 1894 by Messrs Elkin Matthews and John Lane. It is a masterpiece of the poetry which is not spontaneous. The inspiration came from Poe through Baudelaire. Both these poets were at that time exercising upon Oscar Wilde as strong an influence as in another way was Balzac. In The Harlot's House, a poem which he wrote at the same time, Oscar Wilde was more himself. As to the publication of this poem, we find in the excellent bibliography which is appended to the translation of André Gide's monograph on Wilde the following note. Quote, the original publication of The Harlot's House has not yet been traced. The approximate date is known by a parody on the poem called The Public House, which appeared in the Sporting Times of 13th June 1885. 
in 1904 a privately printed edition on folio paper with five illustrations by Althea Giles was issued by the Maturin Press, London. In 1905 another edition was privately printed in London, eight pages, wrappers, end quote. It was a short lyrical poem. The poet is standing in the street outside the house of the Scarlet Woman and looks up at the windows of which the blinds are drawn down. It is night, and on the blinds appear the silhouettes of the dancing figures, the marionettes within. In this poem, Oscar Wilde overcame his objection to the use of words ending in et, for which he professed a real artistic horror. The last lines of the poem, in which he speaks of the dawn fleeing down the street like a frightened girl, are very beautiful. Perhaps the tone of the whole thing, like that of the Sphinx, is not robust. But, as we have said, Oscar Wilde was then impregnated with the essence of Baudelaire's fleur de mal. To those who came to know him intimately in those days in Paris, he appeared one of the most gifted, as also one of the best of men. He was then in the height of his intellectual powers. The fiend of his insanity never betrayed its presence by the faintest indication. His refinement and chastity of speech and life seems to show how well he had schooled himself in the example of the great artist whom he had set up above him as his master. He was the most delightful companion that a man could meet. More than personal magnetism emanated from his joyous personality. Men used to wonder what this quality was in him that seemed to stimulate in those who came near him every desirable faculty. Today, when the scientists speak of radioactivity, men might wonder whether in human beings also this principle did not exist, so that such men as possess this quality can as readily affect those who approach them as substances which are brought into the proximity of radium are affected. A distinguished man was heard to wonder whether there be not sexes of the intellect. Quote, Most men would then appear to have female intellects, the very rare, the geniuses, having male intellects. From the contact of the two, great thoughts spring off. I know, he added, that my brain never seems to live nor to be so fertile as it does when I am in the company of Oscar Wilde. End quote. His geniality was another trait that endeared him to all who saw him in private life. His joyousness of life was as exhilarating as a draught of generous wine. He seemed a happy man. His happiness made others feel the folly of despondency and pessimism. His gratitude to his maker for his creation was revealed in the intense delight he took in every little thing that is good and pleasant in the world. As to his morality... We read in the story of an unhappy friendship, quote, The example of his purity of life in such a city as Paris, of his absolute decency of language, of his conversation, in which never an improper suggestion intruded, the elegance and refinement which endowed him, would have compelled even the most perverse and dissolute to some restraint. The companionship of Oscar Wilde, in the days in which I lived in his intimacy, would have made a gentleman, at least outwardly, of a man of bad morals and unclean tongue. End quote. He used to live in great luxury, dining every evening, when he had money, at the most fashionable Parisian restaurants. He preferred bignons in the Avenue de l'Opera, but he sometimes went to the Café de Paris, which was quite as expensive, or when he felt inclined for the Latin Quarter, to Foyos or to La Venue's. At this last place he used to meet John Sargent, the painter, and Paul Bourget. And in the album at that café, John Sargent one day sketched his portrait with that of Bourget and another friend. With Bourget he had some relationship, and the two used frequently to meet at the Café d'Orsay, which has long since disappeared. Although Bourget has never written anything about Wilde, it was obvious in those days that he was impressed by the man's genius. His constant deference and the things which he said about him were proof of that. He was not always prosperous. The funds which he had brought with him from America, not a large amount, had been exhausted. His work produced nothing, and his expenses were heavy. 
his resources during that period in paris were derived from the final disposal of his property in ireland there was a small estate called the red island which at that time was being melted into gold there were times when he was very pressed for money when the fashionable restaurants had to be abandoned during these periods he used to take his meals in his hotel and it was at his hotel that with no splendour he was forced to entertain the poet Rollinat, for whose book, La Maine de Tropman, he professed a great admiration. The macabre was then greatly preoccupying his mind, but that it never corrupted his bounding optimism his whole subsequent career establishes. Mary Anderson's refusal of the Duchess of Padua was a great disappointment to him. He had hoped from the proceeds of that play to be able to continue his luxurious life of literary activity in Paris. But as there was nothing to be looked for from this source, and as the lawyers in Ireland declared it impossible to squeeze any more gold out of the barren acres of the Red Island, the Paris days had to be brought to an end. He returned to England in the summer of 1883 under the necessity of finding a means of gaining his livelihood. An important journal then published an article concerning his position, achievements and prospects, the tone of which is best explained by the title under which it appeared, Exit Oscar. Edmund Yates rebutted this article in the next number of the world, and said that in any case Oscar's exit was a very brilliant one after the great artistic and social successes which he had enjoyed in Paris. The fact was, however, that his position at that time was a very difficult one. Yet with great courage and a never-failing dignity, he faced the situation and, in the event, came through it triumphantly. An American firm of lecture agents, which had a branch in London, approached him immediately on his return to London and, having no option in the matter, he came to terms with them. It was under their auspices that he lectured one afternoon in the Prince's Hall, Piccadilly, before a moderate audience. He was at that time living in two small rooms at the top of a house in Charles Street, Grosvenor Square. To outward appearance he was very prosperous, and must have continued to stir the gall of the envious. He smoked Parasho cigarettes, and was sometimes to be seen dying in the grill room of the Café Royal with Whistler. But the meal was ever a frugal one, and the wine which accompanied the modest grill was always a claret chosen from the very top of the list. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Life of Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11 Immediately after the lecture in the Prince's Hall, Oscar Wilde commenced to visit various provincial towns in different parts of the kingdom to give his address on The House Beautiful, under a contract with a firm of lecture agents. The labour was not distasteful to him, and the fees earned in this way were at that time his sole resource. He was so poor in the autumn of 1883 that he was frequently obliged to have recourse to the pawnbrokers, and just before his first lecture in London, a friend accompanied him to Marlborough Street Police Court to swear to the loss of a pawn ticket before the magistrate. The same friend remembers a day, at about the same time, when he was entirely devoid of funds, and for once at least could have written himself down in Prancis as he retired to bed. Under no other circumstances would he have brought himself to associate his name with the enterprise of those provincial lectures. So clear was it made to him that its success was expected not from the value and the interest of the address, but from the notoriety attaching to his name as the eccentric aesthete. The great majority of the people who came to his lectures paid the entrance fee with no other purpose than to stare at the man who was reported to have a strange passion for sunflowers and lilies. 
everybody had heard of the aesthetic movement very few even knew the meaning of the adjective it was to imbeciles of this calibre that this scholar was forced by his necessity to discourse his lectures were not successful in any degree nor can the speculation have been a very profitable one to the agents who had engaged upon it people were vastly disappointed to find that his appearance dress and manners were no different from those of any gentleman the advertisements of these lectures which appeared in some provincial town were calculated to arouse the highest expectations of the morbidly curious a show was promised the subject matter of the lecture was not referred to on certain newspaper files in different parts of the country one may still read display advertisements running down whole columns after some such fashion of vulgarity as this he is coming he is coming he is coming who is coming who is coming who is coming oscar wilde oscar wilde oscar wilde the great aesthete the great aesthete the great aesthete it was in this way that it was brought to the public notice that a gentleman of rare scholarship and great erudition designed to address a meeting on a subject on which at least from a careful study of its masters and extensive reading and observation he was adequately qualified to speak one day in charles street one of his friends picked up a provincial newspaper which was lying on his table oscar wilde whose manners were always gentle and urbane flushed red and violently snatched it from his hands do not look at that he cried crushing the paper up and flinging the ball into the fire his friend had however noticed an advertisement similar in tone to the one of which a part is given above nobody felt more keenly the degradation of these exhibitions than the potential author of the soul of man under socialism himself although his want of money was pressing at this time he indignantly refused to appear in aesthetic costume in spite of the fact that for such an additional attraction a much higher fee would have been paid to him in view of his refusal the agents who were well aware that it was the person of oscar wilde and not at all what he might have to say about beautiful houses that would attract the sightseers of the provinces were obliged to conceal the fact that no spectacle was to be afforded the references to the great aesthete in the advertisements contained the suggestion that something laughable was to be on exhibition and when the audience discovered that instead of watching the antics and listening to the patter of a buffoon they were expected to lend ear to a disquisition delivered by a scholar which invited their minds to ascend to a plane of inaccessible height they were not slow to express their disappointment and disapproval on several occasions the room emptied itself during the progress of the lecture it will be of interest to put on record here in spite of the vulgarity of their style two pen pictures of him drawn at the time in different places by two provincial journalists for they will show first what the audience had expected to see and secondly how they were impressed by his appearance and delivery they are representative of opinions expressed throughout the country this is the first Quote, we were informed by the advertisement pamphlet that this gentleman has since the publication of his book of poems in eighteen ninety devoted his time to public addresses so as poets do not often come before the public personally we were naturally anxious to see what a poet lecturer was like with imaginary visions of celebrated poets in mind we were anxiously awaiting the appearance of mr wilde upon the platform when the curtain was drawn asunder and in walked not a tennyson but a long fellow for the first quart d'heure we could not erase the impression from our minds that the subject of the lecture was not the house beautiful 
but the man beautified. This chevaux de frise, he gets very warm on the subject of friezes, proved at a glance how highly the lecturer estimated the power of capillary attraction, for his head seemed surrounded with a perfect halo of artificially arrayed curls, which, if removable, would doubtless fetch a figurative sum at an auction sale as a most admirable substitute for a lady's bonnet. Joking apart, no gentleman would contradict a lady who said that Mr. Wilde could rejoice in the possession of a hairy head which at once stamps him as a master of artistic decoration. His collar had evidently been made to an original design, which has no doubt been deposited at South Kensington and the pattern patented, or it must have been in the market long ago. His necktie was neither tied nor untied, but, like the clerical collar, puzzled one to know where it began and how it ended. His cuffs were equally aesthetic and took one by the collar. Mr. Wilde's theory as to the harmonious arrangement of colours in art decoration is that our backgrounds should consist of tertiary or neutral tints, relieved by small objects or ornaments of rich primary colour or bright appearance. The man beautified was accordingly arrayed in the neutral tints of black and white, with the rich relief in the shape of a red silk handkerchief peeping out from the left side of his vest, and a massive watch-chain pendant which appeared like the name label on a bunch of keys, inasmuch as no one else had one just like it. In, not on, those marvellous members of the human body, the hands, were held a pair of white silk gloves, which, if the owner did not know to be useful at all events, felt to be beautiful. Tall and graceful, and presenting a youthful appearance, he delivers his lecture with clear, distinct articulation, never hesitating for a word, nor striving after flights of eloquence, but handling his subject with an amount of assurance and self-possession that gives you the impression that he must be quite as high an authority as Morris or Ruskin, whom he quotes to agree or disagree with. The closing part of his lecture on art education drew forth repeated applause, and, in fact, the whole of it was sufficiently interesting to gain for him unbroken attention during the hour and a half which his lecture occupied. Unquote. This is how the second provincial journalist wrote. Quote, Oscar Wilde, the aesthetic, the ineffable, the exponent of the principle of eternal loveliness, has visited us and is human. He is not an angel after all, nor is he a deity springing to us out of the dark past. His food must have been other than the nectared sweets the poets love to write about. In fact, he can be seen, and heard, and handled, for he is a man. This revelation will come as an unwelcome surprise to many. One so delightfully out of sympathy with the age, with such ineffable yearnings towards the romantic past, with such inexpressible aspirations towards the beauteous future when the essential ugliness of today shall only be remembered as a hideous dream, such a man cannot be, ought not to be, one of us. So I am sure many think. I believe it was Mrs. Browning who describes how sad we feel when we find our cherished idols simply to be clay, but I can confess to no such revelation of feeling when Mr. Oscar Wilde stepped onto the platform and I discovered he had no wings. Mr. Oscar Wilde is tall, well-proportioned, with a poet's hair and, shall I say it, a mildly epicurean countenance. In his appearance there was nothing... Byronic or Bulvarian or Carlylean or Ruskinesque. 
a little that savoured of Count d'Orsay, Beau Brummel, and more that suggested the traditional diner out. His dress had few peculiarities, being ordinary evening dress, a very wilderness of shirt front relieved by a half-concealed scarlet handkerchief deftly placed inside his vest. His pose and manner might have been artistic, but were not particularly effective. His voice is a moderately pleasing one, with an occasional lisp to give it an aristocratic tone. His action, what little there was of it, was striking. He spoke entirely extempore, not even availing himself of the use of notes. For very much more than an hour he addressed his audience. There was no hesitation, and there was no fire. Only once there was an approach to pathos, and as far as I could detect, only one quotation from the poets, excepting an extract he gave in the form of a letter, I think of John Keats. He came to speak to us on an important subject, and here I must say that if his lecture had been called the Home Beautiful instead of the House Beautiful, I should have been better pleased. Englishmen, especially such as would go and hear such a discourse as Oscar Wilde's, do not care much for their houses. They care everything for their homes. An Englishman never says he is going to his house, but always that he is going home. A house to an Englishman is an empty building, the same building filled with furniture and all sorts of lovely things, plus wife and children, becomes a home. Unquote. On people of refinement, the impression produced was, of course, a different one. Many people in many parts of the country, remembering him as he appeared to them twenty-two years ago, speak regretfully of his fate. Over women, his personality seems to have exercised a great influence. I can remember him, writes a lady of refinement and culture from a Midland town, as though I had seen him yesterday, my mother was delighted with his appearance. She often afterwards spoke of his hair and his hands and his tie. Oh, his tie, how it impressed us all! For my part, though I was only a girl then, I felt he was saying things which nobody present could understand, and it seemed to me at times as though he knew it also. I felt it was a pity he should have had to come here at all, for I suppose it was a necessity that drove him on to the lecture platform. Many of the things he said have remained familiar in my mind ever since. I never see a big curtain pole without thinking of what he said about the sins of the upholsterer, and I know that I never drink a cup of tea at a railway refreshment room without remembering how he described the cup out of which he drank his coffee in the hotel in San Francisco, where he contrasted the crockery of the Chinese in the Chinese quarter of that city with the domestic vessels used by the Europeans. It was a real distress to me to sit in that lecture room looking at this wonderful youth and listening to his profound and beautiful words, while the rest of the audience were either gazing with dismay and surprise, or showing how bored they were. The room was not half full to begin with, and during the whole course of the lecture people kept getting up and going out but he seemed quite indifferent to the mood of his audience his manner if i may use the term in such a connection was quite business-like it was as if he was saying to himself i am here to say certain things and i shall go on speaking until i have said them he began speaking the moment he came on the stage, and when he had said his last word, he walked off as if anxious to catch a train and get away from us all. Those amongst his provincial audiences who listened to him, and who attempted to be critical, were in the habit of saying that his weakness as a lecturer was in a tendency to exaggeration. Some Joseph Proudhomme of the provinces sagely remarked, he pronounces as dicta, with the authority of an oracle, principles which are essentially debatable. 
The most favourite criticism, however, of Oscar Wilde's lecture on the house beautiful, a criticism which can be found in similar phraseology in contemporary prints all over the country, and not in the provinces alone, was to the effect that Mr. Oscar Wilde seems to ignore the deeply rooted prejudice that aestheticism, if not symbolic of weakness and effeminacy, is, at least, the antithesis of that moral and intellectual robustness which we, in this age, are accustomed to respect. From this bondage, from these chains, which to such an artist must have been galling indeed, Oscar Wilde was to be rescued by the gentle and beautiful Constance Lloyd. To her, for some time past, he had been paying attentions. It was during the course of his lecture tour that he was able to visit Dublin and ask her to become his wife. Constance Lloyd admired him and loved him. She put her hand into his. She was wealthily connected. She was assured of a good income on her marriage by her grandfather, who had instituted her to be his heiress. The marriage took place on the 29th of May, 1884. We find the following announcement of it in the Times for 31st May. Quote, on 29th May, at St. James's Church, Paddington, by the Reverend Walter Abbott, vicar, Oscar, younger son of the late Sir William Wilde, M.D. of Dublin, to Constance Mary, only daughter of the late Horace Lloyd, Esquire, Q.C. Unquote. Edmund Yates gave a friendly notice of the occurrence in The World for 4th June 1884. Quote, Mr. Oscar Wilde's wedding went off with more simple effect than the large crowd who thronged the church had possibly come out to see. Owing to the illness of Mr. John Horatio Lloyd, the bride's grandfather, the ceremony was meant to be of rather a private character, and only the near relatives were asked to meet at Lancaster Gate after the service. There is only this much to be recorded about it, that the bride, accompanied by her six pretty bridesmaids, looked charming, that Oscar bore himself with calm dignity, and that all most intimately concerned in the affair seemed thoroughly pleased. A happy little group of intimes saw them off at Charing Cross. Unquote. Yet the Baroque and the Bazaar were not wanting in this wedding, which sealed a union which was to end in such unhappiness. It appeared that Oscar Wilde felt it incumbent on him, as a professor of aesthetics, to give such directions as to the dresses of his bride and bridesmaids as might impress the onlookers with the fact that it was no ordinary wedding that they were attending. A brief description of these dresses will establish this suggestion. Quote, the bride's rich creamy satin dress was of a delicate cowslip tint. The bodice, cut square and somewhat low in front, was finished with a high Medici collar. The ample sleeves were puffed. The skirt, made plain, was gathered by a silver girdle of beautiful workmanship, the gift of Mr. Oscar Wilde. The veil of saffron-coloured Indian silk gauze was embroidered with pearls and worn in Mary Stuart fashion. A thick wreath of myrtle leaves, through which gleamed a few white blossoms, crowned her fair frizzed hair. The dress was ornamented with clusters of myrtle leaves. The large bouquet had as much green in it as white. The six bridesmaids were cousins of the bride. Two dainty little figures that seemed to have stepped out of a picture by Sir Joshua Reynolds led the way. They were dressed in quaintly made gowns of Sora silk, the colour of a ripe gooseberry. Large pale yellow sashes round their waist, the skirts falling in straight folds to the ankles, displaying small, bronze, high-heeled shoes. Large red silk Gainsborough hats, decked with red and yellow feathers, shaded the damsel's golden hair. Amber necklaces, 
long yellow gloves a cluster of yellow roses at their throats a bouquet of white lilies in their hands completed the attire of the tiny bridesmaids the four elder bridesmaids wore skirts of the same red sora silk with overdresses of pale blue mousseline de laine the bodices made long and pointed high-crowned hats trimmed with cream-coloured feathers and red knots of ribbon lilies in their hands amber necklaces and yellow roses at their throats made up a sufficiently picturesque ensemble one of the ladies present wore what was described as a very aesthetic costume it was composed of an underdress of rich red silk with a sleeveless smock of red plush a hat of white lace trimmed with clusters of red roses under the brim and round the crown Unquote. this gaudy and displeasing picture must be recalled it proves as nothing else could prove the entire confidence of constance lloyd in the artistic pretensions of her husband no woman who was not blindly convinced of the superiority of her bridegroom's taste would have consented to such a masquerade it may have occurred to some of the onlookers that a union so initiated could not contain the elements of happiness where the woman is entirely hypnotised and subjugated her marriage is not often a happy one for her on the day of his wedding oscar wilde took his young wife over to paris and the first weeks of the honeymoon were spent in that city they occupied a suite of rooms at the hotel wagram in the rue de rivoli they both seemed to be radiantly happy oscar was a gallant and devoted husband and constance seemed to be swathed in rapturous delight if ever her husband left her alone to go out with any friend a few minutes after his departure a messenger would arrive at the hotel bearing for the bride a bouquet of exquisite flowers together with a note couched in language of such impassioned adoration that it charmed her solitude and made her happy even though her loved one was away mrs wilde's dowry enabled the young couple to take the lease of a good house in tite street chelsea which was the last home of his own that oscar was to possess it was decorated under the direction of whistler and was substantially furnished at the very top of the house a workroom had been installed for oscar wilde the furniture of which was painted red but he never used this room the little writing that he ever did at home was done in a small study which was to the right of the entrance passage mrs wilde's income at that time was not large she did not come into her grandfather's fortune until much later and it became immediately necessary for oscar to find remunerative employment he turned to journalism for livelihood and he accepted occasional engagements on the lecture platform he was a constant contributor of anonymous work to the world and the pall mall gazette much of his writings at this time have been traced and were recently being hawked round the london publishing houses by speculators in his notoriety it was a disservice to his reputation it would appear which would concern these literary resurrection men but little the work was poor it was the hack work corrente calamo of a man who had no heart in his labours and poorer stuff said one london publisher to whom this volume was offered i never read in my life yet at the same time he was writing those exquisite fairy stories which were afterwards republished in a volume by david nutt the happy prince and other tales eighteen eighty eight a volume which many of his admirers look upon as his best and most characteristic prose work there are no fairy stories in the english language to compare with them the writing is quite masterly the stories proceed from a rare and opulent imagination and while the tales that are told interest the child no less than the man of the world there underlies the whole a subtle philosophy 
an indictment of society, a plea for the disinherited, which make of this book and of the House of Pomegranates, 1891, two veritable requisitoires against the social system, as crushing as the soul of man. And yet, as one reads these tales, the lesson that the author wishes to teach never forces itself upon him. Unlike Lewis Carroll and Hans Anderson, Oscar Wilde tells a story which a child can read with pleasure and interest, and without that uncomfortable feeling that moral medicine is being administered to him in literary preserves. If Oscar Wilde had had hopes that the lecture platform would afford a source of income to him, he was doomed to disappointment. In January 1885, he delivered at the Gaiety, Dublin, under the management of Mr. Michael Gunn, two afternoon lectures. The first, given on the afternoon of Monday, 5th January, was on dress, beauty, taste, ugliness in dress, and the second, on Tuesday, treated of the value of art in modern life. On both these lectures, a resume appears at the end of this volume. The enterprise was a disastrous failure. Dublin was indifferent to the son of Speranza, indifferent to the son of Sir William Wilde, indifferent to the brilliant Trinity College man who had so distinguished himself and his country at Oxford, and to the poet and lecturer who had set two worlds talking. We find in the Freeman's Journal for 6th January the following prefatory remarks to its notice of the lecture on dress. Quote, Although the fact of the lecture taking place was fully announced for days in advance, the attendance was hardly satisfactory. At most, about 500 persons were present, chiefly in the dress circle and stalls. But the audience, though not large, was highly intelligent, critical and appreciative of the matter and style of the lecturer. Evidently, people have ceased to regard Mr. Wilde as the eccentric apostle of a momentarily fashionable craze to be seen, heard and laughed at. Unquote. A highly appreciative account of the lecture followed, but that afternoon the attendance was very much smaller. Possibly the high prices charged for admission frightened the public. Mr. Gunn was asking 21 shillings, 30 shillings and 42 shillings for private boxes, and proportionate prices for the rest of the house. At that time, matinee performances of a pantomime were being given at the Gaiety, and it is related that a gentleman accompanied by two boys came by mistake into the theatre, sat down, and listened patiently for some time to Oscar's discourse, and finally got up, exclaiming, What's all this? When's the pantomime going to begin? In the following month, there appeared in the Dublin University Review, of all publications, the one in which the greatest deference ought to have been paid to the Barclay medalist, son of Sir William Wilde, and a frequent contributor to its pages, two sarcastic and cutting notices of his lecture. These are they. Quote, we confess that before a visit to the Gaiety Theatre dispelled the illusion we had thought that the reappearance of Mr. Oscar Wilde before a Dublin audience would have excited very general interest among his fellow citizens. Indeed, in spite of the fact that Mr. Wilde, like the elephant Jumbo, with whose notoriety his popularity was contemporaneous, has ceased to attract the sympathy and the shillings of the public. We feel bound to express our belief of the talents of that gentleman, and our regret that they have not latterly been more usefully employed. The indifference with which the lecturer was received cannot fairly be ascribed to any falling off in the quality of the lectures which formed not only a complete exposition of Mr. Wilde's peculiar philosophy of art, but were in themselves instructive and suggestive. However, a few more lectures as unfortunate from a commercial point of view as those recently delivered in this city will materially remedy this defect, 
and will help to restore Mr. Wilde to public favour. Meanwhile, he will not regret the decrease on his receipts, for, as he stated in his second lecture, true art is economical. Unquote. In the same number of the official organ of TCD appears a letter on Sir Noel Payton's picture Lux in Tenebris. It is pretty enough, says the writer, quote, but it no more realises the idea of a spiritual light shining in the moral darkness of the world than would, let us say, a picture of Mr. Oscar Wilde preaching about dress improvers at the gaiety. Unquote. This was Dublin's salute to the most talented man to whom she had ever given birth. For the rest, although in Ireland one finds little of that horror against the mention of Oscar Wilde's name, which still lingers in England, in certain quarters, where one would least expect to find it, it persists. In the summer of last year, a gentleman being desirous of purchasing a photograph of Oscar Wilde as a child, and of getting information as to the early life of Speranza, sent an advertisement embodying his requirements to the Freeman's Journal, where, if anywhere in Ireland, Lady Wilde's memory ought to have been revered. The advertisement was eventually inserted, but not for several days, during which the manager was communicating with the editor, the acting editor not having dared to assume so grave a responsibility as to whether an advertisement referring to Lady Wilde and her son could be allowed to appear in the journal. Mr. Whistler's attack on Oscar Wilde, the details of which can be found set out in The Gentle Art of Making Enemies, did much to reduce still lower any chances of success as a lecturer which remained to Oscar Wilde. Whistler made it public that Oscar Wilde's lecture on the English Renaissance was mainly made up from facts and opinions which he, Whistler, had supplied to the lecturer. It would have been just as easy for that admirable actor, Herman Vezin, to have rushed into print and to have declared that Oscar's manner on the stage was the result of some training in elocution and gesture which he had given him before he commenced his lecture tour. But then Herman Vezin is not only a great artist, he is a true and loyal friend. This source of income having failed, there were periods of real poverty in the elegant house in Tite Street. A lady who lived near the Wilds has recorded that at that time she was frequently called upon by Mrs. Wilde to lend her money, even small sums such as the purchase of a pair of boots might demand. At the same time, the expenses of the menage were increasing. In June 1885, and again in November 1886, a son was born to them. Stray writings for the papers and an occasional signed contribution to the reviews could not produce the income which was necessary to supplement the wife's allowance, and in the end Oscar Wilde turned to journalism for a living for himself and his family. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of the Life of Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twelve It was at this time in his career that he came to be seen, periodically, in that Fleet Street of which, afterwards, he was to speak with such acerbity and contempt. A firm of publishers of Ludgate Hill, the Messrs. Cassell and Co., had come to the conclusion that his reputation as a leader of fashion and an arbiter of the elegancies might be turned to profitable account on behalf of a certain monthly publication, issued from their printing presses, which at that time enjoyed no high degree of public favour. The belief was held in Le Belle Sauvage Yard, that the name of Oscar Wilde printed in large letters upon the cover of this magazine, to be styled afresh, 
the woman's world would attract the attention and the custom also of the fashionable women to whom it was supposed to appeal bringing in the train of their patronage that multitude of purchasers who ensure commercial success in this belief these printers proposed to him the direction of the woman's world the terms offered were what in his straitened circumstances with the fresh charges upon him he could not with prudence refuse and the bargain was struck if after a prolonged test the adventure did not result in satisfaction it was not because the new editor failed in vigilance or assiduity but because london society in the sense of fashionable people had not yet come under the sway of his influence his connection with the woman's world lasted from october eighteen eighty seven to september eighteen eighty nine the amusing spectacle was thus afforded during this period of a scholar a critic an artist acting as overseer and salesman of such productions of the pen as treat of the chatter of the shops the commonplaces of tiring room and pantry the futilities of changing modes are servants a failure fancy dresses for children typewriting and shorthand for women are the titles of some of the papers for which the future author of the soul of man under socialism and of de profundis had to arrange of which when written to approve and which he had to send out to the world under his imprimatur the history of the forlorn makeshifts and expedients to which necessity often constrains the most gifted men of letters affords no example more apposite than this part of oscar wilde's life it reminds one of the experiences of charles baudelaire the poet when a committee of french provincial shareholders had brought him away from paris from the writing of the fleur de mal and the translating of edgar allan poe to edit a local paper if charles baudelaire however failed from the very outset because he despised his work and approached his task in that spirit it must be said of the irish poet editor that he very earnestly did his best for his employers an apprentice to journalism he displayed all those qualities of industry punctuality and ardour which as hogarth would have us believe lead men to high honours and great wealth in the city of london it was in the irony of things that a career thus entered upon should have led him if not to tyburn at least to the old bailey and the bankruptcy court baudelaire's first inquiry on entering the office of the provincial newspaper which he was to publish was as to where the editorial brandy bottle was kept wilde was perhaps even more a slave to the nicotine habit than baudelaire to alcohol yet he very cheerfully accommodated himself to the strict rule imposed by messrs cassell and co that no smoking is allowed under any pretext in any part of their buildings he seemed to take real pleasure in the hours which he spent in la belle sauvage yard because of the opportunities which were there afforded him of meeting wemyss reed the editor of the speaker a man of great scholarship and refinement for whom he had a great admiration he used to take the underground railway from sloane square to charing cross and thence walk up the strand and fleet street to his office the days had not yet come when he could declare that he never walked he was always dressed with elegance and care presenting in his appearance a strong contrast to the types which are sometimes to be seen in that part of london his regularity was at that time remarked upon he was no doubt making a strong effort to subject himself to discipline at the same time no doubt the interest and dignity of his position appealed to his histrionic nature he walked an editor amongst the proletarians of the press he had the satisfaction of showing that the part of journalist 
could be dressed by the tailors of bond street the hatters and glovers of piccadilly and adorned by the florists of the burlington arcade at a time too when he was perhaps one of the very poorest editors in london it appeared to his friends at times that he enjoyed the dignity as well the meagre patronage of his editorial office he was once heard to say with some pride in his tones speaking of his power of remunerating contributors i pay a guinea a page no matter if most of the space is occupied by illustrations or not that he had the interests of his employer at heart was shown by the fact that he never allowed feelings of friendship to interfere with the impartial performance of his duty as an editor he was frequently applied to for commissions by needy bohemian acquaintances but where he considered that a man was not fitted to write for his periodical he told him so lady wilde and his wife contributed one or two articles each to the woman's world during oscar wilde's editorship but in every case the article on its own merits was well worthy of acceptance and would have earned the fee paid from any editor in london in the volume for eighteen eighty nine we find from lady wilde's pen a collection of irish peasant tales there are five of these tales a knight with the fairies a legend of shark fairy help the western isles and saint patrick and the witch constance wilde's contribution during this year to the magazine of which her husband was editor is an illustrated well documented paper on muffs a good specimen of the museum made article it may be said that since the magistrate brillat savarin wrote his physiologie de goutte and showed that a cookery book can be made a work of literary art never has literary skill been put in stranger fashion at the service of the commonplaces of domestic life than appears in the pages of the woman's world under oscar wilde's editorship que diable allait elle faire dans cette galère might be asked of literature the magazine was too admirable to succeed its style was too refined for the people to whom the subjects treated of appealed and those people who might have delighted in the style were kept aloof by the subjects oscar wilde's personal contributions to this periodical apart from certain articles on special literary subjects took the form of a monthly causerie published under the title of some literary notes considerable care and industry were expended by the editor on these articles they usually occupied five pages of the woman's world and were quite the most interesting literary criticism then appearing in london but what student of contemporary literature was going to hunt out these literary notes between an article on the gymnasium for girls by mrs l ormiston chant and a paper on field work for women by ouida oscar wilde's criticisms are always kindly and full of instruction which is just what criticism if it is to have any value should be these pages are filled with dicta and epigram on the art of literature which no future compiler of a complete edition of his works should fail to collect in the important matter of obtaining the services of distinguished people as contributors to his magazine without possessing a free hand in fixing the scale of remuneration wilde was remarkably successful during the first six months of eighteen ninety nine he obtained for the woman's world contributions from oscar browning e nesbitt annie thomas ella hepworth dixon amy levy ouida carmen silver blanche roosevelt the countess of portsmouth saint hellier gleason white miss olive schreiner lady sandhurst miss f l shaw miss marie corelli arthur simmons and mrs crawford marie corelli's contribution was a long article on shakespeare's mother which at the present rates in the literary rialto 
could probably be disposed of by an efficient agent for twenty times the amount which the editor of the woman's world was enabled to offer it should be added that oscar wilde was an editor whom it was not easy to please he would tolerate no slovenliness of writing in the matter for instance of punctuation he was scrupulous in the extreme if anywhere on a printed or manuscript page laid before him a poor little comma had intruded where it had no right to be or one had deserted its post his flashing glance would immediately turn to the spot one of his stories was that his hostess in a country house having asked him at dinner how he had spent the day he had answered i have been correcting the proofs of my poems in the morning after hard work i took a comma out of one sentence and in the afternoon oh, in the afternoon i put it back again he was here jesting at what was a marked characteristic of his literary technique during all this time apart from his editorship he was a frequent contributor to the weekly and daily press as well as to the magazines he wrote anonymously for the pall mall gazette in whose columns he revealed himself as a brilliant paragraphist who did not disdain the piquancy of personalities he contributed much to the world under yeats's editorship his name is to be found under many magazine articles which have long since been forgotten one remembers for instance an article on london models which appeared in the english illustrated magazine volume six eighteen eighty eight eighteen eighty nine which is a good specimen of purely journalistic work it was not till a year or two later that he began to speak with such detestation of journalists it is possible that it had taken him just so long to discover that the reputations which are made by newspapers have no real foundation in the hearts of the people that interviews and paragraphs and the whole gamut of periodical puffery although they may make a person notorious do not bestow upon him that popularity which is associated with the substantial benefices of fame it is an experience which most public men have made and those who have expected great results from the persistent clamour of the journalists do often when disappointed in these expectations manifest rancour and resentment towards those whom at an earlier date they fostered from a very early stage in his career oscar wilde had been one of the men in england whose names were most widely known he himself once said that a year or two after he came to london his name was a household word throughout the country but naturally as long as his reputation rested alone on this foundation he got nothing from it but such enjoyment as vanity might thence derive and it is possible what has been noticed in many other instances that a peevish resentment arising from his disappointment prompted him to that contumely of journalists which unfortunately he continued to display long after real service to the public had brought true fame and its tangible rewards in the days of his own connection with the periodical press he sometimes used to speak in praise of certain of the characteristics of journalism after the appointment of his brother william wilde to the staff of the daily telegraph he was heard to say there is a great fascination in journalism it is so quick so swift willie goes to a duchess's ball he slips out before midnight is away for an hour or two returns and as he is driving home in the morning can buy the paper containing a full account of the party which he has just left like everybody else in england he expressed the greatest admiration for the work which his brother did in reporting the judicial proceedings of the parnell commission yet in eighteen ninety one a bare year after he had turned his back on fleet street he wrote that passage on british journalism which occurs in the soul of man under socialism which aroused against him the terrible hatred suppressed at the time which blazed forth at the time of his fall one extract from this passage will suffice here 
in centuries before ours the public nailed the ears of journalists to the pump that was quite hideous in this century journalists have nailed their own ears to the keyhole that is much worse this vituperation of journalists was a constant feature of his conversation during the next few years he frequently requested his brother not to dare speak to him of his vile gutter friends from fleet street he never missed an opportunity of insulting the press in his plays if there was ever any truth in the statement which has been frequently made that at one time in his life oscar wilde thirsted after newspaper notoriety with the eagerness of which certain contemporary writers afford so painful an example it is a fact that when the ideal husband was being written he had entirely set his face against it in january eighteen ninety five he was approached by the messrs mcclure of mcclure's magazine who were anxious to publish about him an article in the form of an interview it should be stated that this magazine was already at that time a great power in the united states and that the foremost writers and celebrities in other walks of life in all parts of the world had been glad to avail themselves of a publicity so beneficial and far-reaching the writing of this article was to be done by one of wilde's oldest friends whose name was widely known in america in connection with work of this kind the request of the messrs mcclure was answered by oscar wilde in a letter which he wrote from tite street to this friend in which he said that he did not like the tone of his editor's letter that to speak of wishing for oscariana was an impertinence that he understood that it was usual that a fee should be paid to the person interviewed and that he would in no way assist in the production of the article unless he first received a cheque for twenty pounds as at that time such a sum was of no importance to him whatever and as in any other way he would have been glad to assist his old friend in his work this letter affords good proof that personal advertisement by newspaper publicity had become entirely distasteful to him he was consistent in this dislike until the end it occurred to some of his friends who watched him during his second trial at the old bailey that the way in which on the posters of the newspapers his name was placarded all over london afforded him some satisfaction and a remark of his on the subject is on record the town was placarded with his name and one night alluding to this i said well you've got your name before the public at last he laughed and said nobody can pretend now not to have heard it oscar wilde the story of an unhappy friendship End footnote. but this may be explained by that natural and pathetic prompting that moves every poor mortal to endeavour to find in any great personal disaster some scrap of consolation in his greatest distress at a time when he needed money most badly after his ruin had been consummated he refused the most substantial offers from the proprietors of newspapers and not only from those who merely wished to trade in the notoriety of his name after his release from prison while he was living in berneval it was suggested to ferno zau the proprietor of le journal one of the principal papers in paris that oscar wilde would write effective articles on various questions of literature and art on which his authority was uncontested Zhao agreed to place his name on his list of contributors which included many of the leading politicians and all the foremost literary celebrities of france the terms he offered as remuneration were the same as those paid to the first writers there was here no suggestion at all that oscar wilde's collaboration was desired because the scandal which attached to his name would appeal to the morbid-minded and create a profitable sensation it was a plain business-like offer from a very shrewd businessman to a writer of eminent and recognised capacity it was a proposal which most authors of high standing and european reputation would have taken as a compliment yet 
Although at that time Oscar Wilde was in sad difficulties through want of money, he declined the offer without one moment's consideration. This refusal was courteously worded. It was with scathing contempt that he repelled any approaches from the traffickers in sensation. It is reported that when, just previous to his release from Reading Jail, the governor informed him that the correspondents of an American paper who had been waiting in Reading for some days past were prepared to pay him a very large fee for the privilege of being allowed to interview him on the subject of his prison experiences, he expressed his surprise that anyone should venture to make such proposals to a gentleman. Some time previous to this release, he'd been speaking to a person in the prison about his future prospects. He had said that poverty awaited him outside the prison gates. His friend said that, by writing an article or two for the monthlies, he'd be able to make an immediate supply of money. Ah, said Oscar Wilde, I remember when one editor of the 19th century used to come to my house and solicit an article, and now I suppose he wouldn't accept one were I to offer it for nothing. This friend in relating this conversation adds, I endeavoured to make as light of his troubles as possible and assured him that all he required was pen, ink and paper. My friend, he said, he repeated these words on several occasions, you do not know the world as well as I do. Some people might read what I chose to write out of morbidness, but I don't want that. I wish to be read for art's sake, not for my notoriety. His only contributions to journalism after he left prison were the long letters which he wrote under the title of The Case of Warder Martin on Some Cruelties of Prison Life and the letter don't read this if you wish to be happy today. These appeared in the Daily Chronicle on Friday 28th of May 1897 and on 24th of March 1898, respectively. Of these letters, it need only be said of them that they were written from a pure spirit of philanthropy. No self-interest prompted its author to take pen in hand. It is a fact, which should be recorded here, that when he wrote the first letter, he was extremely doubtful whether the editor would venture to publish it. It should be added in proof that gain was not his motive, that, although a friend, the editor of one of the most important reviews in London would, as he knew, have paid almost any fee for this contribution. He preferred to give it to the world through the agency of a daily paper, because he considered first that this exposure of abuses and cruelty should not be delayed one day longer than could be avoided, and, secondly, that the wider publicity of a newspaper with a great circulation would more effectively arouse public opinion. The amount of the fee paid to him, if any fee was paid, is not known, but it certainly did not exceed if, indeed, it reached the foison of the sums which, out of a meagre purse, at a time of great need, he gave away to his poor comrades in misfortune, those who had been prisoners with him in Reading Jail. End of chapter 12